Okay, it is 1030. We are going live. And right now, um, IT, or is there any reason we should not be starting? Or you are on live with YouTube. Okay, great. Um, so I believe um, the three commissioners are on, YouTube is on. All right, we're going to begin the meeting. Good morning, everyone. I'm calling this work study for 20, docket number 21, EKME088GIE to order. My name is Susan Duffy and I am the chair of the Kansas Corporation Commission. Heard Joining me are here. my colleagues, Dwight Keen and yes. Commissioner Dwight. Until we gave him the signal, right? Okay, all right, is this IT Michelle? Yes, this is Michelle. We've just now got the record and the streaming started. Okay. All right. So we're ready to begin. All right. Here we go. We'll start over. Good morning, everyone. I'm calling the uh, 21 EKME 088GIE docket work study to order. My name is Susan Duffy. I am the chair of the Kansas Corporation Commission. Joining me are my colleagues, Commissioner Dwight Keene and Commissioner Andrew French. Um, Commissioner Dw uh, Keene, good morning to you. Yes, good morning to uh, all. Uh, can you get my video? Is it coming up? Yes, you are coming up. We can see you. Okay. And Commissioner, NMTCC Commissioner Dwight Keene, I want to join in welcoming all participants to this important informational workshop. Um, I look forward today to learning more about Evergy's prospective capital expenditure and strategic plans. Importantly, I want to thank all of those who are taking the time to, this morning to participate in this informational event. Welcome to all. Thank you. Thank you. And Commissioner French. Yes, good morning. I'll, I'll echo all those comments and look forward to uh, to hearing from, from uh, Evergy and, and everybody today. So uh, look forward to the presentations and please forgive the glare. <laughs> oh, that's a good glare. The glare the sun <laughs> behind the sunflowers. Okay. Thank you everyone for attending um, this public work study. Uh, so far we do have 56 participants online. This is the first of four scheduled work studies to discuss Evergy's Sustainability Transformation Plan, more commonly known as STP. This work study will focus on grid modernization investments and related benefits. The commission collectively believes this work study is very important to allow both the commission and the public to learn more about Evergy's proposed STP. We look forward to learning more about the plan over the four scheduled work studies and the opportunity to ask questions. Other participants who have been granted intervention in this docket will have the opportunity to ask questions as well. Due to the pandemic, we are conducting this work study by Zoom and broadcasting to the public on our YouTube channel. Please bear with us if you experience any technical glitches. Um, actually, we're getting uh, pretty good at this and it seems this format seems to be working well. So how will the run of show be today? We plan to take a half hour lunch break around 1230. And in the afternoon, assuming we're still going strong, we will have a number of short five to 10 minute breaks as needed. At this time, I will turn the proceeding over to the Commission's General Counsel, Brian Fedoten, who will be moderating today's work study. Mr. Fedoten. Yes, uh, good morning. Thank you, Chair Duffy. Uh, we'll begin with a roll call of the interveners. When I call your name, please introduce yourself for the record. Um, on behalf of Evergy, Kathy Dingus, Kathy, are you there? Uh, can you hear me? I'm here, sorry. Okay, sorry, yeah. Uh, uh, that, that serves as a good reminder for everybody. Um, 
that that uh, you may need to uh, be unmuted or unmute yourself. So uh, next. And Brian can also yes. please everyone mute your cell phone. Um, so we don't hear uh, your kids calling you in the middle of the day or whoever. So thank you. Uh, th thank you, Chair Duffy, for that reminder. So, um, David Nickel. Good morning, Commission and other stakeholders. My name is David Nickel. I'm Consumer Counsel for the Citizens Utility Ratepayer Board. This morning, we will have uh, attorneys for the curb join us, uh, Todd Love and Joseph Astrab, analysts for the curb, Josh France and Patrick Orr, and our analyst, Andrea, Andrea Crane. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, climate and energy pr project. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Dorothy Barnett here with the climate and energy project. We also have our attorney, Timothy Laughlin, um, on the call. Appreciate the opportunity <laughs> for this to be um, not only for interveners, but for the public as well. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Grain Belt Express. Good morning. This is uh, Andrew Schulte on behalf of Grain Belt Express. Um, also on the phone today or joining by video will be Orjit Goshal. Okay. IBEW number 304. Good morning. My name is Brian Wood. I'm legal counsel for IBEW Local 304, and I am the loan representative of that uh, entity here today. Thank you. Midwest Energy. Uh, good morning. This is Ann Kallenbach of Colson LAPC appearing on behalf of Midwest Energy. Uh, Aaron Romy will be uh, Midwest primary um, sort of technical expert, either joining by phone or video today, but Pat Park and Bob Muirhead uh, may also be joining in and out as their schedules permit. Commission staff. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Terry Pemberton, Chief Litigation Counsel for the KCC. I'm joined today um, with Mike Neely. He's Senior Litigation. Thank you. Kepco. Good morning. This is Susan Cunningham appearing on behalf of Kepco. Also on the video or call today, um, our internal KEPCO staff, Mark Doljak and Rebecca Fowler, and also appearing on behalf of KEPCO is outside counsel, Kimberly Frank. Thank you so much. KIC. Thank you, Brian. Brian, good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners, Robert Vincent Overland Park with Smithyman and Zakura for the Kansas Industrial Consumers Group Incorporated. Joining us today are James Zakura and Connor Thompson, also of the same firm. Just to make you aware, uh, Connor's authorized me to share this with you. Uh, him and his wife are expecting a baby imminently. So if he has to abruptly drop off the call and run out of the room, now you know why it's not the subject matter. There are other things uh, afoot this morning. Thank you. Uh, KPP. Good morning, Amy Klein of Triplet Wolf and Garrison. I'm here on behalf of the Kansas Power Pool, who's also represented by Larry Holloway. McPherson Board of Public Utilities. Good morning, this is Heather Starnes. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. You may want to turn the volume up a little bit though when it's your turn to present. So okay. thank you. This is Heather Starnes with McPherson and we will also have participating Tim Meyer, who is the general manager and Josh Badel, who is the assistant general manager. Thank you. Natural Resources Defense Council. Good morning, Commission and Commissioners. Uh, it's great to be here this morning. Um, uh, I'm Thomas Connors. Uh, I'm representing NRDC. I'm also joined by Ashok Gupta, who is our uh, uh, expert. So it's, it's great, great to be here today. Thank you. The Sierra Club. Good morning, this is Teresa Woody with Kansas Appleseed. I'm counsel for the Sierra Club. And I also want to thank the commission for allowing this uh, um, workshop to be uh, publicly streamed. USD number 259. 
is is anyone on the line for uh, the Unified School District number 259 of Sedgwick County? Tim McKee is, but I believe Tim, you're on mute. Okay. Mr. McKee, are you unmuted? Well, it's, it sounds like he is is with us, just um, not, uh, uh, muted. So, yes. Uh, it is there are are there any other interveners that uh, I accidentally passed over? Brian, this is Terry. Yes. I'm not yes. sure what happened during my introduction. I my my mic was cut, and I didn't get the full uh, staff attendance noted. Okay. So for sure. Thank record, you for correcting that, Terry. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, Jeff McClanahan, Director of Utilities is with us. Justin Grady, Chief of Revenue Requirements, Cost of Service and Finance is with us. Also, uh, we're joined by Adam Gatewood, who's our Senior uh, Managing Financial Analyst. Leo Hanos, our Chief of Engineering and Tim Stringer, who is an engineer for the KCC as well. And I believe hopefully you captured the fact that Mike Neely is joining us from litigation and that's all we have, thank you. Yes, thank you, Terry. Sorry for uh, any glitches there. Brian, uh, it, it sound I beg your uh, pardon, Brian. I've just now figured out how to unmute this thing. I'm really a, a preferred member of the uh, old set, so I'm not as smooth on this computer. In any event, I'm representing USD 259, Tim McKee with Triple Wolf and Garrison, and David Banks may also be on or, or will be joining us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I, I think that represents um, all of the interveners and, and our staff. Um, so we will continue. Um, Ms. Ms. Uh, there may be some confidential information discussed today. If so, we will save that information for the end of the work study. And pursuant to KSA 75-4319B4 of the Kansas Open Meeting Act, which allows the commission to conduct a closed session to discuss data related to financial affairs or trade secrets of corporations. Uh, any confidential information uh, would be discussed in a closed meeting. Individuals affiliated with the interveners who have signed and submitted a non-disclosure agreement are permitted to attend the closed session, but members of the general public viewing the live stream on our YouTube channel will not be able to participate in any closed session. Um, with that, we will begin uh, with a presentation from Evergy. The presenters will be Kevin Bryant, Bruce Aiken, Ryan Mulvaney, and Kayla Messamore. Following Evergy's presentation, the commissioners will have an opportunity to ask questions. After the commissioners ask their questions, I will call on the interveners in alphabetical order. Um, when called on, the, the council should introduce themselves and present any of your technical experts to ask their questions or make their comments. After the intervener questions and comments, we again, we may go into a closed session to discuss any confidential information. Um, with that, I think we're ready to begin. So, uh, Mr. Bryant, would you like to introduce uh, Evergy's panel? Yes, good Good morning. Uh, so let me start off with a sound check. Can you hear and see me okay? Yes to both. Can you hear and see me okay? Okay, all right, so I'll, I'll get started. So uh, good, good morning uh, with, with the Evergy team this morning. It's myself, Kevin Bryant. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Evergy. And as uh, Mr. Fedoten mentioned, I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Bruce Aiken, who is our VP of Transmission and Distribution, uh, Ryan Mulvaney, our Senior Director of Operations Analytics. And then we have various members of the Evergy team here that are available uh, during the Q&A portion of today's uh, presentation. Uh, Kevin Noblet's here, our Vice President of Safety and Operations Planning. As was mentioned, Kayla Messamore, who is our Director of Long-Term Planning. Uh, and also uh, some of our regulatory teams. So Greg Greenwood, Executive Vice President, Strategy and Chief Administrative Officer, Darren Ives, our Vice President of Regulatory Affairs, 
and the aforementioned uh, Ms. Kathy Dingus. So um, with that, I'll jump into it. For, first, I'll thank Chair uh, Duffy uh, for the uh, cell phone reminder. Uh, I, I really appreciated that because normally when my kids call me, they're wanting to ask for money. And so any reason to turn the cell phone ringer off is always well, re well received. Um, so with that, I'll jump into it. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to be with you all here today pr to provide an overview of our sustainability transformation plan. Uh, you already heard the acronym STP. Uh, I will try to stay away from the acronym because in the utility sector, we have more than enough of them. Uh, but if I slide back and use the STP, please don't hold it against me. But our, our purpose here today is to uh, dive into a bit of a deeper understanding of our grid modernization plans as was laid out at the beginning of the meeting. Um, but before we begin, I, I again wanna thank the commission uh, the staff and all the other parties to this docket for uh, most importantly providing us with this forum for collaboration and input on our, our forward-looking plans. But more importantly, uh, allowing us to do this via this virtual format uh, is really greatly appreciated. I know that we've all uh, gotten used to the Zoom meetings uh, for the most part. Uh, very often I will find myself on mute saying very brilliant things that I can't repeat when I come off mute. But for the most part, I think we've, um, we've figured out this Zoom technology as we've worked through the pandemic. Um, even you know, last week for Thanksgiving, my 82 year old aunt was Zooming. Um, so uh, it sh just shows where we've come as a country. But you know, at Evergy, we obviously take ser safety very seriously. We're in a dangerous business. Our folks out in the field are exposed to hazards every single day. And so one of the things we do as part of our culture is we start every meeting off with a safety or inclusion topic. And so in that regard, we, we just commend all the folks who uh, uh, per, uh, agreed to conduct this meeting virtually because it's another way to, to keep our folks safe and make sure we all stay safe th during this very challenging pandemic. So there's no doubt we'd much prefer to be with you all in per person, but we appreciate your flexibility and it's good to see your faces uh, on the computer screen this morning. With that, uh, I'll turn to the agenda on slide three of the presentation materials and hope that everyone has access to the slides. Um, short story, we have two main objectives for our interactions today. One, to provide an overview of our in-progress update of our sustainability transformation plan and our grid modernization efforts, and to give you a better feel for the approach, challenges, and opportunities that we see moving forward. But the second objective is to make sure we have an opportunity to collaborate and get feedback that we can incorporate as our planning and execution efforts uh, progress. So as I mentioned before, I'm going to get us started uh, and provide a little bit of an overview of the STP and then hand it over to uh, Mr. Aiken and Mr. Mulvaney who will dive into the details. So with that, uh, I'll jump to slide five of the presentation. So what is Evergy's Sustainability Transformation Plan, or STP? At its core, our Sustainability Transformation Plan is our five-year plan to, as we've done throughout our history, make continued critical infrastructure investment that provide long-term benefit to our customers while executing disciplined cost management that allows us to make such inv investments while keeping our customer rate impacts less than inflation. With this discipline investment focus and cost management, our sustainability transformation plan takes into consideration the current state of our utility infrastructure, so our utility um, organization, but also takes into consideration the realities of continued generation fleet decarbonization and the need to continue to modernize an always uh, aging grid. And as the last bullet point on the slide uh, says, successful execution of our sustainability plan positions Evergy to continue to deliver on the operational efficiencies that we've been executing since the company was formed uh, just about two and a half years ago. And to also investing in opportunities that provide long-term benefits for our customers while providing competitive returns for our shareholders. If we move to slide six, we've got a lot of words on this page to highlight what we believe are the many benefits of our plan. So Bruce and Ryan uh, will dive into some of this shortly, but our STP or Sustainability Transformation Plan contemplates $5.6 billion of infrastructure investment 
uh, through 2024 to replace aged infrastructure, advance our grid autom automation, and, pr and improve our data analytics and communication infrastructure, which drives improved grid reliability, restoration times, and overall grid resiliency. These investments will also enhance our customer experience through enhanced automation and digital communications, increased customer self-service options, and the ability to offer tailored rate plans. The generation elements of our plan, while not a topic of today's discussion, focuses on continuing to manage our existing, ex existing generation fleet cost effectively through end of life while deploying increased investment in renewables and storage to lower our operating costs and deliver cleaner energy for our community. This investment will create considerable economic development as a result of the grid modernization and renewable investment we will be making. And as I mentioned previously, with continued cost discipline uh, that we've leveraged since Evergy was formed, we expect to, through 2024, reduce our non-fuel operating and maintenance expense by $210 million, or a 25% reduction from 2019 levels, and will reduce our fuel and purchase power costs by close to $150 million over that same time frame. All this resulting in minimized rate increases less than inflation, throughout the plan that helps us continue to improve our regional rate competitiveness. And before I turn it over to Mr. Aiken, I'll touch on slide seven. So as you can see on slide seven, it highlights the key areas of the, of the STP that I've already touched on. Obviously today, as you can see in the box with the red dotted line, uh, we'll be focusing on grid modernization, the planning execution, uh, an overall planning approach. But the other, other elements of our STP or sustainability transformation plan will be covered through future uh, commission workshop dockets. Cost efficiencies will be dove into later this month during the workshop scheduled for December 21st. Uh, customer experience uh, will be covered in the first part of the new year uh, on January 20th. And decarbonization will be discussed during the ongoing integrated resource plan stakeholder meetings. So we'll dive into grid modernization, and I'll hand it over uh, to Bruce Aiken, our v VP of Transmission and Distribution. Good morning. Um, in my role as VP of Transmission and Distribution, I have responsibility for construction and maintenance for all transmission, substation, and distribution uh, parts of our business. In addition, I uh, have responsibility for our system operations group as well. Um, I'm going to give you a, an overview of our grid modernization plans. Uh, if we move to the next slide, industry focus on modernizing the grid is really not new. Um, utilities across the U.S. have been developing and implementing grid modernization programs in recent years, and down below are some examples of, of companies that are, are undergoing this. They're all at different points in time, but really it starts with replacing aging assets then adding technology and enabling the grid of the future. So why do we need grid modernization? Well, as, as Kevin mentioned, our grid is aging. Um, as we start to re re replace it, rebuild it, make it stronger, it'll create lower long-term operating costs and definitely greater grid resiliency and enhanced security. Our transmission grid was built around existing power plants and load. Um, a modern grid will enable decarbonization by improving renewable delivery and strengthening the grid of the future as we re uh, retire fossil uh, units. Our capital investments are linked to customer performance and benefits through better reliability um, and including uh, preventing degradation of reliability as our system continues to age, uh, making our grid smarter and enabling uh, distributed energy resources. Our customers have benefited from the, um, the long life of our assets and the fact that we have, have utilized many of those well beyond their expected useful life. Uh, Ryan will give you some examples of that later in the presentation. Our changing generation landscape um, with the 
integration of less dispatchable resources such as wind, solar, and storage uh, are also a, a driver behind uh, modernizing the grid. Our customers load, the nature of our customers load continues to change um, to demand a higher uh, quality, power quality, less uh, sensitivity to uh, power disruptions or even fluctuations in power. Um, and that continues to become more important to our customers uh, each and every day. And finally, it will give us grid operational flexibility um, when we do have storms or significant weather impacts to, to enable automation and improve reliability and quicker response to, to outages. The connected grid looks a lot different today than it did 50 years ago. The first three boxes um, essentially you know, were what the grid was 50 years ago, 50, transmission line, substation, and distribution lines. But as we move forward, these are becoming uh, continually more interconnected and dependent on each other, whether it's transmission lines to unlock decarbonization and enhance communications uh, across the system, um, our first generation improvements in substations um, was to, to install remote monitoring and switching. Now we have the capability with new technology to, to more efficiently manage power flows through the system. Distribution lines, once you get the, the underlying infrastructure um, replaced, then you can continue to, to uh, implement smart assets on that system, developing automation, um, unlocking key use cases for voltage, uh, VVO, volt bar optimization. So optimizing the voltage on the system um, that would benefit and lower fuel costs and flow directly to, uh, to the customer. Then the, the really new stuff is, is adding additional smart devices on the system that not only will minimize disruptions on the grid, but will provide us real-time data uh, on energy use and problems on the system uh, and improving power quality. And finally, um, customers, uh, it will it, uh, give the ability to integrate customer uh, uh, distributed energy resources and electric vehicles continue to, to gain momentum and, and uh, the grid of the future will be more uh, capable of, of handling that growth of, of electric vehicles. Part of the STP is to leverage technology. Uh, we are installing best of class software platforms. Uh, fortunately, um, prior to the merger, each legacy company was going down a path to do this. And it lined up very well that what one company was implementing, the other one was planning to, but it had not implemented yet. Um, so from an enterprise asset management system, uh, work, in, uh, work in asset management system, um, we have implemented that on the, on the Kansas Central side, and we will be going live in the next year on, on the rest of the distribution platform. Just last week, we, or this week, I guess, I went live with a new energy management system on the legacy west side of our property. But uh, again, taking advantage of a, of a latest technology on a system that had already been implemented uh, on, on, the, on the east. And, and there's many other examples of that. Um, kind of one of the newest things that will be new to across the company is advanced distribution management. And Ryan will go over that in a little bit more. Uh, detail here in a few more slides. But um, with this best in class software platforms, uh, we'll have common system integration that will provide better grid control and, and monitoring. With all of those new systems, we'll get flooded with additional data uh, real time for real time grid management and provide us information that we can make proactive uh, decision, uh, grid management decisions and data-driven decisions uh, that we haven't necessarily always had uh, to the extent that will be possible going forward. Uh, there's a, there's a, 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 a plethora of new sensors that uh, manufacturers are coming out with on a, on a regular basis that we can uh, 
install on our system that will give us much more information on the asset conditions, outage data, uh, and give us the ability to enhance our grid configuration and control. As I said earlier, grid modernization is not new to the industry and it's not necessarily new to Evergy either. Back in 2014, um, Westar Energy at that time had proposed a grid modernization program. Um, along with that, we'd ask for a um, special recovery mechanism to recover those costs. Um, ultimately, um, that was not approved, uh, primarily because of disagreements around the recovery mechanism. Um, but there was the, the, the staff, at least of the KCC, agreed that we needed to uh, implement a programmatic approach to address our reliability of the distribution system and correct efficiencies. Um, and through that process, we ended up with a pilot program, 16 month pro program uh, for $50 million. And this was 50 million out of close to a $900 million program. So it, uh, it was spread around to the most critical um, things that we needed to fix. But we did identify one particular circuit that we completely rebuilt to, to demonstrate the benefits of, of grid modernization. And that's what this chart on the right shows it's a Quentin Heights circuit there in, in Topeka um, and it shows the drastic reduction in outages and improved reliability as we made investments in in modernizing the grid now again through this SDP program uh, we are proposing uh, you know to to make these grid modernization um, investments but we are not asking for anything outside of our existing regulatory uh, mechanisms for recovering those costs. Slide 14 shows the, the planned infrastructure investment as, as Kevin Bryant mentioned earlier, it's 5.6 billion in Kansas, about three and a half billion of that is in transmission distribution and IT. As you can see from the, the bar chart there, the blue bars are the distribution investment and the green bars are the transmission and then um, about 100 million for for the IT uh, projects that I that I mentioned earlier. Um, again, we're coordinating this modernization across all of TND and IT to make sure that we are are in in complete alignment um, with these with these upgrades. I will talk about in the next slide our detailed planning process that we have in place uh, that has gotten us to the point where we're at um, and uh, and and give you some more details there. The remainder of the investment um, to get to the 5.6 is, is uh, spread across generation and other general facilities. So this just gives you a lot of words here on our discipline planning process. So um, specific needs are identified that come into the pipeline and those needs can be driven by new customer growth, uh, we might have new capacity needs on the system, need for uh, contingency options, uh, might have historical liability issues. Um, changing generation mix also requires investment to take advantage of some lower cost renewable resources. And then aging asset condition also is a, is a specific need um, to drive new projects uh, in our grid modernization. Once those needs are identified, then we start working through solutions, and those might involve specific projects for, for larger uh, projects or a specific program, such as a pole replacement program, uh, where we continue to just go through our system and replace aging, aging infrastructure. Once those solutions are identified, then we go through a process of creating what cost estimates uh, will be for those projects. And then we prioritize those based on the relative benefits of those solutions, the funding availability by year, project interdependencies, and uh, labor and, and material availability is also a key factor. Once that is built, then we create our final budget and uh, go through the process of getting uh, the appropriate approvals, including board approvals, um, and then once that's happened, is uh, happened and approved, then we move into the to the execution phase. 
which I'll describe a bit more on the next page. So from an execution standpoint, uh, which is where we're spending a lot of time right now, um, our focus is on our resource requirements. Um, this is a, a increase in spend. And so we have, are in the process or have completed um, making sure that we have the uh, design and engineering requirements uh, forecasted, the, the amount of resources that we will need to, to conduct the work uh, to, to go through the detailed process that I just walked you through. We've built a construction labor forecast to make sure that we have both internal and um, contractors that we need to, to, to do the actual work in, in the field. And then in some cases, there's some specialized labor that's much more difficult to attract that uh, we've identified the, the uh, scope of that and are addressing those, those needs as well. Um, from, a, from a labor strategy, we're going to use multiple different uh, aspects. Both We're going to use internal folks. From a contractor standpoint, we'll use everything from, from time and materials to uh, bidding specific contracts to some large uh, projects may uh, be full uh, engineering, uh, procuring, and construction uh, type contracts. It will be important with a, a program of this size and, and term that we engage our contractors uh, to make sure that we all they have significant resources that they need um, and that we uh, are working together as a team to, to do this work efficiently. Materials is the next big factor for, uh, uh, for constructing these projects. Um, we've built uh, the, uh, creating a long-term outlook for material resource needs um, that we'll need through uh, 2024 that's part of the STP. Um, there has been an increased demand around materials across the country uh, for, for several reasons. One, a lot of uh, grid modernization projects going on. Um, COVID-19 created some uh, pressures on manufacturers earlier in the year that they're slowly digging out of. And this has been a very active year um, in other parts of the country from a hurricane standpoint, uh, ice storm in Oklahoma a few uh, weeks ago, Derecho in Iowa, and then the, the fires out in the, in the West have, have put a, a uh, demand on materials. And so we are closely working with our vendors and our supply chain team to make sure that we have that material um, requirements all built out uh, so that we continue to have the, the materials we need to, to do the work. So through that uh, detailed uh, process, um, we're, we're kind of at the current point where we're preparing our final budgets uh, to get approved by the board in the next few months. Um, and we're simultaneously working on execution plans. And uh, uh, so far in 2020, um, we are on plan and uh, continue to, uh, to look forward to, to hitting the ground running going into 2021. With that, I will turn it over to Ryan Mulvaney. He will go into some more de details on both transmission and distribution projects. Thank you, Bruce. Appreciate that. Just doing a quick sound check to make sure folks are picking me up. Good. Uh, good morning. I'm Ryan Mulvaney. As Kevin and Bruce mentioned, I'm Senior Director of Operations Analytics and Support. I'm responsible for several groups that serve the needs of field operations and the company in general, including fleet services and facilities and property management. Most relevant to today's discussion, I'm responsible for Evergy's T&D Asset Management Group, our Operations Analytics Group, our software support group where all operations software is managed on behalf of the business. In regards to the Evergy's STP plan, I have been engaged in the process since early in the spring, continuing through today, including an interim role setting up a PMO structure that exists today to manage the many aspects of STP. Today, I'll be providing more details on our grid modernization plans in their current form. Moving into the transmission infrastructure and benefits uh, for that investment, um, our transmission grid uh, deals with the same issue that Bruce uh, mentioned earlier, and that is aging infrastructure um, continues to be a concern for Evergy and one that we are addressing through STP. I'll provide more details on that later. 
certainly, as Bruce mentioned as well, we believe that transmission is key to in unlocking the decarbonization plans for Evergy as we move forward through the STP and even outer years. That'll be largely directed by the IRP process that many of the interveners present today are a part of that will um, we'll be providing detailed plans in 2021. Inherently with the infrastructure investment comes technology advancements like proactive monitoring of substation assets in more rural locations, better asset and condition-based data to enable and enhance predictive analytics. And with all new equipment, reduced energy losses with newer equipment is a, is a very common um, feature that um, we've experienced recently and will continue as we invest through STP. And then finally, we believe the scope of our STP investment provides economic development through the Kansas region as we spread resources and equipment um, throughout the region to build new infrastructure and put steel in the ground that drives uh, economic development all along the way. As Bruce referenced in slide 17, um, we have a planning process that is not quite concluded just yet. And we are eagerly awaiting um, our board of directors approval for our current plans um, yet this month in 2020. What you see before you here is a view of our plans for the outer four years of STP, starting in 2021 and concluding in 2024 for Transmission Kansas investment. We split that investment out for this view by voltage um, to be illustrative of the different areas that that transmission investment is um, targeting. The total investment in transmission in Kansas for the STP is $2 billion. Uh, about a quarter of that is going to substation um, assets feeding the transmission grid. And you can see there are other um, voltages that we've laid out on this chart as well. We highlighted um, 115 kV because that is the most common voltage found um, in Kansas for um, voltage, excuse me, for power uh, transmission. So therefore, um, you can see that our investment is targeted to address the aging infrastructure with those assets. Moving on to the next slide, as we mentioned about aging infrastructure, you can see we provided our major asset classes um, under, under transmission, um, and we provided their average age by operating company. You can see based on the data that our average age is either approaching or is beyond the expected life of those assets on average. Because that's an average, that would also dictate to Evergy that a good portion of those assets are beyond their expected useful life and are in need of investment, uh, investment that STP is providing. Next couple of slides, try to provide some examples to the audience present today of, of what types of investment Evergy is undertaking and what the drivers are behind that investment. So we start with the project third in Van Buren to Metal Arc. It is a project to rebuild two and a quarter miles of 115 kV lines uh, in and around Hutchinson, Kansas. The line was originally built in 1929, making large portions of it over 90 years old. Um, it is part of a larger grid serving that particular region made up of four distinct line segments. Two of those segments were rebuilt in 2006. One of those line segments we received a notice to construct from SPP. This would be the final segment that makes up the transmission grid feeding that particular region. The plan is to replace all lattice steel structures with modern structures and installs fiber allowing for better, better grid communications in the future. The second project we're highlighting today for transmission is our Hillsboro to Florence Junction uh, 115 kV project. This project takes a 10 mile radial transmission line feeding Hillsboro and provides um, resiliency by building a new line um, connecting to the existing source. The existing source is a 75 mile, 115 kV line, which provides for significant overhead exposure to outside elements to interrupt power. This project provides resiliency by building that sec second line and adding sectionalizing capabilities that'll reduce the overhead exposure and the outages experienced in that area by the total customer base served by the larger line. As you can see in the slide, this particular line was originally in service in the late 1940s making good portions of it over 70 years old. The 
Switching now to distribution, some of the benefits um, that we provided for transmission are similar uh, in the distribution space. Aging infrastructure continues to be a message that we see in our distribution infrastructure as well as transmission. And we've targeted STP spend that will lead to better resiliency of the grid during severe weather events and prepare the distribution grid for the future. Like transmission, deploying grid edge technology will be baked into all designs for better grid awareness and control for systems like ADMS or advanced distribution management software that we'll discuss a little later on. An important distinction made between distribution and transmission and the effects that we're feeling on the grid is that the distribution system is starting to be impacted by distributed energy resources spread throughout our territory, where the traditional flows of power in the distribution system that for around 100 years have flowed from a substation all the way out to individual customers' transformers is now beginning to flow bi-directionally based on um, perhaps customer-owned solar or customer-owned um, wind generation at their premise or even community solar that's becoming a reality in the Evergy space. This, this bi-directional flow um, creates stress on the grid that is obviously aging as I'll provide some data on later on. That stress uh, is something that we're addressing in the STP because a robust and resilient grid is necessary in order for Evergy to prepare our grid for those types of technologies as we roll through our planning horizon. And key while we're replacing these assets, we are continuing to deploy grid edge technology. I think that's very important to continue to lay out there because the grid of today is not going to be the grid that's expected from our customers tomorrow. And our STP contemplates rolling out newer and proven technologies to better prepare that grid for all these disruptions that we see in our planning horizons. So the distribution uh, planning progress that uh, we display before you, again, I would refer you back to slide 17. This is a snapshot in time as our planning exists today. Um, this, this plan in its detail, we're hoping to get approval for 2021 expenditures by our board of directors yet this month. But as it sits today in our planning systems, we wanted to provide again an additional amount of information on the Kansas specific distribution investment. Uh, we split them out into categories that we hope the interveners are used to seeing. Um, the total expenditures for Kansas for distribution is uh, $1.6 billion. In the distribution space, we did include IT spend because the majority of the IT spend directly benefits the distribution part of the grid. You can see on here that we have split our spend out in between categories uh, similar to customer and new business distribution connections or load growth um, distribution connections and other required projects that are required either by um, law or by local um, um, cities or towns. You can see the largest portion of the spend that we've laid out for distribution is programmatic asset replacement. And that matches the general overall theme that the distribution grid is aging and is in need of, of investment for Evergy to continue to serve our customers reliably in the future. That asset replacement takes the forms of programs um, similar to, to what Bruce laid out earlier, but in a little more detail, um, programs like um, breaker um, replacements programmatically throughout our system based on our data intelligence of that breaker's operation, lateral improvement programs to get into neighborhoods and address reliability problems directly affecting customers, uh, underground cable replacements. Uh, most of the utility industry began um, placing subdivision cable underground in the late 70s and early 80s. Most of that cable is now coming up at the end of its useful life and requires replacement. Uh, Bruce mentioned pole replacements earlier, certainly a critical asset as part of how we deliver overhead power to our customers. Uh, and then certainly there are many substation components that could be laid out as well that have programmatic replacement plans as part of STP. The aim and target of these programmatic replacements are to target the cause of outages and reliability concerns throughout the system and was a key learning from slide 13 where Bruce presented the Quinton Heights circuit rebuild project. That rebuild project was rebuilding that line from the ground up. Our programmatic replacement typically tries to target key assets as part of those uh, different functions that I mentioned earlier from the programs. So that instead of rebuilding all of our lines from the ground up in the distribution system, 
we try to target the failed assets or failing assets and replace those parts as we inspect our system through design and engineering functions. As I mentioned, this distribution also, uh, this distribution investment um, snapshot also includes IT spend. Um, that IT spend includes things like um, consolidating our EAM. And, and again, I, I, sorry about the uh, acronyms. EAM stands for Enterprise Asset Management um, across our, our T&D groups so that we're all operating on the same system and would also include our substation groups. That includes consolidation of our outage management system um, so that we're all using the same outage management system. It includes a significant investment in our communications infrastructure, which is under study right now, um, both involving our transmission grid and bringing fiber through our transmission grid, but also in enhancing all the different facets of communication we use, including wireless communication throughout our service territory. And finally, we wanted to introduce the concept of advanced distribution management systems to this particular party and Evergy's flavor on it, which we have deemed internally to be called ADMX. More to come on that here in a second. Again, we reference aging infrastructure for our transmission. Distribution is no different. Uh, as you can see, we provided for major asset classes of the distribution system, the average age of those uh, components for our system. And we provided it by operating company. And you see based on the, those operating companies years in service and the growth that those different operating companies have experienced, they do have different ages that we are providing. But you see the story is the same in that many of those asset classes are either approaching on average their expected life or have exceeded um, their expected life. The STP is providing significant investment through those programmatic replacements to address this problem. Wanted to take a moment now to provide some highlights of some projects that we're working on as part of STP in the distribution space. We have a project before you called the Cherryville Conversion Project. The Cherryville area is served partially by a 4KV um, circuit. Um, 4KV circuits were a standard in the utility industry prior to 1950 um, with the advent of air conditioning, and which increased a load significantly on distribution systems. The industry has moved all but away from 4KV systems. Evergy still has some pockets throughout its territory that still remain 4KV. This is an example of a project where we are going in and programmatically replacing the entire 4KV system. The scope of this particular project includes replacing transformers and substations and upgrading the entire system to a 12 um, KV system feeding the customers in that region. The scope also includes replacing um, poles and wire that are on that 4KV circuit all the way down to the customer individual transformers, all upgrading that system to a 12 or 13 KV system. Another large driver of 4 KV replacement is that the parts are, are frankly becoming hard to find. Um, and when we have systems that date back 15, 16, 70 years old, especially ones that are no longer part of the current standard of the industry, um, parts and, and sourcing materials becomes a growing concern. 4 KV systems also require more substations uh, and cannot carry power nearly the long distances that modern um, town and urban areas um, require. So this is an all encompassing plan that goes all the way from a substation, all the way down to the residential customer for the town of Cherryville. The final distribution investment project we wanted to talk about today is the concept of advanced distribution systems, or you'll hear it referred to within Evergy as ADMX, which is Evergy's flavor on that system. Before I get into why we have rebranded it internally in Evergy, I first want to explain what is an ADMS. First of all, it stands for Advanced Distribution Management Systems. Uh, when, when you hear things, when you go to industry conferences or you hear other utilities talk about a self-healing grid, what they're talking about is an ADMS system. It, it's very similar to the SCADA system that's provided on the transmission system. Uh, however, it has many more thousand sensors reporting into it and it also has to deal with bi-directional flow on a, on a very common occurrence as uh, our industry prepares for uh, distributed energy resources throughout our system. So the ADMS is more than just a SCADA system because it can actually reach out and control devices in the field on the distribution grid and, and switch them uh, upon 
um, very quick notice when disturbances are recognized. So for example, today an outage occurs, a, a common response is that a utility dispatches a lineman to go address that problem and find the problem. With an ADMS system and with modern sensors rolled out on the system, not only can we address that problem and know where that problem is, but we can automatically switch power around in that particular region and provide power back to all customers who lost power except for the segment of line that experienced the problem. Um, very key functionality and functionality has been proven in the industry. Um, it also comes with other functionalities uh, common uh, to smart grid technologies that were popular in the five and 10 year ago um, timeframes. Bruce mentioned volt VAR optimization earlier that allows us to control more efficiently the amount of voltage that we're putting out from a substation onto our individual circuits and is commonly used as an energy efficiency option when peak load times are experienced on our system. An ADMS system can control that particular functionality from a central location and can still control the other items that are going on outside of it. Another popular functionality with ADMS is fault location analysis. Again, with those sensors that are rolled out on the system, they're all reporting back information in near real time and can this back office system, this ADMS system can take that data and can help us figure out within a few spans where exactly that problem is so that instead of dispatching a personnel in the field to a rather large region, we're dispatching a person in the field to where we believe the problem to have occurred. Bruce mentioned that leads to operating um, cost savings in the future. And we believe over the long term of this investment that that'll not only um, lead to operating savings, but also lead to a higher, more resilient grid that'll be able to deliver at least the same, if not better resiliency to our customers in different regions. So why did Evergy take a different um, um, branding, I guess, approach to ADMS and why are we calling it ADMX? Well, an ADMS system in the industry and the most that have been rolled out at, at utilities across the country are very, very large systems. Uh, it's commonly referred to as box systems, meaning they're a large system that provides a whole suite of functionality and they're very, very expensive. Those particular systems also tend to have their strengths and they have their weaknesses from a functionality standpoint. So for example, one ADMS system on the market may do a very good job at fault location analysis but it may be very, very weak when it comes to volt bar optimization. Another concern of Evergy's in this particular technology space is that we're still relatively new into this particular technology. ADMSs and the concept of ADMSs have only been around for five years or so in the utility space and implementing a big box system to achieve all this functionality um, creates a fair amount of risk for Evergy because as this technology advances, and new breakthroughs are found in this space, Evergy will have an investment made, a very large investment made in a traditional ADMS system that would be very hard to walk away from to take advantage of the new functionality. We have found in scanning the market that we think there are niche players that are providing each of these functionalities in much smaller systems, and we can deploy those smaller systems, measure them at deployment in months versus years it would take to deploy an ADMS system. The functionality then allows us to, as these technologies evolve and perhaps better players come to market for a given functionality, it's much easier for us to retire each of those and bring forth a newer, better version of those systems than if it was part of a larger box system. A very large focus of Evergy's STP from an IT perspective is evaluating the right niche players over the next few years and begin deploying those systems by the end of the STP horizon to take advantage of all those functionalities we talked about earlier. This modular approach allows Evergy to bring functionality to customers faster, while also allowing Evergy the flexibility to adapt and adopt changing technologies over time. If you can tell, we're very excited about this particular concept. I think now I will turn it back over to Kevin Bryant to summarize our remarks as, as, as part of this presentation. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Mulvaney, uh, my favorite Jayhawk. Uh, good, good job. Appreciate the appreciate the comments. So I, I'm going to turn to uh, slide 31, I believe, in the presentation. Uh, so in, in wrapping up, you know, you've got a 
giving you a lot of uh, overview of our grid modernization plans today. Uh, we lay out on slide 31 our next steps. Um, obviously, our next steps include continuing to get stakeholder, stakeholder feedback. Uh, so feedback from you all through these workshops. Um, we want to continue. I think Bruce went through the process of uh, our budget process. So Ryan mentioned uh, we get our annual budgets approved uh, every year in December for the following year. So uh, we have that upcoming and we'll get those finalized. And then our team, uh, folks all across Evergy, engineers, planners, IT professionals, our construction and maintenance folks are working diligently to fi finalize detailed execution plans uh, to make sure we have the right um, labor, we have the right materials to execute uh, these plans consistent with our expectations. So a lot of work will uh, be done there. And then obviously in February, we'll uh, update our five-year uh, capital plan as we customarily do. If you turn to the to the last slide, um, today's presentation, we wanted to give you a feel for uh, some of the drivers, what we're seeing. Um, obviously, the generation landscape is changing uh, with renewables coming online uh, more uh, prolifically, both on the customer side as well as on the utility side, which requires our grid uh, to have different capability. Uh, ex customer expectations are changing with greater sensitivity to service interruptions, uh, severe weather impacts. I think Bruce went through what we've seen across the, the country uh, with uh, storms, uh, wildfire, uh, continue to threaten uh, aging infrastructure. We believe that our plan addresses these concern concerns through timely focused investment that lowers our overall operating costs and improves our grid security and resiliency and better positions our grid for a more decarbonized world. So um, with that, we're happy to open it up to questions, although I will also ask Mr. Vincent to keep us abreast of Baby Watch. So if there's a development there, keep us posted because we all view ourselves as part of the family of folks for, to provide electric service here in Kansas. And certainly adding, adding a new member to that family is pretty exciting, especially if it's not my baby. <laughs> exactly. And so um, I would agree. We would... Uh, 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 appreciate the update. So thank you. Um, thank you everybody for um, your um, presentation. Um, I think the way we're going to begin this is I'll ask the commissioners if they have questions. Then at that point, I will turn it over to um, Brian to um, then uh, visit with the interveners. And again, as we said, we'd go through in an alphabetical order to see what questions or comments they have as well. Now, this is the entire presentation. So um, I would just remind everybody if there's a specific page or a section that you're in, if you could refer to it, it would be helpful to all of us. So now it looks like the concentration board, I can see everybody out there or most everybody. And, um, I'll begin with uh, Commissioner Keene. Do you have any comments or questions right now? And I will say that commissioners have the, um, the opportunity to ask questions at any time if they are prompted by um, a comment or a question that um, an intervener would raise. Um, just, um, you're, you're just gonna have to jump in and ask your question. But at this point in time, Commissioner Keene, is there anything that you would like to specifically um, uh, provide a, uh, a question or a comment? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, no comment. I have um, many questions. I'll try to cut through them as quickly as I can. And I think probably, uh, Mr. Bryant, uh, the first ones being sort of overview questions could best be directed to you if I could. And, then I'll uh, sequentially pick on your colleagues. Um, Sounds good. Good. Um, thank you, first of all, for being with us this morning and for giving us the benefit of this in this public forum. I think it's, it's most helpful to all the participants uh, to receive this kind of granular detail about what your plans are. And we're most grateful for your doing this. By way of overview, obviously this STP uh, the aspect of STP that you focused on today is grid modernization within the context of the trans of transmission um, projects, distribution projects, IT support, and uh, management upgrades. That's the way I, I see what it is that you've presented. 
And as I understand it, um, and I'm looking now at actually either uh, page 31 of your presentation or page 14. Actually, page 14 might be more helpful if we could take a look at that. Okay. So as I understand it, this grid modernization that you're addressing today um, comes at a capital cost of approximately 3.5 billion over the five year period uh, stretching from 2020 through 2024. Um, in a recent filing that uh, the company made with the commission, uh, you indicated that your total STP capital expenditures were approximately 8.9 billion. Um, I'm assuming that that includes both the Kansas and the Missouri components, does it not? That's correct, sir. So <clears throat> I think my question then is, if the Kansas STP capital expenditures are 5.6 billion, what comprises the approximately 2.1 billion in additional STP capital expenditures beyond those that you've addressed here today related to um, transmission and distribution? And can you be a little bit granular on what, how that 2.1 would break out? Break out? So, so you're looking at, make sure I, I uh, uh, hear the question correctly. So you're asking about where, where does the difference in CapEx between the 5.6 total contemplated in Kansas versus what we describe on the slide as being uh, capital dedicated to transmission distribution and IT support for grid modernization? Yes, sir. That is the question. That yeah, so, so that, that difference, um, you know, if you look at the, the third bullet point under investment highlights, I mean, we, we continue to make investments in capital expenditures across our generation fleet, for example. So we've not called those um, grid modernization in this context. But if you think about ongoing maintenance capex for our existing generation fleet, for example, uh, that would fall into that bucket. Uh, any new uh, renewable um, investment uh, would come into that bucket along with other general facility investments. So our IT projects, other customer uh, focused capital projects that are not specifically uh, by, by our definition here, grid modernization would comprise that difference. Can you be a bit more specific about that, Mr. Bryant? Uh, of the 2.1 billion that we're talking about uh, being the difference between the total spend and the part dedicated to, to transmission and distribution, uh, what portion of that will be dedicated to um, additional renewal generation facilities. So we, we don't have that on this slide. Do we have that available? Um, we, we, we can get that for you, Jeremy, Jeremy King. Is it a large portion of that? Uh, I know for new generation capital, we have $700 million in, uh, in total contemplated over the five years. Now that's across both states, Missouri and Kansas. So a portion of that obviously would be, get spent in Kansas. And then the ongoing capital expenditures for our existing you know, generation fleet, for example, at Jeffrey Energy Center or at Lacine or at Lawrence Energy Center, those, those plants require ongoing CapEx. And I don't have those numbers at my fingertips, but I'm looking for my, my team to, to, uh, to dig those out for us. If you could provide those for us, I would, I would be grateful, Mr. Bryant. Absolutely. Um, let me go back to, let's see. Again, I'm looking to, I'll just, I can, and uh, I, can, I, can, I can go through, I can move through pretty quickly the uh, presentation. Um, again, way, way of overview. I think we have a pretty diverse um, audience here today. Thank, thankfully, I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that we have so many people participating here and uh, that have an interest in this subject. Uh, if, if you could, uh, within, within the context of your five-year strategic plan, um, when you summarize basically this plan in terms of the STP, and you're talking about sustainability. What does sustainability within the context of this mean to Evergy? Can you help us out uh, yeah, good, for those, yeah, of, for those who, 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 who might have an interest in that? Yeah, yeah, great, great, great question. So, you know, from our perspective, from a sustainability perspective, I mean, you know, it, it's at its essence to be able to sustain. 
And obviously, you know, as we looked at the STP and we looked forward, we wanted to have a capital plan um, that allowed us to continue to maintain and sustain reliable electric infrastructure, but also to do so in a way that um, uh, minimize the impact on our customers. So a, a lot of focus and sensitivity around rate impacts. So I, obviously, as we, as we thought about incremental capital investment to meet the needs that you know, myself and Bruce and Ryan have talked about today, um, to keep in the long-term impact in mind was important. You know, sustain, some folks, when they think about sustainability, uh, surely think about green. Obviously, where, where we sit uh, to extent, you know, where we, we think about renewables to, de to deploy as part of our um, generation fleet, for example, uh, it's got to be sustainable. So it has to be cost effective. And one of the things we've seen uh, that we've talked about today, certainly with a focus on grid mod, is that these new technologies allow us to deploy technology to deliver better service at better cost. Uh, so more sustainable costs for our customers, but on the on the generation side as well, making sure we're pursuing you know generation evolution that is cost of cost effective for our customers both today and in the future is our definition of sustainability. So uh, we certainly um, appreciate the environmental benefits. Um, we think you know as we evolve both on the grid and on the generation side of our business, we can deploy new technologies to over, lower our overall cost structure and position the utility for um, better service uh, moving forward uh, in a sustainable fashion. So it's not just green for the sake of being green and don't, don't get me wrong, we appreciate the, the benefits um, associated with all the elements of lowering our costs and being more efficient, but it's uh, using multiple dim dimensions of the word sustainability. Very holistic answer, I appreciate that very much. Um, I'm looking here again at the overview uh, page, which is uh, five very briefly, if you would. Uh, yes, the second bullet point that you have there uh, focuses on, uh, in part, uh, cost competitiveness. And how do you see that as being realized? Can you expand on that just a bit for me? Yeah, big, big, big focus for us. So, you know, we've obviously um, have been working with a lot of the folks on this Zoom. So a lot of familiar faces since Evergy was formed, having gone through the merger process, obviously participating in much, multiple venues in the legislature and, and at the commission. And we're well aware of the, the sensitivity to rates and the cost competitiveness of Kansas rates. So as we form the STP, making sure we continue to have a plan that allowed us to make those long-term investments, but also close that gap between our peers around us who are also seeing the same trends that we're talking about. So you're seeing other utilities with grid modernization plans, with plans to invest in renewables, but making sure that we could continue to, to focus our, our plan to close that gap uh, from a rate competitiveness uh, perspective with the states that are around us, Iowa, Oklahoma, um, uh, uh, Missouri, uh, for example. So that was a big piece of what we focused on from a cost competitiveness perspective. So, you know, I talked about lowering our overall uh, net fuel operating and maintenance expense by 25%. I mean, I, I emphasize that because, you know, we show numbers in a chart and that 25% sometimes can be lost upon you. But, you know, if you look at our cost structure, um, our NFOM cost structure back around the time of the merger, I think we were in the 1.2-ish, 1.1, 1.2 billion uh, annual spend for non-fuel operating and maintenance expense. We'll be close to $900 million once we uh, execute the STP. So, you know, that's a, that's a lot of, you know, deploying technology, uh, being more efficient and realizing attrition across our, our workforce. Um, those cost benefits accrue to our customers. And so uh, that's a big piece of the cost competitiveness of the STP. We talk about fuel and purchase power. I mean, those benefits flow through our fuel adjustment clauses uh, almost immediately uh, through our F FAC. So we, you know, being holistic to make sure we lower our overall operating costs and creating um, the rate competitiveness was a big part of what our board management team focused on as we, as we developed the STP. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Bryant. Um, very, uh, very thoughtful answers. Um, I think, uh, unless you have great objection, I'm going to switch to one of your colleagues and pick on one of them again now. I think that's an absolutely fantastic <laughs> idea. I, I, I want to double back with you if I can toward the end, because I do have a really overview question, I think, that is best directed to you. But let me reserve that until uh, I've had a chance to communicate and talk with uh, your colleagues there. Sounds good. You can give me something to look forward to. <laughs> well, 
Thank you. I appreciate your indulgence of my questions. Uh, Mr. Aiken, if you would, please. Yes. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, yes, let's focus, if we can, first upon uh, uh, some of your thoughts here having to do with uh, uh, the modernization of the grid. Uh, and I'm looking here at the really very general and uh, somewhat generic uh, uh, slide on page nine, <clears throat> where you're, you're obviously talking about uh, replacing aging infrastructure and adding new, new technologies going forward. As I understood your presentation, this is basically pretty much built into the built into the cake anyway, is it not? In the ordinary course of executing your business plan, even independently of the SDP, these are the sorts of things that you do on a fairly routine basis, are they not? They are, a Commissioner. Um, it just at the point or the at the pace that we're replacing our infrastructure today, we're not keeping up with the pace that it's aging. Um, so even ever since uh, 2015, when we got the pilot uh, grid resiliency program, um, we had we kept a higher level investment in our distribution system. <clears throat> and in fact, we last this year, we're going to replace about 5000 distribution poles, for example, which is, you know, a, a rate that's significantly more than it was 10 years ago. But at that pace, it would take us over 100 years to replace all of our, our distribution. So, um, yeah, as we as we continue to just do our daily work, we are implementing um, the technology, but we got to get the base infrastructure in good shape first before we can put a lot of new technology on it. It would be like putting, you know, a computer in a in a 1964 car. Well, it's not going to do any good if the, if the backbone's not there to, to, that you can take advantage of it. Okay, I appreciate the answer, very good answer. Uh, let's turn to page 10, if we could, for a moment. Um, I'm looking here, first of all, at uh, your, your second bullet point, enabling decarbonization by improving renewable delivery and strengthening the grid for fossil fuel retirements. I have a couple of questions here in connection with that particular bullet, if you would, please. Uh, what's the life expectancy of your current coal facility assets? Um, I couldn't tell you that off the top of my head. Um, uh, most of them are reaching their end of life. Um, um, they were built uh, at least, uh, you know, there are bigger ones uh, at the Jeffrey energy center, um, were put in service in the late seventies, early eighties. Um, I think they're all in the 50 to 60 year life range. So they're, they're reaching their, their end of life. Even with all the environmental retrofits that we've witnessed over more, more times more recent than 1970s, that's still the case. I mean, those environmental retrofits uh, have a shorter lifespan. Um, so they've been in place a few years, but that doesn't necessarily replace the underlying infrastructure within the power plant. Those environmental retrofits were add-ons, if you will, to those power plants. Okay. Um, another question I have with regard to this bullet is this, um, and, and I'm going to word it in the best way I can. So if I don't do justice to the vocabulary of your industry, it isn't because I intended to do it, <laughs> uh, to do it an end justice. Extent is the realization of this goal on fossil fuel retirements contingent upon significant technological advances in storage and battery capacity that are yet to be realized? Um, I, actually, I think the way I would answer that, if I could, we've got a, a separate workshop coming up here in a few months that will be more specific to our IRP process that will touch on that technology. I'm not an expert in, in those areas, and those I think we could better answer those questions in that workshop. Okay, well, I was I was trying to get, kind of get trying to be a little bit holistic in my questions here, given the fact this is the first of these. I, I do appreciate the fact that we we do have uh, other subsets that follow in terms of the subject matter here as we go through the other three workshops. Um, do you have is there anybody there who'd be able to answer that today? Chairman Keen, I'll, I'll take a crack at this, and I've got some colleagues in here who can 
clean, clean up any mess that, that I create. But with within our STP, um, you know, just just like the deployment of uh, wind technology. So you've seen quite a bit of wind uh, deployed um, by Evergy throughout Kansas with, you know, close to half of our energy being provided by, by wind. Um, and that, that wind has the benefit from, from investment, uh, from tax credits. Um, but, you know, as we look forward, we're not counting, counting on an additional change in technology because uh, the solar resources, the current solar technology, the renewable technology um, is viable to today, uh, given the current level of tax credits and the, and the cost reductions that, that we've seen as we compare them to some of our, our alternatives as our existing uh, generation fleet uh, reaches its end of life and, and needs to be replaced. So we're not counting on any changes in technology to, uh, at least as contemplated by the, the five-year plan that we have uh, in the STP. All right, thank you. Sure. Yes, Mr. Mr. Aiken, if I could pick on you one more time. All right. Or at least another time. <laughs> uh, turning to page 11, if you would, we'll go through some of these pretty quickly. Um, I thought you gave a pretty good explanation of what is being portrayed here uh, with the transmission lines, substations, and distribution lines basically being the system as it existed, as I understood you to say it 50 years ago. And then as we fast forward to today and move forward prospectively, we have the all the advances and add-ons by with smart devices and, and all these other new demands that are gonna be placed upon the uh, transmission system. That's the way I understood this. Um, so basically in terms of the uh, CapEx as it affects the the older infrastructure, the transmission lines, the substations, and the distribution lines. Um, is, this, is, is this largely upgrades to existing facilities or is it replacement? Well, when we, we replace, we're generally upgrading as well um, to a higher standard, more uh, resilient system, larger poles, heavier conductor, um, and so forth. So it's a little bit hard to to split that, but split that difference. But um, as I mentioned earlier, we've got to get the underlying infrastructure replaced so that we can put the new smart devices on on the system. But when you look at it from a from a dollar perspective, I would I would say it's safe to say that the the majority of the dollars are replacing the the existing infrastructure, but not necessarily like for like. Okay, fair. Uh, I appreciate the. Uh the hues of gray in, in, in that answer as well. Um, if we could turn to uh, page 15 of your slides. And it, it, in my first question, if I could kind of cross reference, uh, if you would please to page 26. I'm getting a bit into Ryan's territory here admittedly. So if you care to defer to him, that would, I, I could understand that too. But um, in fact, no, I'm gonna go ahead and ask the question. Um, um, as you set out the planning process here, you're obviously anticipating new customer growth and perhaps changes in your capacity needs. When I look back at uh, slide number 26, and I see the portrayal here of the distribution planning process, um, it appears to me that in terms of all the various components that comprise that process, the two over to the far left-hand side, the new customer business and the load growth are relatively smaller percentages of the total capital expenditures that are gonna be dedicated to distribution. Um, so I guess my question is, does that suggest that you are anticipating relatively, relatively level or static load demand over the five-year STP timeframe? Yeah, our, our load growth is not very robust and it hasn't been for the last few years, uh, especially when you look at our you know, total sales growth, 
but that does drive some new customer growth because you get growth in certain parts of the system where you're losing some load in other parts of the system. Right. And so just as some of our communities continue to grow, new businesses come in, um, it does require some additional investment to serve that load. Um, but this is in line with, with what our uh, forecasts are for our, our load growth and customer growth. And, and, uh, uh, and that's been you know, evaluated based on the current economy and, and our historical load growth as well. Okay, very good. Um, it, 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 it's difficult to ask some of these questions in the sense of some of them are more overview questions and then we can go down to the granular, the granular back to the overview. So I don't know how fair it is for me to ask this question of you. If it's better directed at, at Mr. Bryant, uh, uh, he could certainly jump in if he wished to do so. But um, I look, when I look again at this chart, and I'm looking at this specified needs column, um, I have a few questions about uh, the reference here to changes in the generation mix. Um, I don't know if you'd feel more comfortable answering those or having somebody else. It's your call. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. Which, which slide are you on? I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm still on page 15. Okay. And can you re restate your question? I'm sorry. Sure, sure. no, that's fine. I, I, I lost you there, I'm, my, my apologies. Uh, you look along the far left-hand column there, it identifies all these specific needs. And as I go down about two thirds of the way down there, it refers to changes in the generation mix uh, to being required for stability and reliability. Yeah, so okay. I'll take a shot at it and, and, and turn it okay. over to Kevin. If, um, you know, as we retire... Let, let, let me ask a couple of prefatory questions here if I can, just okay. to give me an overview. I, part, part, I'm not trying to be rude, but just to mm. kind of cut to the chase a bit. That's um, fine. It, it, can you tell me, in terms of generation, what is the current generation mix for average? If you could break that out as a rough percentage from natural gas, coal, wind, uh, you know, you have that available. Um, I think someone here does, and we'll be able to get it for you. So maybe okay. come back to that here as we dig that number out. Okay. Um, because what, what I would like to, 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 to learn from you is what that current mix is and what that current mix will be after the STP is implemented. So, so I can, and I can take, I, I can take that one, Chairman. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, uh, so, um, you know, in 2020, about 39% of our generation capacity is from coal, which is in contrast to 2010, when we were at about a little over 50%. Uh, but, but if I stay with 2020, uh, about 39% of our capacity is from coal, another 28 or so percent from renewables, 7% from nuclear, so our station down at Wolf Creek, and then uh, the remaining from natural gas. So we have a series of natural gas peakers that um, that serve our load for during peak periods. So the natural gas component is roughly what percentage is that we're? Uh, it's about twenty. My eyes are bad. About twenty-six percent. Okay. I appreciate that, Kevin. And then, and then after the implementation of the SDP, uh, what would, how would those breakouts, uh, what would that look like then? Yeah, so, so what we've projected is that coal would go down to about 34%. Renewables, roughly a third, so 30, 35 or so percent. Th that same 7% slice from nuclear and the same um, percentage for natural gas. Okay. And, and as Mr. Aiken mentioned, I mean, a lot of that will be dependent on the integrated resource plan, which, um, will better inform kind of our future capacity plans, but that's, that's what we have as a starting point in the STP. That's incredibly helpful for me, but what, what, what overview, Mr. Bryant, because it, it, it really kind of provides the perspective, the look back about where, where, where we will be and what we will have accomplished. 
uh, uh, at the end of the SDP process. And uh, uh, it still provides you, it strikes me, the only editorial comment I hope I make today, period, <laughs> and the fact I'm grateful for your answering these questions, is it's a pretty balanced mix, it appears to me. Absolutely. And that's a key, key part of our planning process is balance and making sure we give ourselves you know, time to optimize the technology that's available today and provide flexibility to make investments in the future. So absolutely. Very good. With you. Th I thank you very much, Mr. Brown. Uh, uh, very helpful to me. Um, Mr. Brown, if I can stick with you, I'll ask you yet another overview question. Uh, sure. I plan to ask this within the context of what is the, the, the area that uh, Mr. Aiken had been addressing, but I think perhaps in fairness to all, it would be best that I ask, ask this of you if I can. And again, it's, it's, it's an overview. I'm trying to use this, at least for my, my learning uh, uh, experience here, to come away from this with some overview uh, uh, information upon which I can kind of put some ornaments as we go on in, 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 in greater levels of detail. Um, my question would be this. I, I, I kind of ask it within the context of what's presented on page 17 of the, your presentation. But the question is essentially this. Um, we're now in the midst of a five-year rate moratorium for Evergy that uh, by my math and by my reckoning terminates in 2023. Correct. Uh, however, the out year and a little bit more than that of the STP plan extends beyond the expiration of the moratorium. So my question is, um, what impact will STP have on requests for future rate increases when the rate moratorium terminates? So, so past that next series of that series of rate cases in. 2023-24, so yes. so long term. Yes. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna let, I'm gonna uh, jump on this and then ask my regulatory friends to to make sure they they correct me. But um, you know, we I mentioned in my formal remarks that you know we expect rate increases, uh, annualized rate increases through the um, STP to be about two you know around inflation, so less than or equal to inflation. Um, well, that would be our um, our guidepost moving forward. Is that you know we we have to be sensitive to to rate increases in our across our jurisdictions. I know a lot of folks on this uh, uh, meeting will appreciate that, um, but certainly having rate increases that are less than inflation is our goal and target. So, uh, on an annualized basis, that is absolutely the starting point. Um, and then you know what it looks like post 2024 will you know, be a function of uh, any kind of renewable investment uh, along with ongoing grid investment, but we'll still be operating with that same, uh, that same kind of constraint uh, in terms of focusing on the impact to our customers at less than, less than inflation in that 2% range. Okay, very well. I appreciate your indulgence of that question as well. Certainly. I believe uh, that's the last overview question. Let me uh, let me focus. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, Mr. Aiken, I think uh, I, I, you're off the hook with me too. Uh, I appreciate uh, the indulgence both of you have given me. And uh, let's uh, pass the torch here if we can very briefly to Mr. Mulvaney. Morning, sir. Or actually, I think it's afternoon. Good now. morning. How are you? Good. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Funny how that happens. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm looking at uh, slide number, uh, page number 19, if you would, please. Okay. And um, many of the questions I had, you did explain in your, in your presentation. Um, one general question I did have for you is that is, is just, again, by way of information and, and to give me some frame of reference here about the aging infrastructure concerns that you have. And, and I get that, uh, your, your, your assets are spread across the landscape of the Eastern half of the state <laughs> in a big way. And uh, you, you have, all of you, the, the, the company has uh, 
some major undertakings just when you uh, you wake up in the morning to try to uh, keep everything going and keep all of us provided with electricity. And, uh, it's it's a challenge for you, I'm sure. Um, if we could take a look at pages 21, which has to do with aging infrastructure. I guess my question is this. Um, there's a line out of the movie Kindergarten Cop where one of the actors says to the other one, kindergarten is like you know, the ocean, you can never turn your back on it. And I sense that aging infrastructure for you is something that you can never turn your back on because it just looms. It's always there. It's always, to some extent, going to be there. It's part of operating your business uh, in, in a meaningful way. But I guess my question is, given the fact that just from this page, we see so many of the asset types are either near or past their expected life. Uh, to what extent has the company been addressing this in either prior regulatory or rate proceedings over the past several decades? I presume it's, it's sort of an ongoing process. Could you explain that just a, a bit for us? Sure. Um, both uh, operating companies in the state of Kansas have programs in place to address aging infrastructure uh, and have for decades. As you said, it's not a new um, concept to utilities. However, I would say it's starting to accelerate just based on how our, our systems grew over the last century. There was a, a fair amount of growth in the 50s, 60s, and 70s um, for all of our systems as the country expanded and so did the distribution system. And now you look at the age of those assets and they're all coming up on these expected life and years. The, the way we've addressed them to date uh, is more programmatically. We try to target based on the information we have available and, and based on partnering studies that we do through EEI and other places as to what, what are their core, what are the assets that are most likely to fail under what conditions, and then how do we use that information to do a more programmatic approach across the system to address the worst of the worst and get and avoid those um, outage minutes as they occur. Um, I will say that we, we are concerned that, that that's starting to accelerate. I think um, um, Mr. Aiken mentioned the uh, uh, Edgar program that was um, provided to the commission in 2014 and ultimately approved a pilot. Part of the basis of that program was that reliability is going to continue to get worse if we don't get more um, strategic and targeted about our infrastructure investment moving forward. And, and I think utilities enjoyed for a large portion of our existence, uh, load growth um, for a long part of, of our existence all the way through uh, the late 90s and early 2000s, where we could rely on three to 4% growth in our load. And therefore we could use some of that funding back to replace assets. As you know, and Bruce mentioned, our load is relatively flat. So cost pressures uh, are significant to us. And we're very conscious of the fact that we can't keep coming to regulatory proceedings as much as possible annually and asking for rate increases. So we're constantly balancing the idea that we need to address this need, but we also need to balance the fact that any investment we make has an impact to our customer rates. And we need to be very thoughtful and intentional about that. I appreciate your answer. Mr. I'm sorry, Tina. Mr. Aiken, did you want to-, to Yeah, if I, if, if I could just add on to that a little Please. bit. Um, you know, ideally, if we had a crystal ball, we'd go out and replace an asset the day before it fell down or the day before it created a reliability problem. But unfortunately, we don't have that. And so, you know, our customers have benefited for us being able to take advantage of those assets much longer than their expected lives. You, you, don't, you don't want it to get to a point where the customers start uh, seeing reliability concerns. But those, those concerns are there. Um, you know, example I use with my folks is, you know, when, when is that asset going to, to fail? Uh, you know, 20 years ago, I knew I was going to have health issues in my future. But 20 years later today, I know that time period is a lot closer than it was 20 years ago. And that's kind of the way I look at our, our aging infrastructure is, you know, whether it was past life 10 years ago, I know it's a lot closer to failing today than it, than it was then. And it's closer every day that we go out in the future. And it's just to a point that, you know, we, we feel that 
you know, we need to take a proactive approach and start replacing that. And with the STP and the, and the cost efficiencies that we're able to identify, we're able to do that without having a uh, significant impact on customer rates. Thank you. I appreciate your observation. <clears throat> Mr. Mulvaney, if I could turn back to you again, uh, still on page uh, 19, um, one of the bullet points you, 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 uh, you have here um, with respect to transmission infrastructure benefits is the uh, additional spend would reduce energy losses. Could you expand on that just a bit? Certainly. Um, inherent in any um, electric infrastructure is the concept of energy losses as we transmit it over um, long portions of our territory. Um, certainly in the transmission space specifically we're speaking to here, um, anytime we um, transform that power from a higher voltage to a lower voltage or sometimes from a lower voltage to a higher voltage, just that aspect and then that transformer itself, energy losses are present on our system. That's energy that was typically created by our generation stations that is not being delivered to our customers because of that loss impact. Newer equipment, um, as manufacturing processes have evolved over the last 50 and 60 years, they're, they're much more efficient at reducing those energy losses as we transmit the power throughout the region. And then at times, part of our planning process too, uh, and Bruce mentioned that sometimes we upgrade our infrastructure when we upgrade to higher voltages at times, that also reduces losses because we can transmit the power further. All right. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, I'm looking ahead. I think uh, all the other distribution questions I had, I think we've already we've already uh, answered. Uh, so I think if I might, uh, Mr. Bryant, I'll come back to you with one final question from me. Yes, sir. Mr. Mulvaney, thank you for your thank you for your input. I appreciate it. Uh, and the same to you, Mr. Aiken. Thank You're you, welcome, sir. Um, um, Mr. Brand, are you there? Yes, sir. Okay, there you are. <laughs> Good to see you again. Yeah, well, same here. Uh, uh, I appreciate the level of professionalism that uh, all of you have uh, demonstrated here and the command of knowledge that you have about your business. Um, I'm going to ask you, you a sir. derivation of the general question I've already asked, but I don't intend it to be a, either just a strict duplication. In the event that the STP is proposed as implemented within the proposed five-year time parameter, and my guess is that it, it certainly will with all your management skills. My question is what impact will the STP transmission, distribution, generation and decarbonization capital expenditures have on energy electric rates in the near future. Yeah, so so I'll I'll go back to um, you know, I, let me let me see if this um, scratches the the itch. But our expectation is that uh, for the STP for the transmission grid mod invest distribution. Uh, the generation investments coupled with the cost savings, uh, both on the non-fuel O&M side as well as fuel and purchase power, results in annualized rate increases of uh, less than inflation, so on or around that two percent-ish range. Uh, some of those uh, those costs, some of those cost savings will flow through, um, for example, fuel through the, uh, uh, the fuel adjustment clause. Um, and a, a big portion of the investment will come in in that series of rate cases that you that you mentioned earlier after the rates stay out concludes in 2023. Very good. Uh, I, 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 I misled you. <laughs> I had another question I wanted to, to ask prefatory to that one. I appreciate your answer very much, Mr. Bryan. Sure. And I'd, I'd like to go back and fold back. Uh, I, I'm going to just... Uh, stick with you if it's all right. And if you care to defer to others, that would be fine. I'm, I'm trying to really kind of cut to the chase here and be respectful of, of everybody's time. Sure. Um, uh, with, going back to a reference point here. Um, uh, 
we have a report that's been provided to us by Evergy. It's a public document. It's dated August 13th of this year. And one of the tables in that report, it's table three, shows the capital expenditures during the time period encompassed by the uh, this STP project from 20 through 24. Okay. And within that table, it's, as I say, it's table three. It's on page 28, if that's helpful to you or your staff. Um, there, it breaks out the total projected STP expenditures of 8.9 billion allocated to both states. And it has several line items here. The first line item is generating facilities for new renewables. And it shows what the projection is there. It, the next line is generating facilities other, which would be something other than renewables, I presume, maybe maintenance. It shows transmission and distribution facilities, tra transmission and uh, FERC, transmission and distribution facilities other, and general facilities other. The only problem I have with this table is it doesn't break out what is the Kansas portion. If you could provide us with with, with, with some breakout, uh, when you get an opportunity to in the near future, that would be fine. I would be grateful. So we could ascertain what the Kansas portion of each of those line items in your CapEx forecast are. Yeah, so, so I was able to, we, we, will, uh, we will make sure we get a table to, to, um, to um, you know, codify this, but I was able to track this down while we were, while you were um, uh, appropriately giving Mr. Aiken uh, a good, good at cross-examination. Um, but, you know, if I go back to slide 14 of this deck, so I think you uh, you asked that, that um, a question of what broke out. What was the what was the other what comprised the 2.1 billion of capital that was not included on slide 14? So I'll, I'll give you the the big bucket. So for existing generation, that number is about 1 billion. So that's for Wolf Creek for existing um, coal plants and, and natural gas plants in, in Kansas. Uh, it's a little over 300 million dollars for the new generation. And then the balance of about $700 million or so for uh, customer uh, systems, IT projects, ongoing IT upgrades and IT systems. But we'll make sure we get a, get a graph to uh, codify that so that we can uh, provide that detail to you. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, this does conclude all of my questions. I'm, I'm enormously grateful to, uh, to all of you for, uh, the, as I say, the professionalism and the and all and in the information as well and your indulgence of my questions. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Anytime. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner. <clears throat> Sorry. Right. I'm sorry, uh, Chair Duffy. I'm okay. all nervous over here. <laughs> um, Commissioner French, do you have a lot of questions or I don't. a few? Um, why don't we go ahead and see before our break if we can run through your questions, okay? And again, we are looking to take a 30 minute lunch break. So um, Commissioner French, go ahead. Thanks, I'll be very brief. Uh, Commissioner Keene's excellent questioning covered, you know, almost everything <laughs> I, I would wanna cover. Um, and, and really, I, I'm very interested to hear uh, the interaction between the parties and Evergy primarily, that, that would be my primary focus. So. I just have a few broad brushstrokes type questions and I have to apologize. I'm not as organized as my colleague, Commissioner Keene. I, I, I don't know specifically who I'm directing each of these questions to. So I'm gonna throw them out into the ether. And, and if someone can, can address them, I suspect they may primarily be Mr. Bryant, um, but, but anybody that feels qualified, please just jump in. Um, yeah, I, first I'll just make a comment. Uh, you know, as I've begun to look at this, um, I, I will say that the, the grid modernization piece is the piece that makes me the most nervous. Uh, <laughs> it's the biggest ticket item. Um, and, you know, there's always this concern. I know that you have assets out there that are 60, 70, 80 years old on the grid. Um, and, you know, there's this, this concern of, okay, if we're, we're replacing, we're building something new, are we building something that's gonna be useful you know, 30 years from now, let alone 60, 70, 80 years from now. And so 
Um, you know, I, I don't know how, that's not really a question, but I will say I, I did appreciate the mention of the concept of grid edge technologies, um, you know, because I, I do think it's important that if we're building something, um, we're not just building the same thing we already had you know, 50 years ago. Um, we need to be investing in uh, the next thing. So uh, ju just a quick comment on that, that I, I do appreciate your consideration of that concept. Uh, I guess this is this is a, a broad question, but would it be right, based on Commissioner Keene's questioning, that this is really the STP and this five-year program is really more an acceleration of plans and not so much a new direction with different types of investments than you would have already made? Is that would that be a correct way of looking at it? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a I'll take a swing at this. Am I coming through okay? Okay. Um, yeah, so, so absolutely. I mean, if you think about, you know, the investments we're making, it, it is transmission and distribution infrastructure and in our generation um, assets primar primarily. Also, all the support, uh, supporting investments that it takes in IT and communication systems to, to make that go. Um, so there, there's no there's no there's no new um no newness from that regard this is just an evolution of our of our company you know if you think about wh where we've been i mean even historically you know you go back 10 15 years ago significant investment on the generation side we're also making investments in transmission and distribution we've just progressed forward so you know I, um commissioner keen mentioned load growth and so as we think about you know the need for a new generation it's a lot different than it was 10 15 years ago when we were seeing two plus percent load growth um but you know as bruce bruce mr aiken i got to call him mr aiken uh, as he mentioned you know we still have a uh, an obligation to serve new customer load even if some of those customers are moving around the same the same you know general location so um you know, we, I, I get it. We've, we put a, a nice acronym STP on the plan. Um, it been, you know, we've, um, there's certainly been a, a path to, to, to get here, but if you look at it, it, it is traditional utility infrastructure investment where we're trying to find the best, most viable opportunities um, to, to um, drive long-term benefits for our customers. And, and this, is a, it, this is what that evolution looks like in the context of our next five-year plan, which again, we've put an, put an acronym on it because that seems to be what we, what we do. But, but yeah, I think your characterization is, is spot on. Okay. Uh so that kind of leads to, it, it begs a question for me then of if we're accelerating and we're, we're pushing all this investment up uh, toward these, these, these five years, I guess that asks the question, well, what does the next five years look like after that? And what does the five years after that look like? What, what percentage of the grid are we modifying and replacing for our 3.5 billion in this five years? And then what does the, the investment look like in the, net, the following five years, the five years after that? Does it, does it taper off into a um, <laughs> perhaps a, a more moderated uh, amount of investment or does this accelerated uh, investment level continue on uh, into those further five-year periods? Bruce, I'm gonna let you, let you take that one. Since yeah. he gave me the option. Yes, thank you. Um, I can't tell you off the top of my head what the percentage is, but this is, is, I guess, more than touching the surface, but there's still a lot of assets out there that are aging. Now, as Ryan pointed out earlier, there was a lot of growth in the 70s and 80s. While that was still 40 years ago, uh, we've got a lot of assets that have lived well beyond their useful life. And you know, we will continue to maintain them and try to get the most life out of them. But I would say we are uh, you know, in a cycle of where we need to start making those grid investments and start replacing them. I wouldn't necessarily characterize it as accelerating because I think we've deferred it as long as we can. And now we've, we're just to a point where we can't really defer it anymore without putting our customers at risk. Okay. I guess that's, Clearly, that's the concern here is um, I, I, I think you, you kind of led into it that maybe we've had deferred um, and, and that's sort of what's led us to sort of the, some of the rate angst that we have right now is that we, we had a long period without 
maybe as much investment um, and you had very stable prices. And then, you know, we've had probably a 10, 15 year construction cycle leading up till now. Um, and we're talking about more construction. Um, and so I guess I have a concern about the, the lumpiness of investment uh, in the past and, and just want to know, is it, does it look as lumpy <laughs> in the future um, where this drops off or are we, or are we going to talk about a more moderated, I guess, sustainable uh, plan as we move forward through this five period, five year period and, and in the future. And, and I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Bryant did give the, the comment about looking more perpetually at trying to grow uh, cost at the pace of inflation. So that, that perhaps may be the answer, um, but I, I guess any response you'd have to sort of set my mind at ease that, that things will be less lumpy than in the past. <laughs> yeah, let, let me try to, let me try to take a crack at that. So, so, you know, we, we, it, it's, you know, we've spent, we've, we've been really focused on the five years of the, of the STP capital plan. Uh, but to your point, I mean, uh, it makes sense, you know, we plan over the long term. So having, you know, a longer term visibility to CapEx is something that um, uh, is important to us also. So, you know, I, I think we sketched out, you um, you know, for uh, something that we used for investor purposes, you know, line of sight to uh, the potential for six to nine billion of capital uh, investment in the next five years. So post STP. Now, you know, that, that compares to the 8.9 billion that um, Commissioner Keene mentioned earlier. So the total average CapEx, I don't, we haven't um, broken that down by, by jurisdiction, but, but on a comparative basis, you know, there's been 9 billion over the next five years, we could see six to 9 billion uh, the next five years thereafter. Um, I think the lumpiness comes through, um, Commissioner, most notably from any kind of generation investment. I mean, as we think about the, the grid investment, it should be smoother and, and more ratable. Um, if we have big plant retirements and the need to make big generation investments in solar or wind or, or other renewables and storage, that's where the, I envision the lumpiness will most likely come from. So um, I don't know if that, if that helps, but that's certainly a way to, to frame, you know, the next five years could be, you know, kind of what we've seen the, the last five year runway rate be anywhere in that six to $9 billion uh, total range with the lumpiness, lumpiness likely coming from generation investments. Thanks. I, I don't know if there's any helping me on, <laughs> on those issues, but, but you've, you've done your best. <laughs> um, well, one more kind of, I guess, rate, uh, related question, and that is just, I, I want to make sure I'm thinking of this right as, as we talk about rate competitiveness. It, my, and I just want to see if my reading of the, the slides is correct. It, it appears that the idea of becoming more rate competitive, um, it's less of a, of a decrease in rates, or it's, it's not a decrease in rates. It's the idea that um, the Evergy is going to try to grow at more the pace of inflation. And there is a, a suspicion that others around us are going to grow. Their rates are going to escalate at a, at a quicker pace, which would in turn make Evergy more competitive. Uh, so I guess my question is, is that the correct way to think of that? Uh, and, and two, is, is that based on any uh, you know, specific knowledge or belief that you have about those other utilities that surround us? I'm going to let my regulatory friends, if you gave me the option, I, I could butcher through this. I'll let either Darren or Greg make a run at this. Yeah, this is Darren. I'll take a, I'll take a cut at it. Good morning or good afternoon. Good morning. Um, you know, so I think, uh, I, I think you're right. I mean, the STP is, is built upon, uh, you know, staying at a, at a, at a moderate rate impact at, at the level of inflation or, or under uh, w while taking the opportunity to, to move through this transition on both the, the wires and on, on the supply side of the business uh, to, to kind of meet the evolving needs of, of our communities and customers. Um, you heard a little bit about it today. I mean, this is not new. You saw one of the slides where there are utilities uh, listed all over the page that are in some stage of grid modernization activities. And, you know, if you go to NARUC or you go to industry uh, discussions, we all talk about the, the aging infrastructure that's in place and, and how much of it was put in when, when air conditioning load ramped up or before. And, and it, 
we've got to start to evolve it and evolve it in a way that that allows for this two-way dialogue, this grid edge technology, and some of the things that are that are longer term changes to the business. So, so we see it out there kind of empirically um, through all the discussions we have with utilities that are in grid mods. You see, you know, a number of utilities, particularly in the Midwest right now, talking about decarbonization and and you know lowering their carbon footprint and their fossil. Uh, supply. So, so certainly in the Midwest, uh, we, we know we're not alone in this venture and, and, you know, what's going to be important for us to figure out and for all of us to figure out is how we, how we get the pace right on the transition on both the grid mod and the, the decarbonization. So we can, we can get where we need to be, but do it in a way that, that allows us to be rate competitive and, and not have those, those unintended effects on, on customer rates. And, you know, the STP will, lays out significant, it, it, the team talked about today, significant opportunities with O&M and fuel and per, purchase power reductions that, that come from some of this investment that, that's getting made and, and our ability to kind of change operations to, to fit the new model. And everybody will have some of that, um, but, but we think we'll, we'll be well positioned with with the current plan and, and looking into the next five years to, to make progress on competitiveness. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I was glad to hear you say the word pace there because to me, that's, that's the question here. It's, um, you know, it's not to say I don't have any questions about the investments you're talking about making, but uh, to me, the, the ch really challenging issue is the pace. And so uh, I appreciate that answer. Uh, okay, one, I promise one, one more topic. Um, and then I'm, I want to turn it over to, to others. Um, I, I want to talk just briefly about the ADMX system um, and, I, and I guess just some of the other similar enabling technologies that you're making. Um, this, is, this is new to me as I'm sure it is to, to lots of folks. Um, but as I understand it, um, we are talking about uh, putting in systems that will enable um, more uh, full use of demand side management um, and uh, energy storage and distributed generation, uh, making the grid more flexible. And I guess uh, my question for that is, you know, obviously that's great for those customers that have these things. It, it enables them to use the grid more fully, but do, how or does it provide value to the rest of the customers would it result in generation savings? Will we be able to uh, procure less capacity because we're able to draw on these grid resources? If somebody could speak to that, um, the value of drawing on those resources, I think that would be really helpful. Commissioner, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask my uh, esteemed colleague, Kayla Missamore to, um, to maybe answer that, that question. Let's see, hello. Um, so, I'm Kayla Messmore, Director of Long-Term Planning, KB, briefly. Mr. Bryant Hello. briefly introduced me at the beginning. Uh, that, that sounds very odd, I will admit, Mr. Bryant. Um, so I'll say in a few different parts on the ADMX piece, you mentioned the customer side that'll be managed by the ADMX. There's also a very significant kind of suite of grid assets that are managed that benefit any customer. So there's reclosers and there's fault indicators that are out on the system that it's working with and using to do the analytics and the control that it needs to do, which really benefits all customers, regardless of whether they happen to have solar and storage um, behind their meter. The, the next part is, is volt VAR optimization or voltage management is kind of what you were referencing with um, kind of deferring capacity additions or whatever that might look, let, look at. That is something we have looked at in IRP processes in the past and we'll continue to look at it. Um, that actually is, to give you a little bit of background. So I have the distribution automation group within my broader umbrella, but I also have the IRP team. So a large part of that is to start creating that crossover of thinking about the technical side of the grid and how do we do voltage management, but what does that translate into from a capacity perspective? So I don't know that I have a great answer for you right now, but I agree that there's definitely opportunity there and we're working to, to evaluate it and quantify it as we go through this next IRP process. Thank you, that, that's helpful. 
I think I'm going to turn it over <laughs> to others at this point. I, I'd like to hear uh, what, what the chair and the rest of the parties have to say. So thank, thank you all for your answers. It's been very helpful. Thank you, Commissioner French. <clears throat> it is about 1235, but I would like to ask one question right now before we break for lunch because um, both uh, commissioners French and Keene have kind of talked about this, but okay, so let's wind back a bit. So what would have happened if Elliot had not walked through your doors and made these, is, kind of pirated demands of the company, what if they had not walked through your door and started um, playing the heavy hand that they did? How, would we be talking about an STP right now? So that's one question. What if they had not come about? And we do understand that the basis for a lot of this is CapEx expenditures which means value added for those who benefit as a shareholder. So if they had not walked through your door, where would we be right now? Probably looking at your IRP and whatever. And how was it that you were so quickly able to pull this together? And it's just a relatively short amount of time with such great big dollars attached to it. So, um, Mr. Bryant, if you could start with, with uh, a response to that. Sure, Ch Chairwoman, you won't let me hand this to one of my other colleagues? No, I won't. I'm just, ki I'm just kidding. I know, I know <laughs> you'd want this one for yourself. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I hear you. Um, what I, well, let me, let me, you know, the, the, what ifs are tough. What I will tell you is that um, this group has been critically focused on all the elements that are contemplated by the STP. I mean, e even since before Evergy was formed, if you go back to, you know, I, I think we got together for the first time uh, uh, with our operations team, for example, in April of 2018. Uh, and we closed the transaction in June of 2018. We did uh, a pretty expansive planning process. And what came out of that was, you know, we looked at the landscape and saw the fact that, um, you know, our customers were um, expecting more value for, you know, what they're getting in their, in their rates. There's more sensitivity to outage dynamics. Our load growth is flat, as Mr. Aiken mentioned earlier, in that flat to half a percent load growth perspective. Um, but we're also going to continue to have the need to invest in infrastructure. I mean, we, our infrastructure is, you know, aging just like, like all of us, and it's always in need of replacement. We, we looked out and said, our generation fleet is going to continue to need to evolve. You know, as we reach the end of life, life for our existing generation units, um, technology was going to have to be part of the solution as we looked at re replacing uh, those aging assets. So, um, you know, if we go back before, we were plan always planning to file our integrated resource plan uh, here in 2021, uh, which will now be in July uh, on the on the Kansas side. And so um, we knew that, you know, getting more efficient, you know, and, and on the heels of the merger, and, and I think a lot of the folks on, in, in this call are familiar with our merger efficiencies. We knew that wasn't going to be a, a one-stop shop. We were going to continue to have to find ways to get efficient in our business process, realizing, you know, process improvements, realizing efficiency, and bottom line, lowering our operating costs. It's just a cost of doing business when you have a you know, a very, fairly modest uh, load growth, as, as was mentioned earlier. But we also knew we we're going to have to continue to invest in, in infrastructure. So, um, you know, it, 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 I wouldn't say, um, I think we've been working on this, you know, for a while. Obviously, you know, we, we live in the world we live in, and we certainly have had, um, have to make sure in this environment, we have investors who expect a fair and competitive return. Uh, for their investment. We're competing for capital for the dollars that, that we invest. You, so, but let me let me interrupt right there. But you are, um, I would say, you have a sterling reputation. Before the merger, Westar had like, like they were like 
the God. I mean, a sterling reputation throughout um, so many sectors, um, whether, I mean, you just did. And with investors by your, by your AAA rating. I mean, you, you guys were there. So, so you're, you believe that you were going to struggle to get uh, investors and backing for what was coming up? I mean, post-merger, there was even more synergy. So I, I guess I'm, I'm really struggling as to, as to how, um, you know, this kind of evolved. Um, and I would still say it's albeit because um, um, there is one investor that's pretty greedy and believes you can do better for me. And um, so um, you had a plan. I think you talked about the plan during the merger. You've talked about the plan with your potential IRP. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I totally hear your point. I mean, but you know, if I go back to the, the merger, that, that plan was a five-year plan. We closed the merger in 18, um, I, guess, I guess I think that was 2018. We knew we were gonna continue to have to progress. And you know, think about where we're at from a company now versus where we were two years ago. I mean, we were on separate platforms. We hadn't had the time to uh, do integrated planning across the entire business. Kayla just mentioned she's uh, she's uh, has responsibility for all of our planning activities and so has been working on the generation, the transmission distribution side since, you know, since the merger to progress our, our capability. There's no doubt you know, so this year, uh, we were able to accelerate some of our planning efforts uh, through the work we did uh, through the through the spring and the summer. We brought in some external expertise uh, from BCG to help us, you know, look you know, and get an objective perspective from the outside beyond our own experience. So they were able to bring um, visibility that other utilities have, other um, other cost efficiencies uh, that util other utilities have employed. So, you know, we've, we've gotten smarter. It, we've lived, you know, I can't, I'm not gonna deny we've lived through this year. Um, what would it look like if the year would have gone differently? I still believe we would have been very much focused on driving cost efficiencies and continuing to make the critical investments we needed. The IRP was, we were working on that. Um, and on the grid side, I mean, I think Bruce and Ryan have done a really good job of describing kind of where our system sits and why it's in need of uh, incremental investment. Now, what those ultimate numbers might have looked like, and I, I can't. I, can't, I don't have an answer to that. That's probably unknowable at, at this point. But I certainly know that um, the same drivers that we were living with, that we're living with today, we were living with a year ago and, and trying to find the right balance um, of investment to benefit our, our customers and make sure we deliver competitive returns for our shareholders. Okay. Uh, along that line, both you and Mr. Ives and um, um, I believe Mr. Aiken have talked with such casualness about staying within the cost of inflation as we look at the cost of this STP of around 2%. You're right, inflation is, is still staying very low, but I would remind you that there are folks who are still making $10 an hour below the cost of inflation. They've never received a pay increase they're not at a working wage. They continue to have, and here in the state of Kansas too, wages for certain groups have not kept up like, like white collar workers perhaps. So that said, it is with such casualness that you talk about just a rate of inflation increase that appears to be insignificant. But my concern is the way that we do business here with this PUC, meaning us, how fixed costs uh, and demand charges are um, dealt out through the bill, doesn't that beg the question? Um, it's just gonna be one rate increase on top of another, on top of another, unless we change the dynamics. Well, yeah, I'll, again, I'll let my regulatory friends jump in. I, I, if we um, came off as casual on, on our focus on uh, rate increases, that was not our intent. 
obviously we spent a lot of time uh, with our management team, with our board, uh, a, a big focus area. So I, I, if, if we came off casual, please, please don't, don't take that from this discussion. Um, Darren, I'll let, I'll let you, you jump in on, uh, on this a little bit as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It not intended to be casual at all. I mean, you know, maybe it came off that way because we, we've been working on this, this process for a number of months now, but, but certainly you know, rate competitiveness and impact on customers was one of the key things we looked at as we went through this. And you know, what we didn't talk about earlier when I was talking to Commissioner French is, you know, we talked about pace a little bit. Um, we looked at this at a lot of angles as we've gone through this work, both before uh, this STP work and, and during, um, we looked at a pace that was much more aggressive um, on grid modernization and, and moving more rapidly to, to transition the wires to uh, the, the grid of the future. Um, it didn't work uh, from our perspective when you look at it from an execution standpoint or a customer impact standpoint. We looked at a, a much, much quicker pace of decarbonization uh, to, to transition the, the fleet to more renewables and more sustainable resources. Um, and, and that also didn't pencil out from an execution and from a customer impact standpoint. And, and we came to a, to a plan that, that we felt like was a good representation of how to transition both aspects of the business in a time frame where we could attempt to have a minimal impact on, on customers. Now, now, all that said, we have billions of dollars of investment in, in the state of Kansas to maintain reliable service to customers. And, and with that level of investment at the ages that, that were described and went through today, it, it does take money to, to make a transition to the next level of, of asset that can serve for, as Commissioner French said, hopefully the next 30 years or, or a time frame in there. Um, so we're not cert certainly not at all intending to be cavalier in, in our approach to this, take it very seriously, the, the issues that, that our customers have both from a, from a bill and from a, from a wage perspective, but we also continue to have the primary obligation to, to serve those customers every time they flip the switch in a reliable way and in a way that hopefully is supportive of economic development to the state too. And, and we take that very seriously too. Thank you. And I do agree with you. I mean, um, you have, you, reliability is a cornerstone for you. And when people come home at the end of the day, they do want to just flip on a switch and the light comes on. It's kind of like going to the grocery store and the eggs are there and the meat's there. And, and a lot of people never think beyond that refrigerator case at all about where did it come from? How did it finally arrive here in my basket on my dinner table? And same with playing the video games or whatever. I understand that. Real quick, as you talk about this technology, Mr. Ives or whoever, um, I remember when I just got rid of a washing machine, no, a dryer. It's a dryer that I bought. It was a gift, housewarming gift from my in-laws 32 years ago. Now, you might tell me, oh, horror, you should have gotten rid of that long time ago. But it kept working. It kept working. And actually, when I replaced it, it was still working. And it was outside for two minutes before it was picked up by somebody else. All right, out in the alley. So this new technology that we're putting into place, now it seems like everything lasts two, two years. And, th and then we have to replace it. So um, is that the way this technology is gonna be or, or this new grid modernization that where you've gotten 50 years, 40 years out of the life of whatever you had, whatever system, whether it was the station or whatever, um, is this new stuff gonna be any better? Is it gonna last as long? Is it going to have the livelihood of what we had before? Or maybe 
is that even stupid to think that way anymore? Because there's always something new around the corner. Yeah, so so I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at this real quick and then I'll pass it along to the ops folks. And, and, and I think the answer is it, it's, it, it's a little bit of both probably at the end of the day. They talked a lot about today in the presentation you know, replacing of core infrastructure, you know, new steel poles and new wires and, and things that, that, that need to replace some of the aging infrastructure out there. Uh, you know, the expectation I think will be those poles, those wires will have, you know, quite a bit of longevity to them. But, but to the second part of your question, as you, as you add more automation to the system, automation that, that, that is, you know, required to, to provide the level of service and the two-way dialogue in our grid that's necessary, some of those automated components will, will not carry the same life characteristics as a steel pole or a, an overhead wire. And, and we have to do a good job when we come in and we put those amounts into rates to, to thinking about the right time frame to depreciate those types of assets over so that we're, we're getting the, those dollars and, and those, those assets depreciated out on a time frame that, that legitimately matches the expected life of that automated system. So, so we don't put them on the same 40 year life characteristic as, as maybe a steel pole. Okay, so like right now, um, I know that my IT person told me I'm using only 20%. I'm comfortable with that little 20%. So um, when you're putting technology out there for people or for systems, um, how are you ensuring that you're not just putting technology in for technologies, technology's sake, that it really will make a difference? For example, there's AMI meters now, what, in everybody's house, right? With Evergy, yes. yeah. Are you guys using the data from all that AMI and therefore what is it telling you? What is it telling the customer? I mean, um, that rollout occurred over a long period of time, now you're done. So what are you getting from all that technology and that cost to upgrade those, um, the devices inside the home? So I'm going to, I'm going to open that one up maybe to uh, Mr. Mulvaney and, and see if he's, he's got some, some help so, with that. And, and just to be sure, this is just an example of technology was deployed. So is it really, is it really being used or was it just technology for technology's sake? Because that's what I'm, I, I'm, I'm afraid happens a lot that, oh, but your computer comes with all of it. Okay. Well, did like my smartphone. I'm not like the kids. I don't, I don't need the whole alphabet. I'm just using six letters. <laughs> so um, yeah, how do you balance that? Yeah, fair question. I'm gonna let Mr. Mulvaney try and address that. <laughs> the, the, I, I won't touch the smartphone example uh, or how much you use your smartphone. I'll, I'll stay away from that. Um, from an AMI meter standpoint, uh, the, I can speak to the, the first generation rollout uh, that we had uh, for AMI meters uh, in the Kansas uh, metro properties. I was actually uh, in a different role over uh, operations. And um, you're right, AMI business cases come with a lot of, uh, of high flying promises and we are endeavoring on a lot of those avenues, but they also come with quick wins. And, and I reached back to that experience because uh, we were able to quickly integrate that particular system into our outage system so we're no longer reliant on customers calling us and telling us their lights are out. We now know within seconds of their lights going out without any interaction on the customer standpoint. And it becomes even more valuable for us because it's great to know that your house is out, but I really need to know what exact part of the system is impacted. So we have thousands of meters reporting to us all the time about their outages. That's a simple example that we were able to deploy very, very quickly and now have uh, ubiquitously throughout our system. Um, another simple example that kind of advances that technology is uh, newer vintages of the meters come with heat sensors. Um, we have um, uh, installations at customers' houses that are quite old. 
and we have a point of ownership change at, at the customer's premise where we're plugging in our meter and then the customer infrastructure takes power in. That can be a failure point at times. And the new meters tell us when they have a certain heat sensor, they trigger a certain alarm for us that we can respond to again within hours to go get to that particular location or faster, just depends on where the actual location is, to go out and address that before you end up with a house fire and you have a catastrophic loss for a customer or, or uh, um, you know, lo- even worse, loss of life. So there are, any technology comes with the long-term gains, um, which we hear about with data uh, and, and a lot of the analytics that we can run on the meters, and we are certainly endeavoring down multiple paths from an analytics standpoint, but they also come with quick wins that we have to be able to take advantage of as we deploy these technologies. And then I think what the technologies we're talking about from a grid mod perspective aren't things that have just been available in the last year. I mean, we're talking about technologies that have been around for a number of years and a number of utilities have installed and they flaw proof them to where now we're comfortable installing them or comfortable installing them in closed loop situations, meaning where they're auto doing a lot of features out in the field because they've been proof tested. Um, so it, w- when we say grid edge, we mean this is the best in class in that particular breed, but we don't necessarily mean that its serial number is 0001 either. Um, we're trying to install proven technologies that we believe for sure add value to our customers. And when we submit that as part of our overall rate base, we're standing behind the value they bring into our customers. Okay. And, and congratulations on, on the dryer. It probably uses a lot less power than the old one. I'm sure it does. Um, yes, um, I'm, I'm absolutely positive it does. So um, just one other thing. In all this discussion and in your, in your um, presentation, I'm sorry, but I never um, heard um, the word outputs. How are you going to measure that we've reached grid resiliency? What is the output? How are you going to measure that we've reached grid modernization? I I didn't I don't see any output measurements here. There was no discussion of output measurements. There's a lot of discussion of how we're going to do it and at what pace we're going to do it. But how do you know when we've reached, I mean, what's the output? What, how, what, what are the outputs um, for all of these? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not clear on that. And I do believe we do a lot of things that we talk maybe about the outcome. But here, I do believe we need to exactly understand the outputs, and I'm not I'm not seeing that in the presentation. Uh, from an output standpoint, uh, I, I guess th- there the could be a, outputs. Right. right, there could be a certain conversation. You said, when do we reach grid resiliency? When do we have certain milestones that show we're there? Um, from a saturation standpoint, a lot of these technologies can be rolled out almost ubiquitously across the system. Um, I don't, Evergy doesn't believe that's the right approach because some parts of the system are in more need of these technologies than others. Some parts of our system are quite new and and don't experience the reliability issues that other parts of our system do that need this technology. Um, So we look at it on more of a needs based from a saturation standpoint than we do just to say that we have an opportunity to roll out 350,000 smart reclosers. So we're going to roll out 350,000 smart reclosers. We'd much prefer using a word that Commissioner French used to be much more paced and thoughtful in our approach as to when we roll that technology out and why are we rolling that technology out in that particular um, setting. Uh, From a measurement standpoint, then, I guess to get to the core of your question, uh, we would look to our reliability indices to see, are we experiencing uh, degraded reliability over time? Are we maintaining reliability? Are we seeing improvements in certain pockets of reliability? Uh, I, I know that um, from our um, board of directors standpoint, um, we have been pushed from an STP standpoint to provide KPIs that, of which we're measuring our STP progress um, with, and we are providing those now. 
um, to our board of directors to show, and reliability is a key one from the grid mod standpoint, to show where is what is reliability doing, where is it going, and we have the ability to drill down by region to show that. And from a, a internal goal setting standpoint, where we are making these investments year over year, we are trying to um, forecast where we think that improvement's going to take place and bake that into our overall numbers from a target setting standpoint. Well, I do think the devil's in the details, so I'm assuming that um, our staff will receive a lot more information on this, on, on this plan. That would include the specifics. Correct? I, I would defer that to Darren just to make sure I don't get myself in trouble there, but um, I, I feel like uh, we, we typically are pretty good about sharing with the commission any um, work product that we have that uh, affects our customers. So I would be surprised if our answer was no. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have we have quite a quite a few reporting metrics and reliability statistics and things that 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 we we report on and and, and give to the staff. You know, all the time. Uh, we'll, we'll continue to have that and continue to have dialogue around the, the specifics and the benefits of of the STP. Not only as we're in this planning and development phase, but but certainly as we move into more of an execution phase and into the time frame where we, we will really start to experience some of the benefits from the investments that that are proposed and talked about today. Okay, because as you um, showed in your graph, as you talked about um, the issue here in Topeka and, and you showed the graph that showed that disruptions had minimized. So how do we know that, okay, is that where we should be um, is where we are today, really where we should be. Did you accomplish what you set out to do? Was that an, an, an expected result? So I think those things are extremely important. And I know um, it's now the one o'clock hour, but I'm trying to finish up so we can start with the others when we come back. So um, about 15 years ago, when I was here last, or maybe a little bit longer than that, um, I can remember the uh, work sessions we had on wind. And there just there was the Gray County Wind Farm. There, that was it. That was just about it. And then all of a sudden, um, there were a lot of work sessions on wind. We developed a wind map for everyone to look at. And yes, that is a resource that we had. And Holy Toledo, here we are a decade later and um, about 40% of the generation um, of, of um, Evergy is from this resource. Hallelujah. Great, it's, it's there. So in your discussion, you mentioned solar several times. I'm not aware of, except for like a little snippet here and a snippet there, so is, and apparently we have more sun, sunshine than, than Florida. And I know the energy office developed the solar map and the Western part of the state is just, it, it's, it's sunny out there all the time. Uh, they wish they could have a little bit more rain and cloudy days um, as everybody is in a drought situation um, across the state. So, with all, can you tell me a little bit more about your solar? Because um, I, I just am looking for it and I just really, I kind of went on your website and a few examples, but tell me more about that. And I don't know who I should direct this to. So, so I, um, Chair, I, I will try to, t I'll start that and then I'll let my colleague Kayla, who's much more knowledgeable, uh, fill in any blanks. But I, I, I think, you know, I think your analogy to, um, the discussion around wind a decade or so ago is pro probably where we're at with solar. You know, one of the, one of, you know, solar, the technology is not new. I mean, uh, oh. what, what's been uh, most prolific recently is the, the, the cost of the technology has continued to come down as, 
you know, um, manufacturing capacity gets more efficient as the component parts become more commoditized, you know, all the those scale efficiencies you see with new technologies. So I think we're at the point um, with, with uh, and, and it kind of goes to Commissioner Keene's conversation earlier on sustainability, um, you know, to the extent that solar is cost effective and we believe it's, uh, it's at the point where it's competitive with uh, other generation resources today, obviously with some subsidy uh, with tax tax credits, but we expect to see a proliferation of both um, solar and wind as we move forward. So we could be talking ten years from now about a solar investment um, trajectory, much like we saw with renewables a, a decade or so ago. So we don't have much solar in our current. Um, capacity profile today. I think I went through that earlier. I think we've got slim to none uh, from a solar perspective, but over the next decade or so, we expect solar uh, renewable and energy storage, which also is declining in, in cost, to be much more viable uh, as we think about generation solutions that, that make sense for our customers. And since you brought up storage, so the storage, um, that's always been everyone's complaint that, okay, um, it's it's sunny, um, you know, on the south side, right when we don't need it. So is storage. And, um, you know, I, I look at my neighbor and she's got her panels on the west side of her house, mm -hmm. not just on the south side, but on the west side. So she's producing solar at a time, I think, when you would need it perhaps most or um, an, so... Um, is storage um, going to be part of this discussion as well? No doubt, absolutely. Um, Kayla, you want you want to take that? Yeah, so definitely, Chair Duffy, storage is a consideration. I wouldn't put it in the same tranche of evaluation as solar because it's just not quite there yet economically. Um, some of the issues most fundamentally in the SPP are the market structures to reward storage for what it does until that gets a little bit better, until the technology gets a little bit more cost effective. And ultimately until we can get longer durations, four hours is great, but it's not, it's not overnight. So there's, there becomes an issue if we can't get to a longer duration of storage, it will be limited in its application. So it's kind of a mix of all of those things, the cost effectiveness of the four hour lithium ion or whatever your more traditional storage availability, it's the new long duration technology and it's the market structures to reward the storage for being more reliable and for being a strong capacity resource and an ancillary resource, which is another thing that I won't go too far into, but in the SPP, the ancillary market is a little bit soft. There's not a ton of opportunity for ancillary revenues in SPP, which can limit storage's ability. There, are, there is a project in Oklahoma that's seen some good results from the ancillary market, even being in SPP. So there's definitely an opportunity there, but it it's developing still, and it, it's not in the SPP win, STP window, but it's probably right right thereafter. We'll have to we'll have to shift our focus to storage as well. Yeah, and I think it gets to Commissioner uh, French's point too about pacing because when I started in the transit industry, I was there for six years. The size of the batteries on the electric buses ran all the way across the top, and they were huge. I mean, they were, they, it, it was, it was a big lift. And by the time I left, the battery size had dropped significantly in five years, five years. Um, and it was like remarkable how the weight of the bus had come down, how the size of the, because the size of the batteries had gotten so much smaller and the batteries were, you were able to run all day. Right. Um, again, depending on the uh, geography of the uh, route that you were on, but measuring all those things. So I'm, I'm assuming five years from now, we'll be looking at a different landscape. So Absolutely. is that what you're seeing too, Kayla, when it comes to storage? Absolutely. And so when we look at IRP modeling, I'll put my generation hat on temporarily <laughs> while we're, while we're talking about this is, um, we try to project cost, in, cost decreases for storage going forward, and we will in the IRP modeling that we're doing. Um, but what's difficult to forecast is fundamental technology changes. And so we try to proxy that with other, showing other capacity resources that could actually turn into storage if something 
longer duration, more cost-effective became available. So we look at all of that in our IRP planning for sure. And I think that especially now that different geographies have started to have all electric vehicle mandates, I mean, the transportation sector will drive likely this, this continued innovation of storage that we'll be able to capitalize on once they figure it out. So we can try and wait and be paced in how we adopt it and try to wait until that advancement has gone a little bit farther so that it's a better technology for customers and a better, a better use of resources a few years down the road. There are benefits of being a first mover. Right. We probably don't benefit from them as much as a car, car maker might. So, uh, so where we can learn from what they're doing, I think we should. I would, uh, I would agree with you. All right, last question, and this is back to Mr. Ryan. So tell me how or what you think about the role of the new leadership in Washington will play in this STP. Um, you know, we are celebrating um, what President Eisenhower, eight miles on I-70 were the, it was the first strip of the interstate system. He did it in Kansas, it's west of Topeka. Uh, KDOT has memorialized it with a, with a sign so everybody knows you're driving on the first eight miles of the interstate. Mm -hmm. That changed travel in this country significantly from back roads and, and um, different um, structures from state to state, from city to city. There was an overall plan and it really revolutionized this country and our ability to travel. We have not had, I don't believe, any leadership from Washington on issues like grid modernization and um, things of significance nationwide. So my question is, will this affect the STP? And two, if there are grants or programs out there are you going to be shovel ready to be able to um, take advantage of something that is available? So let me if I hit the second one first, because that's probably the easier one. So, so absolutely, man, our folks are monitoring, I work with Nate Rook, monitoring the federal policy, um, mon monitoring the incentives. So we'll be ready to take advantage of anything that helps us advance and accelerate our, our, our infrastructure plan under the STP. I will tell you, you know, to the first question, you are spot on. There hadn't been a natural energy policy, you know, what feels like in my, in my lifetime. And, and I will tell you, I ain't expecting it anytime soon. I, I look and, you know, I expect ongoing gridlock out of, out of DC. Now I'm happy to be pleasantly surprised. Um, but, you know, as we think about the STP, I mean, our, our, um, you know, our focus on cost efficiencies will remain the same. You know, how could federal policy impact, um, you know, some of the, you know, renewable or uh, incentives to kind of progress us down this decarbonization path? You know, I think we'll have to wait and see. I mean, to your point, we'll be ready. But we also, as, as Kayla mentioned, the, some of the technologies are already cost effective today. So we don't have to wait for an energy policy to make the right decisions for, for our customers. Now, we're not going you know, to, to Kayla's point, you know, be on the bleeding edge. No. We want to make sure we deploy, maybe paste um, as we deploy new technologies. And if there are new incentives uh, for renewable storage that come about, obviously, we will be prepared to adopt those. As, as it makes sense, but I, I'm not waiting for anything anything um, to come out of out of the, the federal space to kind of advance energy policy. So we're kind of forced all of us in, in the various states to, to find the pace that makes the most sense for us. I'll just use a, a reference point. I mean, a couple of years ago, and I'll say a couple because it feels like a couple, although it probably was a while. Um, the clean power plan. Um, was advanced and obviously we put in place plans to to meet the clean power plan and we met them even though the clean power plan went went away so we, we think the the technology allows us to to um, evolve at a pace that makes sense and if you know something comes out of dc that um, supports an acceleration we'll be positioned to, to make sure we can we can participate i do believe that grid modernization is something that um, the new administration understands is um, just like any infrastructure, we're on so many levels, whether it's bridges, roads, highways, so many things um, I believe are at a point where 
there has to be some intervention at the federal level or um, a, a, a real direction. And I'm hoping despite the gridlock in Congress, which I don't expect the Senate to pass anything if the numbers all stay the same, it will. But I do believe that there are some initiatives that will be able to come through. And um, I would hope, not hope, I believe you, you all should be ready as we should be in the state to be able um, to have that shovel ready program um, to um, be able to garner um, additional funds. Absolutely agree. All right. I've, um, this really does conclude my questions. I wanted to get done. I apologize to everybody because it is 1.15. Um, we will be taking a 30 minute lunch break. We will reconvene at 1.45. And um, let me ask IT, is it the best that everybody stays on or do you want them to go off? How, how do you want this to happen, um, Michelle? The video will still be streaming while we're going because we can't stop and start it in the middle of the meeting without it being a new video. So we are planning on muting everybody while we are on break. Muting and, um, okay, stopping the video feed to individuals, they should probably- Yes, everybody um, can turn off their cameras during this time. All right, I thank everybody uh, for your time this morning. Thank you, commissioners. When we come back, we will start in alphabetical order and I believe it will be Brian Fedoten that will um, be announcing the first one exactly at 145. Thank you.
we are two minutes out. Here, one minute out. Good afternoon. Um, I am checking with Michelle in IT. Are we back on and recording? We are recording, Chair. This is this is Brian. We are recording. Okay, very good. It's 145 and we're back in session. And um, let me just say to all the interveners, there's 14 of you, including um, staff. And so that really, um, if you divide it out, it comes to about 15 minutes for everybody um, at the most. And that's like us going past five o'clock. So with that in mind, that is your time limit. And um, at this point, uh, if you don't want to use your time, that's great. And if we have more time, we can go back through and see if anybody had additional follow-up questions. And remember, Commissioners Keen and French, if you have questions, um, feel free to interrupt. Okay, I, I'd say that in a judicious manner, but um, you, you still can um, ask additional questions. And again, cell phones off. And when it's your turn, be ready. If you are not there, we will move on to the next one and you'll be at the bottom of the pack. All right, so I'm turning it back over to Brian and thank you. Hi, Brian. Uh, hi, Ch Chair Duffy. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll begin hearing from the interveners momentarily. Um, when I introduce the questioner, I'll, um, if, if council could, um, when, when you introduce your witnesses and your people that are gonna comment, could you please identify them by name and their title just for the record? Likewise, um, when Evergy is responding, if Evergy could identify who, who the person responding is just to give us a clearer record. Uh, again, if we could reserve questions or comments or relate to confidential information uh, for the end of the work study, uh, that would be appreciated as well. Uh, with that, I think we're ready to begin and we're going in alphabetical order. So Curb would be up first. So Mr. Nickel. Thank you, Mr. Fedoten. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I wanted to thank the commission for this opportunity to be present and participate in this workshop. Secondly, I'd like to thank Evergy for their presentation and in particular, for submitting the information to us well in advance of this workshop. It does help us to prepare and your presentation was very good this morning. Um, we have Andrea Crane that will be speaking or asking questions and making comments on behalf of CURB. At the end of uh, Andrea's questions, I would ask CURB staff if they have any questions to one, identify themselves and two, go ahead and ask the questions that they, they may have we are mindful of the 15 minute uh, time frame, and we hope to be more brief than that uh, so as to preserve time for others. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn the matter over to Andrea. Thank you. Andrea? She, she Can may everybody hear me? Yes. We hear you now. I 
No. Andrew, you are on. Let's see if there's. Can you? No. We can, we can hear you, Ms. Crane. You can. Yes. Okay. Please proceed. All right. I'm just going to sort of move. Okay. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I think I, for some reason, the headphones don't see, they seem to be the problem. Um, I guess our first, so I'm going to just take them off. Um, I guess our first question is, could you, could you go back to the issue a little bit about what your plans would have been in the absence of an outside force, I guess, um, that being Elliot, kind of driving the STP, and just briefly um, lay out sort of what is, how you view this as being um, an addition to what you would have done under a business as usual scenario. Yes. Good afternoon, Ms. Crane. Can, can you hear me okay? I can. Okay. Uh, so I'll take, try to take a crack at that because, you know, I, I don't think there's a specific answer I can give you as to what would have happened absent uh, Elliot. You know, I, I will tell you, you know, uh, consistent with my response to uh, to the chair's question where we were, you know, the, the STP is a um, a number of initiatives, you know, cost efficiencies, grid modernization, uh, decarbonization. Um, so from that perspective, we were working on all those things. Obviously, cost efficiencies has been a topic of Evergy since since the merger was formed. Um, grid, grid modernization is a reality. All, all utilities are faced with aging infrastructure and more you know, challenges to our, our grid. Um, and then decarbonization. I mean, it's something that we're, we're seeing as a driver, both from the technology side, but also in the world. I mean, as we think about, you know, our, um, our, uh, our investors, we think about insurance, for example, our insurers are, are uh, increasingly focused on companies that have, you know, uh, ESG stories that show, you know, more sustainable uh, initiatives. So, um, you know, we, you know, the first thing I'd say is, you know, we did not, um, we did not pursue Elliot's specific plan. I mean, that, you know, the, if you think about what they proposed back in, I guess that was Jan the January timeframe, our plan is different from that. So what we did was, you know, certainly listen to that feedback from a notable investor as we always do, uh, meet with our investors, all of our investors on a periodic basis, and then use that to inform our, our planning. We got some outside expertise and uh, that, came together and culminated in what we what were calling the SDP today. So, you know, I, I think we were going to be focused on cost efficiencies. Our customers are demanding us to be, be more efficient. Um, but also, I mean, as the team went through earlier, we still need to make needed infrastructure investments across our grid. So we're going to still make investments. And we were going to file our integrated resource plans next year. And those plans were going to have, um, well, you know, as Kayla went through, um, the expectation for continued decarbonization, uh, just given the cost of the technology and the age of our existing generation fleet. So um, how would it have been different if um, if Elliot wouldn't have been here? I'm, I'm not sure I can answer that question. Um, but I, I, I do think that, you know, the team at Evergy has spent a lot of time balancing um, the interests of our stakeholders and trying to come up with a plan that we think makes more sense. That certainly in contrast to at least where where Elliot started back uh, in the first part of the year. Okay, the, um, thank you. W with regard to the um, non-fuel, uh, that I want to just address briefly the, the non-fuel O&M and the fuel savings versus the CapEx. Um, to what extent are the savings that are um, being anticipated for on the L&M side, driven directly by the capital expenditures that you've included in your STP. I guess my question is how dependent are they on you making these capital expenditures? Good question, really good question. So I'll start that and then I'll, I'll give my colleague, uh, Mr. Bruce Aiken, a chance to, to uh, fill in any gaps that I may leave. I may leave. So, um, you know, if we, as we look at it, and we're, we'll have a, you know, a, the, the docket later this, or the workshop later this uh, month to dig into the cost efficiencies in a little more detail, but we've got cost efficiencies coming from a number of areas. Um, certainly the new infrastructure that we invest in is going to break down less, and so there'll be less maintenance costs. 
um, for, you know, when you put up new poles and wires, that equipment is more reliable. So uh, in the event of an outage, you, you, we, um, we expect less outages. So we'd have to roll less trucks. So that's a lowering of our operating costs. But, you know, there, our cost efficiencies are coming from across the board. So not only the cost savings that, the, that comes from having, you know, newer, more reliable equipment, uh, but also from just improving our processes and being more efficient in, in how we conduct business. So, um, Bruce, I don't know if you have a rule of thumb and and kind of how to think about the the specific O and M tied to the to the capex, but um, there's certainly a, a correlation. The only thing I, this is Bruce Aiken. The only thing I would add to that is just uh, some of the, the the software that we're implementing and data analytics and automation is driving out costs as part of our business in addition to just more uh, reliable systems out in the, out in the field. Okay. Um, with regard to sales, there was some talk about pro sales projections. Um, is there any um, anticipation that COVID and the current pandemic and the, the fact that so many people have changed their working patterns uh, will impact your sales long term. You know, once this is over, people won't go back to offices, for example, or something like that. Do you anticipate the need to reevaluate your sales projections once we sort of know where all of this is going? In no question, absolutely. I mean, it's it's been a big unknown as we've gone throughout the year. I mean, I think. Um, Trend-wise, what we've seen is certainly more folks are working from home. So we've seen increase in residential usage. Uh, I know I've been stuck in my uh, home office driving my wife crazy the last eight, eight months. Um, but by the same token, you know, if you look at the impacts on our economy, you know, with the um, small businesses, with the restaurants, with retail, with our industrial customers, folks have been impacted. And so uh, we certainly have, have seen that it obviously peaked through the summer and had started to come back as we headed in, has, have headed, headed into the fall. But, you know, who, who knows where that heads? I mean, with, with prognosticators um, seeing, you know, the increase in COVID and we're certainly feeling it in our you know, communities as well as within, within our company, um, it's hard to tell, you know, what that impact is gonna be in the, in the near term. We do expect at some point for there to be a recovery. I mean, let's get, you know, get a vaccine and have the economy start to have a more full scale of recovery, but we're watching it closely, um, but don't know what that looks like um, yet. But, you know, we've got a group of folks in our load forecasting team that spent a lot of time looking at both the near term and the macroeconomic factors uh, that drive load, uh, load growth and they're watching it closely, but we're certainly cautious. And you know, while we've seen a little bit of a rebound, it's too early to, to say that anybody can have an idea of what this means in the, in the near term. Okay, thank you. Um, you talked a lot about the fact that you anticipate rate increases will be somewhere around the rate of inflation or below, slightly below the rate of inflation, perhaps 2% on an annualized basis. Does that mean that at the end of the five-year rate moratorium, we can expect to see a rate increase of approximately 10% or five years versus, you know, five years of 2% annualized increases? I'm going to, uh, instead, and as opposed to inartfully answering that, I'm gonna let my regulatory colleagues answer that. Yeah, so this is Darren Ives. Uh, you know, a little too early to, to, to know the answer to that, Andrea. I mean, I think when we, when we look at the, the, the five-year horizon of the STP 20 to 24, you know, that, that's how it, it models out over that time frame. So the, the five years of the moratorium are, are a different Time frame and and have had some merger efficiencies and things that that preceded 2020, um, so it's a, a little bit difficult to tell, but because the periods are just mismatched a little bit, and and certainly we're you know a couple of years out from from really starting to pull together test year data and really really see where we're going to be on on the the request. Okay. Um, there was right before the break, we were talking a little bit about when federal incentives. When we loaded up when we were supposedly on lunch. <laughs> Excuse. Uh, right before the break, we were talking about um, the federal and the possible federal incentives um, that may help you pay for some of the grid modernization. To probably, if you receive any of those incentives, my expectation would be that those costs would be excluded from your rate base um, because they would not have 
be investor supplying capital necessarily. Um, and given the fact that your program seems to be largely driven towards an earnings target, is it likely that to the extent you would receive grants or other federal subsidies to help you fund your program, you would then expand your program, your investment into additional areas in order to maintain those earnings targets that are included in your STP? You want me let me take that, Darren. Yeah, so, so, so I'll start. This is Darren again. You, you know, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of factors that, that weigh into investment strategy and utility planning, right? And certainly it's balance sheet capacity. It's, it's availability to uh, obtain the labor and the materials resources and execute uh, the, the, the scope of programs that, that Bruce and, and Ryan talked about today. Um, so, you know, I, I think the parties here all know this. I mean, we are in a constant, you know, update process for long-term planning. You know, we do new five-year outlooks at least annually. We do IRPs uh, on, a, on a full blown basis every three years with extensive updates uh, annually in between those. So, so I guess the short answer is, are, are there gonna be changes to the, the plan, you know, four or five years from now from how we see it today, I, mean, I, I think it's really likely that it'll be more on just, uh, driven by more than just federal, um, federal funds. It'll, it'll be driven by a lot of those other factors as well. Okay, and I was gonna ask a last question, but I think you sort of addressed it here a little bit. Um, going back to this issue of what happens after the five years, um, because I, I'm, I presume that this plan, even though it's a five-year plan, it's not a standalone isolated five-year plan. I mean, I suspect that you're going to have to complete many of these projects in later years in order to fully realize the efficiencies that you're anticipating under the plan. Do you want to just comment on, on that a little bit? Yeah, I'll, t I'll, t I'll take that one. I mean, I think Darren, Darren said it well. I mean, this this plan is the best information we had when we, you know, when we um, came out with the STP at the beginning of August. The one thing we know is that plan is going to change. So as our as our teams refine our capital estimates on the capital side, on the cost savings side, as we continue to look for ongoing cost efficiencies, we know those numbers are going to differ. And so it, there is going to be a bit of just life to the plan as we grow and evolve. I mean, it sets good parameters, but obviously the specific detailed projects that get identified and the ultimate spend in those windows, uh, you know, based on labor availability and material, uh, you know, could, could differ from the exact numbers that we laid out in the plan. So um, it's a, it's the plan that we're, that we, that we have, but we know that uh, it will grow and evolve as we move forward. Okay. Did well, that with that, I think question? It, it did. It did. Okay. And um, I, I, it is a concern. You know, it is a concern, I think, of a lot of the parties. Um, how does this five year period fit into, you know, the fit into the uh, the bigger picture of having to replace infrastructure that is as old as as much of your infrastructure is. So I'm sure we'll continue to have that dialogue. I think my 15 minutes are up, so I will thank you um, and turn it back to, to Brian. I guess. Good to see you. Thank you, um, and thank you for observing the 15 minutes. Um, we're up to uh, alphabetically climate and energy projects. So Mr. Laughlin, if you want to introduce your people. Yes, hello, I'm Mr. Fidelity and uh, commissioners. Thank you for uh, holding this meeting today and workshop. And thank you to Evergy again for uh, providing that information beforehand. Um, to all the interveners. And also thank you for opening up to the public. I know just kind of briefly looking at the link on YouTube, we've had up Mr. to 50. Laughlin, Mr. Laughlin, could you uh, speak a little louder or get closer to your mic? Uh, yep. We're having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. Thank you. Sure, I'll, I'll just start over briefly. I just wanted to thank the commissioners and Evergy for uh, submitting um, or having this meeting and Evergy specifically for providing the documents beforehand. That was very helpful. Um, and also wanna thank um, the commission and Evergy for um, agreeing to have this uh, open to the public. Um, at this point, I'll hand it over to Climate and Energy Projects Executive Director, uh, Dorothy Barnett. 
Hi, commissioners. Thank you very much. Um, let me say first that the Climate and Energy Project supports a modern grid that can provide decarbonization benefits as a way to integrate energy efficiency programs, distributed energy resources, and large-scale utility renewable energy so that we can mitigate the risk of climate change that is already impacting Kansans' health and their livelihoods. Um, I'd like to make an observation and then I'll, I'll get to my questions if I may. Um, the energy system we have today um, is designed around big centralized power plants and one-way power flows. And we can all see that it is grinding against the rise of smarter and cleaner technologies that offer new ways to both generate and manage power at the local level, including residential solar pa panels, electric vehicles, and home batteries. Um, Kansans need and they want to be able to make their homes and their communities more resilient in the face of a changing climate. There are a whole host of policies that can help get us there, um, but if the utilities are incentivized to suppress the very thing that we should be building, small and medium scale distributed generation and energy efficiency programs, in part because we lock in billions of dollars of grid modernization without keeping this in mind, we believe we're squandering ratepayer dollars. I, I'd really like to see Evergy's STP lean into this transition um, to truly add customer value, let customers invest in on-site and local resources to help optimize our electricity demand. Um, for example, I love that you touch on smart homes with smart meters. Those are things that can help shift energy demand and store excess power that can be used when and where it's needed most. Um, like Commissioner French, I'm struggling to see how this plan focuses on the grid of the future. Um, as I reviewed grid modernization plans from across the country, they really seem to focus more and first on rapid decarbonization of coal plants and then secondary deep integration of distributed energy resources. So I'd really like to see more details of that incorporated into the plan. Um, we also need to consider, as, as Chairwoman Duffy said, our low-income friends and neighbors who are struggling in today's pandemic with job losses, utility shutoffs, and rising electric bills. Um, so given those concerns, um, if you retired your coal assets earlier, perhaps through securitization, is it possible that those savings could help pay for some or all of the grid modernization plan that you've put forward? Darren, you gonna let me take this one there? Yeah, I'll start, KB. Okay. You, you know, I think, I, I think that's exactly what we're talking about with, uh, with the STP, recognizing that, that the STP is the, the, the first five-year foray in discussion with stakeholders on um, grid modernization and, and decarbonization. You know, we've got the IRP process uh, running concurrently, obviously, that, that's looking at a lot of those things that you're talking about, the, the ability to, to move forward the retirement of fossil facilities, replace them with re renewable and or distributed resources or or, or more efficient, uh, more efficiency programs. And, and that's all part of what Kayla and team are, are evaluating and, and working through with stakeholders now. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, that, that's why we're looking at this in tandem, uh, looking at decarbonization at the same time, we're looking at grid modernization so that we, we take those factors into account when we're, we're making sure the grid can can get renewable sources to, to where they need to go and make sure the grid has the, the two-way flexibility to address the, the things that you're talking about um, and, and using uh, some of the ability to, to move through decarbonization to unlock some of those, some of those savings in O&M and maintenance and, and other capital costs that, that can be redeployed into grid mod and into the renewable resources. 
So it, the, the important discussion really, uh, and the way we've looked at it is about pace, right? You know, how quickly can we do it from a, an execution standpoint and how quickly can we do it in a balanced way that doesn't have unintended consequences of uh, unnecessary rate impacts to, to, to customers? So, so thank you for that, Darren. Um, is there a plan? And I know we're going to we're going to we're going to talk about the cost at a later workshop, but but is there a plan that that some of the savings through securitization will help pay for the grid mod plan, or or is it all going to be in the TDC, for example? Yeah, so so it's all it's all related, right? I mean, to the extent that there's securitization and an ability to to deal with decarbonization, that that, that is factored into to how we think about the, the the rate impacts that we've talked about being at, at, at around the level of inflation. So so we are redeploying the, those dollars, right? Either into grid modernization or into necessary uh, renewable. Uh, generation or replacement for for what would be coming offline from the fossil facility, so so absolutely that's part of the plan to to be able to to unlock some of that some of that cash to, to help fund some of this this investment. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so a couple of times, folks have talked about ratepayer benefits or customer benefits or, or customer added value. Um, can you share some kind of more tangible ways? What are they gonna get for their 2% um, of inflation or their 10% at the end of five years? You know, I, I know on the back end, there are lots of um, very important uh, benefits. Um, uh, for Evergy, for your ability to control the grid, um, for your ability to have more transparency. But, but what is it gonna look like from a customer standpoint um, for that investment that they're gonna be making? Yeah, Dorothy, this is Bruce Aiken. So um, one, of the, one of the key benefits that, that's driving this is a more reliable system, more resilient to to weather events. And um, while we expect improvement, what's difficult to project is how the system would have degraded if we didn't start upgrading the grid. So um, all of those things you talked about as far as uh, we'll have more knowledge about how our system works and works more efficiently, those all flow through to the customer in, in reducing outage times, um, making the grid um, smarter, better able to handle that distributed energy uh, generation that, that's out there as well. So, I mean, there's, there's uh, a number of benefits for a number of different uh, groups of our customers, but, you know, from, from one perspective, reliability is, is the kind of the base level. We got to have a reliable system before we can do any of the rest of the, the things that uh, benefit customers. Thank, thanks, Bruce. I just have one more question that maybe I can dig a little deeper on. So on page 26 of the presentation, you talk about um, distribution infrastructure investment benefits. Um, so how do these proposed upgrades enable future grid transformation towards distributed resources and electrification? And so can you give me some examples of that? Like how specifically are DERs going to be impacted? And, and, and then secondary to that, where does customer owned generation fit into this mix of, of, of grid modernization? Um, so. I'll, I'll defer that one to Ryan Mulvaney to take a shot at. Yeah, I think the, the categories, you mentioned slide 26, right? I want to make sure I'm looking at the right frame of reference you're looking at. Yes. The programmatic asset replacements, um, especially when we talk about uh, some of the line rebuilds or reconductoring projects that we're laying out that are not 
um, you know, regional long lines. These are lines that feed neighborhoods, typically well-established neighborhoods that some of which are experiencing some of these um, types of technologies that you're discussing, whether it be solar on rooftops or other places. And while we haven't seen a, a, an enormous penetration that's had an impact on the grid, there are a few pockets where we have and, and our current grid in its current state couldn't handle the bi-directional flow and we had to do upgrades rather quickly um, to be able to address those areas. And, and so we have to add that into our planning portfolio now that hey, when we plan a different section for an upgrade, that has to contemplate the fact that it's not going to be a linear flow of power from source to um, um, load. It, it potentially is now is going to be, we have um, sources on both sides and load taking power off at different parts of the grid that all relies on that grid to be, I hate you keep using the same buzz terms, but resilient and robust to be able to handle that. And many of these assets we're talking about in that big bar, the programmatic asset replacement, they're 60 and 70 year old wire that's up in the air that um, honestly can't handle the stress that this potentially is putting on us. Now, our planning process takes into account these types of impacts to these technologies and tries to place them on our 20 year um, um, planning horizon and where we expect them to occur and at what levels we expect them to occur. And it's based on lots of studies and, and information that we receive throughout the industry on, on just basically projections of, of when, when is it coming in a, in a mass enough form that, that it's gonna be impactful to our grid. And that's all baked into our IRP planning. But because our planning groups are all aligned, those same studies now go to our distribution planners so they can take that type of information into account when they're looking at a big feeder upgrade or when we're looking at a project to upgrade a lateral in a neighborhood. All of that has to now be contemplated. Where in the past, it would typically be a like-for-like -like replacement with some concept of upgrading to a current standard. That, that world is much more dynamic now. Thank you. That's 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 helpful. Um, I, I hope I I hope I don't sound flip with this because it's not my intention at all. But as customers are paying for that infrastructure through the TDC as a part of the grid modernization plan, I would hope we can find a way for them not to have to pay for it in another way as well, um, because it seems like the issues that we've been dealing with around distributed energy resources could potentially be solved in these investments that you're suggesting all customers pay for. So I, I appreciate your time. I, I, think it, I think this is a worthwhile project. As I said, we support grid modernization. We really wanna make sure that, it's, that there are things baked into it that aren't just, um, continuing the legacy centralized power um, and not really taking into account how uh, more decentralized power can, can play into our future. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we're ready then for Grain Belt Ex Express, uh, Mr. Schulte. Thank you, Mr. Fedotin, and thank you uh, commissioners for the opportunity to participate. Um, Greenbelt appreciates the opportunity and um, appreciates the robust discussion so far. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Orjit Goshal, who is the uh, Director of Regulatory Affairs at Invenergy, which is the parent company of Greenbelt. Thank you, Mr. Schulte. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Duffy, Commissioners Keen and French, uh, and Mr. Fedotin for the opportunity to ask questions uh, and to Avergy for the presentation. As Mr. Schulte said, my name is Orijit Goshal. I'm Director of Regulatory Affairs with Invenergy, uh, who is uh, the owner of Grain Belt Express LLC. I have two questions today. Hopefully that won't take my full 15 minutes. Uh, my first question is for Mr. Aiken regarding page 15 of the presentation, which is titled Discipline Planning Process. On that page in the first column, which is titled Specific Needs Identified, it lists as the second to last bullet, quote, changes in generation mix requiring investment for stability and reliability, end quote. My question is, 
In planning for sufficient and efficient service, does Evergy consider affordability or quote, regional rate competitiveness, unquote, of the generation mix, including for existing generators, either owned or under contract, in addition to considering stability and reliability? Stated another way, is affordability a specific need that Evergy considers when planning or evaluating potential generation investments or when evaluating its existing generation fleet? If the answer is yes, then how do you measure affordability? Yeah, so I will I will take the short answer and say yes, and then I'll turn it over to Kayla Messamore to give you a more detailed answer of, of all the components that go into the, the planning process. Yeah, thanks, Bruce, and thanks for the question. Um, so that planning process that you referenced, that is, we'll call that the grid mod planning process that's talking about drivers of T&D projects more specifically. So to move over into the generation side of things, um, when we do an IRP, the, the primary objective function that we're looking at as we evaluate generation options is revenue requirement is seeking the lowest revenue requirement option. Um, so that's our, that's our measure of affordability and it is the primary objective function when we evaluate different resource plans through the IRP. So that's the long version of Bruce's yes. Um, but if it doesn't answer the question, let me know if there's, there's another follow-up. No, I, I think that's great. Uh, thank you for that answer. Um, and my second and final question is is more general, and it's for anyone at Evergy who, who can respond. Um, and this is regarding page 31 of the presentation, which is titled STP T&D Capital Investment Summary. On that page uh, in the footnote, Evergy states that the definition of T&D is functional as opposed to a FERC accounting definition. So my question is approximately how much of the 3.5 billion will flow through rates regulated by FERC, how much through rates regulated by the KCC and how much uh, through neither? So uh, everything that's uh, labeled transmission will throw, flow through the FERC mechanism. Um, everything that's in blue, the distribution will flow through the, the KCC recovery mechanism. What that's indicating is that there are other assets like meters and so forth that are considered distribution from a FERC accounting standpoint that are excluded from this, this chart. Okay, so, so those are part of the 3.5 billion or not? They are not. Uh, when you say they, the meters and so forth are not part of the 3.5 billion. Okay, and so those are additional costs of the 3.5 that would be recovered through rates regulated by the KCC? Correct. Okay, that's, that's all for a grain belt, thank you. Uh, I was given permission to jump in and interrupt. <laughs> so I'm gonna take that opportunity since, since grain belt was so gracious with their time. Um, you, you, they asked a question on transmission and the breakdown between FERC jurisdictional versus KCC jurisdictional. Uh, if I could just ask a a little more of a nuance on that. What part of the, the, the amount that you label transmission would be SPP plan transmission versus transmission that you just uh, put in through your own planning processes? Um, I, don't, I don't have that information readily handled, uh, handy. I don't know if Kayla has that or not. I don't have it handy either, but I will say that the, the SPP, if we talk about SPP planning um, process, the reason I'm hesitating is to make sure I understand what you mean by that. Um, if you're talking about things that we get, for example, a notice to construct for from SPP, so that that's a fairly small portion of, of the transmission that we're talking about. The, those NTCs are for reliability reasons from, from an SPP perspective, they don't take into account things like asset condition all the time. So they, SPP doesn't always care about asset condition and that becomes a large driver of what, what we're investing in. So I don't have the number offhand, but it's not a huge portion that's coming directly from SPP for an NTC or a generation interconnect, for example, those okay. are, which are reimbursed, but, but they're, a, they're a small portion. 
maybe one more quick question on transmission since we're there. Uh, on your slide 20, you, you list out the different types of transmission investment uh, by voltage, and then you list substation, transmission substation investment, and that's a pretty big chunk of it. Um, I guess the question would be, would some portion of that be directly assigned, the costs of those be directly assigned to either generators or to uh, transmission customers, or, or would you view none of those as being directly assigned? Another, another nuanced question I will attempt to answer. Uh, so depending on the voltage that we're talking about, a portion of it will end up impacting the transmission revenue requirements of other transmission customers. It, because it all kind of goes into a big bucket, it's difficult to parse out exactly how much will result in increased transmission re revenues from other transmission customers. So yes, some of it, some of it so will go back. It's fair to say some portion yes. <laughs> would be as yes. directly assigned to other customers, not necessarily Evergy retail customers. Well, I wouldn't say directly. That, that I think is the word I'm getting hung up on, is, is not directly to other customers, but it will impact the costs of okay. those transmission customers. Okay, so it will be in your ATRR, but others may pay it. <laughs> yes, it. yes. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm done, I'll get off the transmission issue. <laughs> well, all right, but you can't even like, is it a 50-50, 70-30? You can't even go there, Kayla, in terms of, of what this represents actually? It's small. It, I wouldn't put it anywhere close to those percentages that you were throwing out because only the higher voltages are regionally right. funded. The rest right. of it's at the zone level. So even, only when you're getting to those higher voltages would it come into a play. And okay. you saw on the chart, that's a pretty small bar. So, so not 70 <laughs> to answer right. your question, but it's fairly small. Okay. But, but what I'm, and what I'm hearing is that that, that piece is all going into um, your revenue requirement. It is not sort of an SPP lingo, a directly assigned upgrade. Say you had a wind farm connect in Correct. and you directly assign the cost of the substation uh, for them to interconnect. That's, that's not what we're talking about in right. this investment. Right. Okay. So, so those interconnect related projects, they're technically in our project list, but the reimbursements are included as well. So they're not showing up when we show a dollar value. They, so we're doing, they net out. Okay. we're doing them, but they net out. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, I didn't, I don't think grain belt had anybody else, um, in line to ask any questions. If I'm incorrect, uh, uh, Mr. Schulte, please correct me. Uh, otherwise, okay. we'll move on to Local 304 and Mr. Wood. Thank you, Mr. Fedoten, and uh, thank you to the commission uh, for the opportunity to appear here today and uh, become part of this uh, process. We appreciate that very much. I just have uh, one question. I think I'll be relatively brief. Um, my question pertains <clears throat> to page 16 of the um, patient um, in which there was outlined, um, there's a quote uh, that there's a robust labor strategy, I think is what I wrote, wrote down here. Um, and so I'm looking for a little bit more information on that. And specifically, um, my question is, what do you anticipate will be the effects of the STP on the existing labor force? And I'm not sure who, who to best address uh, that question to. Uh, so I'll just throw it open to whomever is the most appropriate. Thank you. Yeah, th this is Bruce Aiken. And from a, from a T and D construction standpoint, um, one of the biggest concerns with the, with the increase in capital this, of this size and given the grid modernization plans that are going on at other utilities across the country, um, the, the, the work out in California from, from wildfires. We need to make sure that we have a good plan, that we can have the labor resources available to do the work in our, our territory. And so working with our contractors, uh, working with our locals um, to make sure that we have, have the, the personnel to, to do the work. Um, what does that mean from a line standpoint for our, our employees that are covered by 304? It means we've got plenty of work for them to do. Um, and they've got an opportunity to, to, to transition the, the grid into the, the future and, and, and leave it better than they have it today. Very well. Thank you for your time. Uh, 
Thank you. I think we're then ready for Midwest Energy and Ms. Kallenbach. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I would like to echo the sentiments of other parties in thanking the Commission and Evergy for organizing this, this collaborative process. I think it, it's helpful, certainly, um, and educational for me. Uh, subject to confirmation by Aaron Romy, who I believe is, is still on the line, Midwest uh, does not have any questions or comments at this time, but would like to uh, retain the ability to ask questions if, for example, commissioner questions, raise additional questions for us, if that's possible, assuming that there is time to, to do such a thing. Yeah, sure, Th thank you, that, that should be okay. As, uh, like you said, based on uh, time constraints. Um, so we're ready for KEPCO and Ms. Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Fedoten, and thank you, Commissioners and Evergy, for um, hosting this meeting today. I would like to turn our questions over um, initially to Mark Doljak, who is KEPCO's Executive Director of Regulatory Affairs and Planning. And uh, then it's possible that um, Rebecca Fowler, KEPCO's manager of regulatory affairs and outside counsel Kimberly Frank might have a couple of questions as well, but I anticipate that most, if not all of our questions will come from Mr. Doljak. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to ask these questions and, and uh, to, to engage in the workshop. So thank you to Evergy and the commission for that. Um, I just wanted to start out with, uh, there was a question that was raised a little bit earlier about the extent to which uh, these, these uh, $2 billion worth of transmission projects have uh, resulted from the, the engagement in the SPP integrated transmission planning process. And, and as Kayla indicated, a very small portion of that is, and, and she explained why. Um, but I think that that opens uh, things to a, to a question that I, I think is important. Uh, can you can you provide some information? And, and this goes to anyone at, at Evergy. I, I'm not trying to limit this to Kayla. Um, what criteria does does Evergy apply to address the need for transmission replacements and uh, in addressing that, it would be helpful to know if the uh, $2 billion that, that has been uh, determined or projected would be for transmission projects that are, are needed to improve performance uh, to meet unfulfilled NERC or uh, Southwest Power Pool reliability entity requirements. So I can, I'll take a pass. This is Kayla Messamore, and I'll take a pass at answering that, and then others can add on if one if they want to. So I'll start with the second part, which is that anything related to NERC standard or SPP requirements is is required. So we we have to do it. And if it's existed in the past, we've addressed it. Um, we have to address those compliance um, issues. So a lot of what we're looking at is reliability in the not in the NERC sense <laughs> necessarily. Um, so we're talking about the performance of the asset that might impact how much we have to maintain it. It'll cause us to have to, um, it could cause impacts on customers depending on what the system looks like. So to talk about the first part of your question, which um, I like because this is what planners do. Uh, so the main factors that we put into rating different projects and trying to evaluate the benefits of it from a reliability perspective, which is really the primary driver of the overall value of a project when we identify it, um, is asset age um, is a big one. And if we have uh, inspection data on that asset, we factor that in. If we know we've gone out to look at it recently and we know that it's in need of replacement, obviously that factors into the, the assessment of its age and condition. Um, whether there is any sort of contingency available, um, that'll vary a little bit how you think about contingency from a transmission or a distribution perspective. But um, basically if this thing fails, are we able to cover it? with something else or does it create an immediate customer impact? Um, potential overloads, risk of potential overloads, that's one where from a transmission perspective, a lot of that is factored in. 
um, to the SPP process and into NERC standards. So a lot of that is addressed through those required reliability projects, but there can be kind of forward looking or special circumstances that could, could cause some overload concerns, but generally I think that's addressed by required projects. Um, congestion is another one. If there's the potential that this is causing congestion, if it's involved in congestion management events, for example, if there's an operating guide in place for it with the SPP. Um, let's see, I'm gonna try to make sure I didn't miss any of them. Um, and then if the, the last one, this is a relatively minor, but if there are known design issues, say for example, the substation is really, really hard to maintain because of the way that it's laid out. That's something that it factors into it. It's not a driver, but it's a driver of wanting to get it fixed if there's other reasons that we need to go fix that asset. So those are, there's a lot of different factors, but those are some of the main ones that go into selecting transmission projects and evaluating the benefits. Okay. Thank you. No, I, that's helpful. And, and certainly, you know, I, I'm sure I share this, this opinion with uh, all other parties in, in the, uh, in the call, we're, we're all uh, very, uh, we, we put a, a lot of uh, uh, emphasis on, on reliability. It's very important to all of us. And, and uh, the flip side of that is, of course, you know, that reliability does come at a cost. And we, we understand that. Um, we're, we're trying to get a little bit of a handle on, you know, being a, a, a transmission customer of Evergy. Um, you know, I know some of the statements that were made earlier, particularly by Kevin and Darren, indicated that the rates uh, will increase at or below the, the rate of inflation. Uh, that's, that's what's projected, at least. I would assume that that statement uh, applies to the integrated service that's pr provided to Evergy's retail customers. Uh, I, I'm interested, however, in... Uh, have, has Evergy looked at the impacts of, of their STP as it relates just to the transmission service? And uh, if so, to what extent are you projecting rate increases for transmission service over that five-year period? Yeah, so this is Darren. I mean, I, I'll just take a quick shot at that and and, and my quick answer is I, I, I don't have, you know, with me anything that looks at kind of that transmission level service uh, rate impact. Um, so, so we might need to, we might need to, to follow up and, and talk uh, a little bit later about, about that one. Okay. Uh, just, just an observation from our, our viewpoint. Um, I mean, I, I looked at the, the most recent um, annual projection for the, for 2021, uh, the annual transmission revenue requirement, and and looked at the different components of that in the latest annual update. And uh, I, I do think it's it's kind of noteworthy that um, the the rate base uh, in projected for 2021 uh, for transmission services is, is 1.6 billion dollars. Uh, and if you look at the projected gross transmission plant uh, for 2021, that's $2.7 billion. So, you know, $2 billion in terms of an, an investment over five-year period looks, looks pretty striking. Um, and I, I'm just concerned, you know, particularly at a time where um, load growth is, is relatively small, and we're in the middle of a pandemic as well, which, which is uh, affecting retail customers to varying degrees. I mean, there are, there are a lot of people that have fallen on hard times, unfortunately. And I think it's, it's, it's very difficult, um, I, I think, to, to, to really understand um, the, the magnitude of that until you, you kind of look at those sorts of numbers. So. Um, you know, just, just as, as an additional piece of information, I've, I've noticed that over the 2020 annual transmission revenue requirement, 
uh, the 2021 projection is 24% higher. So, you know, it, to me, in order to achieve a 2% on transmission, I think you, you would end up having to, to cut your, your rate base significantly, um, potentially, uh, you, you know, because there's not a lot of operating cost. Uh, I think the, the return is, is a, uh, about over 40% of, of your annual revenue requirement. And, and so I'm, I'm very concerned about that. Um, I was just wondering if, if there's any consideration to uh, prioritizing these projects. And, and I guess even before I get to that, um, one, one important question I have, are, are any of these projects open for uh, order number 1000 uh, competition consideration? Would any of these projects be available for, for bid uh, by, by other entities? There are a couple of, this is Kayla, sorry. There are a couple of um, competitive projects in process um, through SPP right now. Um, I'm, I'm pausing because I can't remember how they're reflected in the budget, but I believe they, they would be outside of the budget um, because they're going through that competitive transmission project process as we speak. There's only two though that I know of um, going through the process right now. Okay. And are those, are those significant portions of, of the, the total projected or are they pretty small? Oh, they're not in this total because those are a separate process. We're participating in those projects or Transource is participating in those projects and we're not. Okay, I see. Thanks. Yeah. One is in Oklahoma, if it helps. So it's not in our service territory. One is, one is in our service territory. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then I, I guess when it comes to, you know, the savings, I know there's, there's been discussion of savings. Um, I was just trying to get a, a better handle on that. I know on slide six, uh, there's discussion about fuel savings. Uh, and, you know, I, I, on the other, other side of things, I, I will give credit where credit is due. I think a lot of the transmission investment has uh, resulted in uh, reduced energy rates. For the for the region and within Westar, and I I give credit uh, to you all for that. I am curious though on your uh, your slide six how those the fuel savings that are shown there were were estimated. So so Mr. Mr. Doljek, I, I I might if unless one of my colleagues wants to has a high level answer. I, I might save that one for our cost efficiency docket uh, later this month. Okay. But, but I do, I do, I, you know, uh, uh, to, to your concerns, I mean, I appreciate you, um, appreciate your comments. And, you know, I, I think we have opportunities to, to collaborate both in this workshop and hopefully outside of this workshop. So I, I know uh, some of our folks are scheduled to meet with the KEPCO team later this month. So we'll, we'll make sure we uh, have a responsive uh, update when we come over and, and, and chat with you. I guess it'll be virtually. I appreciate that very much, Kevin. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll conclude my questions. Thank you. This is Rebecca Fowler. So I just wanted to clarify, um, justification for a lot of the capital spend um, is, is also driven by savings in O&M, non-fuel O&M and other O&M. But it seems like in transmission, um, there are not offsetting, there are not offsetting savings in um, transmission costs. It's all really in fuel. Is that correct? So that our, so that the increase we're seeing in, in the TFR, the ATRR, um, is not offset in, in, is not projected to be offset in the future by any savings in o, transmission O and M. Yeah, Rebecca, it's Darren. I mean, I, I'll take that. I, I think that that's true in, in, in a large respect, right? Um, that there certainly is the potential as you 
as you, you refresh transmission system and take out uh, aging assets that you have lower maintenance cost and lower maintenance capex and and things like that associated with putting new investments in but 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 otherwise you know a lot of the savings that that we're talking about are are not driven by the transmission investment like like you might get from some of the automation in 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 the grid mod on the distribution side or or some of the effects of decarbonization okay so what you're saying is when when marcia talks about the 24 percent increase um from 20 to 21 we we cannot expect that to be offset by any savings for a purely transmission customer with the exception of the word any um i i would say that that's true there there's probably not the type of savings from uh, a transmission uh you know asset replacement and rebuild that that is going to offset that in, in totality Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I think um, we're, we're ready for KIC of, um, and Mr. Vincent. Mr. Vincent? Thank you, Mr. Fidelton. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you. Great. Proceed, please. Well, again, KIC, thanks the commission for the opportunity to appear before you this morning and engage in this work study session. And like eyes, we extend our thanks to the company and to the other interveners for the, the great dialogue we've had so far. We recognize the friction that sometimes can be present uh, when we're uh, evaluating capital investment plans, uh, while we're also looking at the effect of rate impacts on Kansans. Uh, we appreciate the collaborative discussion we've had so far, and we want to continue that uh, trend going forward. Uh, beginning in that collaborative spirit, and I'll run through my questions. Um, the STP, it's our understanding, is largely the work product created from the Boston Consulting Group with one key difference. And this is a, a question for any one of Evergy's personnel today. Uh, are you comfortable uh, announcing what that one key difference is between what the BCG report is and what the STP is? Yeah, so, so, so Robert, I think what you, uh, I, I think what you're referring to is, is there was a, a plan that we worked jointly with BCG on, that was slightly different than that the management presented STP that that moved forward, and it had to do with the trajectory of O and M savings that were in the early years of the, the the hybrid plan for for BCG compared to. Uh, the the, mo the more moderated trajectory that that management put into the STP. Right, and uh, I appreciate you saying that, Darren. What I the point I was just trying to make is there is a BCG BCG plan called the hybrid plan, uh, and that that is the actual BCG plan that then funneled into the STP. So, uh, so thank you for confirming that. I'd like to talk uh, briefly about the rate impact. Uh, we've had a lot of talk today about how the STP's expected rate impact on Kansans will be below the rate of inflation. Based on our analysis of the STP and its particular cost drivers, we think uh, that isn't 100% accurate. We believe that that 1.5 to 1.6% inflation figure that Evergy is referring to for that claim is just the change in base rates that could be expected as the STP is implemented and does not include FERC jurisdictional uh, rate-based build. And so we would ask the company if there's a way we could uh, get some formal clarification on that particular point. Yeah, I think, I, I think the, uh, the impacts are different across different jurisdictions for sure, um, but, but but in all cases, when we did our evaluation, we, we looked at our potential rate impacts across the, the FERC jurisdictional impacts as well as the, the, the traditional retail rate, rate recovery. Um, so so we, we have, we believe our calculations do have uh, kind of all in rate impacts uh, 
considered in that statement. Okay, and for clarification purposes, what I'm basing my, uh, my question on is uh, the report the company filed in the 514 docket that references a 2.2% inflation or uh, inflation rate. And based on our review of confidential work papers that were provided to KEPCO and DR 1-04, uh, our, our analysis for some of Evergy's Kansas jurisdictions indicates that the all in rate impact is above the rate of inflation. And, uh, and we just uh, like to make sure we're all on the same page and, and formalizing and and getting a good estimate on where that projected or what the projected rate impact is. Um, so if there's any way we can run that down, uh, KIC would very much appreciate it. Yeah, we might have to talk about that online because our, our analysis doesn't show that. Okay, that's fair. Uh, like and if I could just butt in real quick, I, I would just like to, to make the point that it is very important to me at least uh, to know the all-in rate impacts. Uh, we get mixed up talking about base rates versus uh, you know, riders. And honestly, all the customers care about is the total bill. Uh, and so, you know, if we can all be on the same page, I, I appreciate the dialogue. I, I think we should be on the same page that what we're talking about is the all in rate impact to customers. So uh, I apologize for taking some of your time. I, I just wanted to make sure that that I expressed that. And it, it sounds like we are on that same page. I just want to make sure everybody understood that that, that was important to me, at least. Yep, yeah, agree with that. Thank you. Uh, my next question uh, kind of uh, dovetails nicely with the discussion we had moments ago with KEPCO on FERC jurisdictional spending and some of, the, some of the prior discussion as well. So I believe we're all on the same page in that based on the presentation today, approximately $2 billion of the STP spending will be FERC jurisdictional, not subject to rate review in the state of Kansas. And I'd, try, I'd, I'd like to try and understand what the total revenue impact uh, on customers is going to be and, and see if it kind of ballparks with what you're seeing. Uh, what I did is I went to the uh, to Evergy Kansas Central's Oasis page uh, because that is where the overwhelming majority of uh, Evergy's FERC jurisdictional uh, rate base is. Uh, I took the um, projected revenue requirement uh, for the 2021 rate year, so what we can expect to start next year, and increased it um, by $2 billion. So what I'm showing right now is a Kansas jurisdictional uh, uh, rate next year, or revenue requirement, excuse me, of approximately uh, $262 million. Uh, and if we increase that, or the amount of rate base, that's, that increases up to $468 million. Now, some of that includes SPP base plan funded projects. But when you back those out, uh, we're, at, we're at $382 million uh, of, of Westar's zonal annual transmission revenue requirement recovered on Schedule 9 that flows to the TDC. The main point of that is my, by my rough back of the napkin math, that is uh, approximately a hundred and eighty-six million dollar increase in Evergy Kansas Central's ATRR that's recovered through the TDC that we can expect uh, over the next five years without any Kansas over without any Kansas specific rate oversight. Is that consistent with what the company's uh, own projections are showing? Yes. Yeah. This is Darren. I, I mean, I, I think I mentioned this earlier, but I, I'm not necessarily prepared to talk about uh, detailed projections around the, uh, the, the TFR today. I don't have that information handy and available. So happy to, to have further dialogue as, as we move forward on that. Um, my guess is it, it's not entirely that simple to, to, to just mm -hmm. add that investment on and, and move forward, but um, I'm just not prepared to to, to talk about specifics on that, on, on this workshop. Sure, and that's a fair point. I'm not gonna hold you to anything uh, specific at this time. I think it's important to recognize that the introductory slides to this presentation focused uh, or show that Evergy has a focus on improving its regional rate competitiveness. And at the end of the day, the, the main thing that's gonna determine that is how much revenue Kansas customers have to contribute to Evergy. And it's important for us to fully understand what that impact is 
based on the company's capital investment projections and levels. Uh, I, I think we're going to need to continue to, to expand on this area, make sure we're comfortable where, where, those, uh, where that path is walking. So I appreciate uh, the, the, the complexity of the question and that's not necessarily uh, simple to answer, but it's a concern to us. It sounds like it's a concern to others. And it's something we should be continuing to work through. Um, the STP, particularly this presentation, indicates that we can expect significant savings in uh, non-fuel O&M and fuel and purchase power costs. I think Mr. Bryant earlier was referring to something as, as though it's 25% lower than 2019 levels. What is important uh, that we've been able to see and recognize is that based on the merger that KCP and Ellen West are executed, those cost buckets were already trending downwards. And so what we are concerned with is the incremental amount of savings that's associated with the STP's incremental uh, CapEx. So does the company have a breakout uh, that it can share uh, publicly on how much additional savings customers should expect based on the additional uh, CapEx that's called for under the STP? Because I do not believe it is accurate and fair to say that only because the STP are we able to get to 25% uh, reduction in certain cost buckets. You were already on the way down there based on our uh, re uh, analysis of the company's work papers and presentations. Yeah, so so it's Darren again. And you know, I think I think that's a fair discussion, Robert. And, and I think we've talked about that in different forms before, that, that certainly we had a set of efficiencies that we've been executing on since the merger. Um, started taking effect in 18, certainly were in effect in 19 and, and have, have persisted through. Um, we, we certainly have two things. Um, we, we have um, a set of work we're doing to evaluate the efficiencies in the years uh, 20 through 24 moving forward. Um, and, and what we've said really about the 25% is, is not that it's necessarily all unlocked by the STP, but, but that's the trajectory that will occur during the STP planning horizon of 20 to 24 um, to, to get to those O&M levels in 2024 that are 25% below what, what was in, what was actually incurred in 2019. Um, so, okay. so there is some, there is some blend, but, but we're looking at, um, you know, budgets across the corporate level in evaluating the, the aggregate, aggregate effect of, of the efficiencies in the horizon 20 to 24. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, shifting a little bit to asset replacement now, um, obviously the STP is calling for about $1.5, $1.6 billion worth of investment in the distribution system over the next five years. Uh, and, and the large driver of that is improving resiliency, reliability, and the age of the assets that Evergy currently has in its, in its system. I went back to the company's 2015 base rate case in Kansas, where the EDGAR, or uh, where, the, where the grid resiliency program was initially proposed, and it's discussed briefly in this presentation. That proposal was a little bit over $900 million over 15 years and a cost recovery mechanism was essential uh, to the companies moving forward with that particular proposal. Here, we've got 600 million more dollars of CapEx condensed into five years and no cost recovery mechanism is needed. Um, two questions to this. Uh, the first is, how is the company able to finance such um, intensive, uh, rate base or, or asset replacement it, during a base rate moratorium. And the second question is, if we have known about the age of, of Evergy's facilities and assets for a long time and know, known that they're getting up in age, why now? What is the rush to try and get everything done as quickly as possible in five years? What, what's, why, why condense it so much? I know we've had some discussion on that earlier. Yeah, this is Bruce Aiken. I'll take the second part of your question. Um, we're not getting it all done in the next five years. We're, we're taking a, 
uh, systematic approach and we will not have the system completely re rebuilt in the next five years. Um, we did propose that plan back in 2015. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we did get a, a, a pilot of $50 million of additional that we recovered in the true up in that rate case. I will tell you that we increased during that pilot period but we didn't necessarily take our capital expenditures down to the pre-request level. So we've been making some headway over the last five years since that, that rate case. And so um, if you went back to, to 2015 and looked at what we spent so far and, and, and what we're projecting here in the next five years, I'm not sure the gap isn't as big as, is what you might be just uh, thinking, thinking it is. So um but again, when you look at our, our infrastructure, um, we've, we, we have gotten the most good out of it that we can. And we think we've gotten to a point where reliability will, will truly start impacting our customers. And our customers have benefited from that um, by not having to pay for new infrastructure. So you know, every year, there are 10 years that you can delay a, a, a CapEx program um, over, you know, extended period of time you're you're avoiding a capital expenditure and we think we've gotten to the end of that and it's time to start uh, replacing our our assets particularly when there's a lot more um, technology out there that we can be, get a smarter uh, grid and be able to deal with uh, um, distributed energy resources and other things that that weren't necessarily even contemplated back in 2015. Okay uh, thank you Mr. Aiken I appreciate that answer. I have some more specific questions for you that are contained in the confidential BC, BCG materials. So I'll, I'll withhold those for that uh, for this time. I know my time is running short, so I have a few more uh, topics regarding the STPs, capital expenditures, and then the five years after that. Uh, this question is for Mr. Bryant. Uh, I believe earlier in our discussion, we, you indicated that after the next five years, uh, the company is currently planning on six to nine billion dollars of, of capital spending in the 2025 to 2030 timeframe. Based on my review of the company's investor presentations, uh, it appears that that is 9 billion to 12 billion. So I was just curious if the, if the next five years capital budgets have, have decreased since that investor presentation was made public. No, it, it, it has not. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I mis, misspoke. We, we can certainly oh. share that page with, with this group for, for transparency. Sure. You know, I think that, you know, it, as regional competitive, uh, competitiveness of rates is at the forefront of our minds and others. The SDP is a $9 billion CapEx plan. If the next five, five years is another nine to 12, then we've got an STP followed by another STP. And unless other utilities are, uh, in other states next to Kansas are engaged in the same type of build out, then we are concerned that our regional rate competitiveness won't improve. And so I, if we can get clarification on that, I'd very much appreciate it. Yeah. And I, and um, I think what I was referring to earlier was the grid mod components. So that other 3 okay. billion that you mentioned more fell into the decarbonization bucket. So maybe that's oh, the distinction. Okay. You know, that is, a, that is a good distinction. Uh, and I appreciate that as Commissioner French alluded to, customers are cared about what the, what the end result is, what the total bill is, right? And I think it's important that we make sure that we keep that frame in mind as we move okay. forward. Agreed. Uh, with that said, those are all the uh, questions I, ha I have for this time. Thank you so much for engaging in this discussion and I yield the floor. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, I think it's time for uh, Kansas Power Pool and Ms. Klein. Thank you. Uh, this is Amy Klein for the Kansas Power Pool. I'm going to turn it over to Larry Holloway, who's the Assistant General Manager for the Kansas Power Pool, to pose any questions that we may have. Okay, uh, thank you, Amy. I assume I can be heard. Uh, I'll look for a nod or two. Uh, okay, thank yes. you. Uh, my first question really is kind of a follow-up question to one of the responses. Uh, to Mark Doljack. And um, uh, my question is, is this, uh, my understanding, we were talking about competitive order 1000 projects. I know that, that the next one that is up for, um, um, for a bid is basically the Wolf Creek to Blackberry project, which is mainly in Kansas. And uh, I heard a response that indicated maybe Transource, which is 
87%, if I recall correctly, AEP are only 13% KC KCPL in that joint venture, uh, was looking at putting in a bid on that, but I don't recall that Transource has a certificate in Kansas. Uh, I was curious if maybe I'm wrong on that. Uh, do you, does Transource have a certificate in Kansas? And are you looking at, at submitting a bid through Transource on that? Yeah, this is Darren. Yes, you know, our, our, our competitive transmission vehicle um, is, is Transource for Order 1000 projects. Uh, and and they, they, I, I suspect they will, along with a number of other parties, uh, put, in, put in bids for, for that line. And, and I, think, I think we do have um, um, the, the vehicle in, in Kansas with Transource to do that. Okay, uh, well, I guess kind of a follow up to that. And I know there's also, I, I think another project that, that could very well come along soon after that is a Tioga to a Butler 138 KV replacement, which is a pretty substantial distance line. I mean, it's 138 KV, but I think it's, uh, I, um, I guess two questions. One is my understanding is don't, currently in the, in the Evergy Central area, is 138 KV built to 345 KV standards? Is that correct, or do I have that wrong? That is not correct. That's not correct. Okay. No. What is it? What What is the standards? 138 KV. Well, I know that 69 KV is built to 138 KV standards, and I know that 34 and a half KV is built to 69 KV. Yeah, we. I mean, we've been continuing to review our our standards. I do not believe that our 69 kV is built to 138 in our new standards going forward. There may be some particular cases, 115 and 138. I think are built to the same standard. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, the um, it. I guess one of the questions I would have. Was I correct on the percentages on Transource? Is that 18% Evergy and, or I'm sorry, 13% Evergy and? Yeah, I think it's, this is Darren, I think it's 13 and a half percent. Okay. And, and, you know, and the reason why I'm asking is I just wonder how that affects your other capital investments on transmission. Uh, I'm kind of looking at this from a little bit different angle than, than I think some of the other transmission questions you've had asked. I know, and I know when we first uh, uh, formed Kansas Power Pool, a relatively new organization, uh, we had members that weren't getting full transmission service and had to self-generate, had import limits for years. Uh, we were limited by some 69 KV, which, which thank you has recently been rebuilt. And so we no longer have that problem in, in the area, but, but we kept getting delayed on that rebuild. We were promised it was going to happen the next year, and we got delayed year after year after year, simply because the CapEx spending in the transmission budget for the old Westar, the former Westar, was high enough that that project kept getting shuffled off to the next year. And so my question is, if you're going to do this modernization and you're bidding on these Order 1000 projects, which I think the one you just got in Oklahoma is what probably going to end up being a revenue, you know, probably going to cost, uh, probably going to have to raise 30 to $50 million in capital, I'm just guessing, uh, for the transource part. And if and if you participate in, in the other two, that could be an additional maybe $100 million. Um, how does that affect your, your additional plan? I mean, is is does that put pressure on the capital spending that you're trying to accomplish for other transmission projects? How do you treat that in the bucket? Do you, do you then say, we've used up part of our transmission bucket, so this stuff doesn't get done now? Yeah, this is, this is Darren again, and it, it doesn't, it, you know, the, the, the funding mechanism for Transors comes from, comes from Evergy outside of the um, jurisdictional utilities that serve Kansas and Missouri. So the, the capital structure and the financing available for transmission within our, our jurisdictional utilities is, is segregated and separate. Okay, and, and it will not affect the cost of money or the capital for the, the, the cost of capital for your other projects? 
That's correct. Okay. Um, what, one question I had, it looks like there's an awful lot of improvements and automations in your long-term plan uh, on, your, on your distribution side. And um, uh, currently Evergy is a top-down metering entity. In other words, uh, uh, there, the actual retail distribution substations are not metered. Uh, you, you take everything else and you subtract out the wholesale and what's left is retail. Will this affect that? I'm not aware of specific plans to address that, Larry. Okay. Uh, I know every time we, we go to FERC on a loss of study, that it ends up being a major issue. Um, another thing is kind of a request. I, I'm hoping that this these upgrades and stuff are well coordinated. I know we got caught short with the EMS upgrade that took place last week. We take data back from SPP that's fed through Westar's EMS or Evergy Central's EMS. I guess it's just Evergy's EMS to SPP and we pull it back and we give that data to our members so they can watch their loads and stuff. And we've had some issues. We didn't really know or it really wasn't well coordinated that that was going to happen with us. And when, when you're making a lot of these, and I, I want, I'm referring now to a question by Commissioner French. Um, when, when you make a lot of these upgrades on the distribution side, those can affect the wholesale distribution charges that my customers see. I mean, you, and the reason why I bring that up is when I do that, that conversion you were talking about earlier from 4KV to I assume 12 kV uh, primary uh, for some of your customers that are still on 4 kV. When that happens, that's probably spread across all your retail customers. But but when those type upgrades happen in a very local area, the way the, the wholesale distribution service charge works is that very feeder itself is allocated amongst wholesale and retail customers. I like that. I think it's I think it's a good process. I don't have any problem with the way that allocation works. But I just want to make sure that, and it never has been a problem in the past, but I just want to make sure that, that those upgrades are well coordinated with us so that if we want to step in and say, wait a second, we, we think we've got a better solution to keep the wholesale rates going really high for maybe one of our small wholesale customers, that we can work together on that and, and perhaps avoid what could truly be a, a major rate shock for a small community of, you know, say, you know, a, a couple hundred people, if if there was a big increase in their wholesale in their distribution costs. Yeah, Larry, and that, that's is, just more of a comment than a question. But yeah, Larry, this is Bruce. Uh, duly noted. I think we've worked together uh, with other wholesale yes. customers in the past to to try to minimize that. And I will make note of the cooperation, a better communication on the on the, some of these projects, including EMS. Yeah, and, and I really do appreciate that, and I and I, I I do want to thank you for working with us on on so, with some of our members that needed substation upgrades. I mean, it's been a yeah, uh, compared to some of the experiences we've went through, it's been really a joy to work with Evergy on these things. So I'll just leave it at that. And thank you very much. It's so Sounds like uh, we're we're ready to move to the next uh, party. Is that if if I'm incorrect? Uh, if you could please please let me know, Miss Klein. Um, nope, you're correct. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, McPherson has advised me that they didn't have any questions, so we are ready for the Natural Resource Defense Council and Mr. Connor. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> my name is Thomas Connors, and I'm representing. Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, I want to echo what others have said and just thank the commission and the commissioners for their time today and, and for having this workshop. I uh, also want to thank the company, uh, Evergy, for putting together the presentation and um, providing the materials and, and want to thank everyone for the robust discussion. I think it's been very, very helpful. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Ashok Gupta, who is a senior economist with the Natural Resources Defense Council pose any questions that we may have. 
Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, everyone. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm going to keep my comments short. I don't really have questions, just three comments. And I uh, want to thank, of course, the company, especially Kevin Bryant. I have to call him Kevin and Bryant and Kayla and others who have really uh, been very helpful in terms of the conversations around this topic over the last year and longer. So three things at a very high level in terms of uh, what I think kind of helps shape some of our thinking around what we need to do in Kansas and many other states. So I think in terms of distribution investments, we would like to see a robust process, what we call integrated distribution planning. We spent a lot of time on integrated resource planning, which looks at that we have enough supply to meet our demand. But as we know, the distribution uh, system itself could benefit from a better planning process because of the whole peakiness of the demand. So the whole system is built to meet peak demand and how we shape our demand curve by lowering peaks and filling in valleys is probably the best way to manage cost. And yes, grid modernization investments help enable that, but we should be able to do both things at the same time in terms of looking at the investments we need to make in the distribution grid to be able to better shape the demand curve. Because if we shape the demand curve, we will minimize costs significantly and we should be looking at energy efficiency, demand response, electric vehicles, heat pumps, distributed resources, generation of all kinds, and figure out how we actually integrate this stuff. So my one recommendation to the company and others would be, let's get a robust integrated distribution planning process underway. Many other states are doing it. It's just an important tool. We may not have all the data right now to be able to even do a good job, to look at when people are consuming and where they're consuming, but that's what we should be shaping with our grid modernization is getting the data, doing the analysis so we can actually make the right investment decisions and do a better job looking at how at all of these different things that are happening. So we don't look at things like efficiency and demand response and electric vehicles and electrification and solar, distributed solar and so on as separate things, but in an integrated way. Point number one. Point number two, how we recover the costs of these distribution investments super critical. These are fixed costs. We don't want higher fixed charges or demand charges, especially for residential and small commercial customers. We have talked forever about revenue decoupling. We think one way to deal with the certainty around revenue recovery of those fixed costs and still send a price signal to customers is through a, a revenue decoupling mechanism. And this is something London Economics mentioned, and we'd love to see a way to talk about our grid modernization proposal here in the context of a revenue decoupling policy that talks about how we recover the costs. Whatever the costs we decide we need to, to have for the distribution grid, we need to figure out how we're gonna collect those costs. So I know that's not part of the SDP, but it'll come up later on. We should not think about these things in silos. We should have a robust conversation around cost recovery of these fixed cost investments into our grid. And the third is maybe even for even later on, but whole, you know, I think uh, Chair Duffy earlier talked about, you know, the whole, we need to move towards performance-based regulation. I mean, eventually the idea that you make more, the more you invest, and we're not looking at performance metrics versus investments made, we need to move in that direction. I know that's not gonna happen easily or quickly, but again, London Economics talked about it. Let's have a process to figure out how we move our regulatory approach to a PBR mechanism rather than the current system we've been in for a long, long time. So this is not anything against anybody. It's just really the current system is kind of not a good way to look at uh, incentivizing more investments is not what we want to do. What we want to incentivize is the right outcomes and, and outputs as Chairman, Chairwoman Duffy earlier talked about. So I think we need to look at the metrics that we're trying to achieve and reward that. Clearly reliability is highly important, cost management's important, many other things we're looking for in terms of outcomes. And let's get away from this 
you know, investments made determine how much revenue and returns one is going to get. So that's just, uh, you know, I know that's not exactly on point probably for this workshop, but I figured that it's related because to me, what we invest in in the distribution grid in particular should be governed by what do we want the grid to look like and the main cost driver of we know of the distribution grid is the is the peak demand and if we could do a better job if we could flatten the demand curve boy would that be a huge success so that's my little speech and i appreciate people listening to it and look forward to talking to the, working with the company and the KCC and everybody else on those three ideas. Thank you. Thank you. And Evergy, I know that those were in the form of comments rather than questions, but I wanna give you the opportunity to respond uh, if, if there's anything that you feel you need to respond to uh, before we go to the Sierra Club. Yeah, Mr. Fredot, no, I'll, I'll be brief. And we appreciate Mr. Gupta's uh, comments and feedback. We certainly have taken note and we obviously have conversations again within and outside of this workshop. So we appreciate the comments um, and certainly think there's there's uh, work to do in, in all three of those areas. So we support continued discussion in that regard. Okay, th thank you. Um, I think we're ready for the Sierra Club then, um, and Miss Woody. Sure. Hi, Teresa Woody. Um, and I again want to thank everybody. I think this has been very helpful, very informative, and I especially appreciate the um, commission making it available to the public. Um, I'm going to ask a few general questions, and then I'm going to turn it over to Ty Gorman, the Kansas campaign uh, manager for the Sierra Club. One of the questions I have is: It seems like the um, the STP capital expenditures. Um, everybody talks about the fact that they're really for existing infrastructure, primarily. They're replacing or, or, or improving existing infrastructure. And a lot of that seems like it's deferred maintenance, really. Um, has there been any assessment of whether um, deferring that and, and, and having these all kind of clumped up right now is more costly than had it been done um, in a more gradual manner? This is Bruce Aiken. Um, I can't point to any analysis that, to, to give you a hard and fast numbers, um, but by, by deferring them, we've gotten more life out of those assets um, than we, if we'd have replaced them earlier. What's difficult to, to evaluate is what was the impact of maybe negative or poor reliability on those circuits to our customers. Um, but if you look at the overall revenue requirement, the longer you defer it, then it's, it, it reduces what customers have, have had to pay. It also, it could increase the cost because it's been deferred. It might've been cheaper to, to replace it at some earlier time. Is that, is that true? That's true, but you might, you'll have to replace it again sooner than you otherwise would have. So it's kind of a circular formula. Um, well, there, there's also some benefit from not being not being on the bleeding edge of introduction of a new technology too, and you know letting letting some of that technology develop and and make sure it's proven and let the cost points come down um, when you go to put that stuff in. And it'd be remiss if I didn't also admit that, or or at least share with this group that that I think the reliability performance of the, the utilities in Kansas over these past years as as we've we've lived on these existing assets has been really good. And and what we're trying to do is make sure that that we can maintain it and or enhance that and not let it degrade. Um, so I don't think deferral has has had significant negative impacts on reliability to customers at this point. With respect to the capital expenditure, uh, expenditure costs for grid mo modernization, um, most of those, again, are directed toward existing um, methods of generation. Um, and I, there's been some discussion today about, well, in five years, everything may be different with solar. I mean, there may be all these different things going on. Um, does it make sense to defer some, uh, continue to defer some of those capital expenditures to replace existing um, infrastructure because in five years that may be obsolete and we may be, um, you know, maybe it's sort of a waste of, of, of resources. 
I'll take the first shot at that. I don't think we see anything in the near term in the next five years that's going to obsolete a distribution line. Um, it, it, that's going to be something that is going to happen over time and trying to identify exactly where that is, is going to be in, in pockets. So it's very difficult. And so um, we just don't see anything in, in the near term horizon, given the age of our assets that we think we can defer. And as we said earlier, we're, we've prioritized these projects to pick, pick the, you know, the, the most deserving projects from a customer benefit reliability standpoint, we're not replacing everything. We're not fixing everything in the next five years. Um, so there's, there's, this is an ongoing thing and maybe at different levels, who knows, but, uh, um, not our system will all be brand new in five years. So right. on that point, if I can interrupt right here, what percentage then actually in the five years will be remodeled, renovated? I meant to ask that earlier. So I apologize, Ms. Woody, but I, I did want to get a feel for that. So what are, we, what are we looking back on what needs to be replaced that is a critical replacement? Yeah, Chair Duffy, I don't have that number handy. I'm looking around the room, see if anybody else does, but it may be something we have to get back with you on. And if I could jump in, maybe we could give Ms. Ms. Woody <laughs> a little more time, but, but something she said, uh, you know, sparked a thought for me. It's a thought I've been having. Um, you know, I, I did give you all kudos for looking at emerging technologies and trying to put in, you know, what's coming, not what we, what we had, but, but I had the same thought I think she had, which is, um, you know, stated slightly differently. Um, you know, I, I would say that everything about this plan assumes that the consumer will be more reliant than ever on, on energy for their power in the, in the future. And I just wonder about disruption and, and what happens um, if the future is that consumers are less reliant uh, than ever on, on energy. And, and I, can, I can see a future where that's absolutely not the case. Um, but I just wonder how you take into account that risk um, in, in making your investment decisions. You say that that nothing uh, that you look at shows that a uh, any distribution line is going to be made obsolete in the next five or ten years. Uh, but just if you could expand on how you're looking at you know potential disruption um, and making sure that we're not making I guess obsolete uh, investments in wires. Yeah, I mean that's we look at the plan every year and make adjustments and 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 decide what's the next at, you know, the fifth year onto the plan looks like. And as new things come into the marketplace, as, as distributed uh, generation resources come into more play, more rooftop solar, that's going to change that planning uh, perspective. And so it's kind of, it's, it's, this is not a, something that's set in stone and we're just going to bury our, our face to the fact that changes might come down the road, but this is based on the information we have today and the plan that we put in place based on what we know right now. I don't suggest there's any easy answer to that, <laughs> to that question. So thank you. Thank you. Ahead, um, just a couple more, a couple more general, general questions. Um, with respect to, uh, with respect to the RRP, I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of the times there's been a, a, an answer, well, we need to defer that to the IRP process. That's where we're talking about the renewables, but doesn't it make more sense if you're talking about this kind of an investment to, have that put together first and then follow through on, on the STP investments? I mean, um, so that you know that you're really um, as forward looking as you can be with the, with the costs and expenses of capital expenditures? Yeah, I can take that. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to think of the best way to kind of answer the whole question at once. Um, I think that the reason that when the STP was developed, there was some modeling of generation assumptions that were rolled into that. So we'll call it a simulated IRP. Um, it was not the actual IRP, but it was sort of a, a shorter term view of what an IRP would show that was factored into evaluating what level of grid mod would likely go along with that investment. Um, so it was based on assumptions from the 2020 update for the IRP, sort of an interim 
it seems like if you do IRPs every year, you shouldn't have to do interim, but we did in this case. Um, so this was an interim view between the 2020 update and the 2021 triennial that took some of the assumptions that we were gonna use in the triennial, started modeling what we would see in the IRP and saw directionally, we think it's going this way and factored that into, um, factored that into the sizing of the grid mod. The problem with waiting for the IRP is there's always, there's always an IRP you could be waiting on um, because it's an annual process. So that was our view as of that time. We'll continue to refine it every single year as we do the actual IRP um, next year and we finalize or determine what our preferred plan is as a, at that point. Um, and we'll do our annual planning process based on that. But that the IRP was considered in the sizing of the grid mod. It just was not the final IRP that'll be developed as we go through the process with stakeholders. And the answer, the answer could change. The IRP is the planning process for our resource plan. So that was our view as of then, and we'll continue to update based on the IRP. Thank you. Um, with respect to the amount of the $5.6 billion, it's gonna be actually allocated toward renewables. If I understand that, that was about $300 million, which seems to be an extremely small percentage. Um, and um, I guess my question is, with that small of an expenditure, is Evergy really going to be shovel ready in five years for um, for the renewables that um, we we expect to come down and they and they increase technology, improve technology around those renewables that we expect? So the three hundred million that was referenced earlier that is only the the Kansas portion. So I'll just. There is a Missouri side of that coin um, that includes a little more investment, which contributes to our shovel readiness. Um, but also that does, we'll continue to invest in renewables going forward based on what the IRP um, results are. And that's just the first sort of wave that's assumed in the STP. So I don't know if that answers your question. Um, that, that's still quite a bit of solar <laughs> um, at the end of the day. So I, I think we'll certainly continue to refine it, but that's what that is meant to be. Well, maybe, maybe, that, maybe that answers my next question. I'm not quite sure, because I was going to ask, what is the $300 million going for? What's going to be spent on the $300 with respect to renewables? It, it's not exact, but a dollar a watt is generally what we're talking about. So that'll come out to 325 megawatts, roughly. For, for, the, for, for the 325 million that we were talking about before. Okay. And, and oh, solar. Sorry. Solar. Okay. That's what yeah. I'm, that's what, that's Sorry. What I'm, so, yeah. so there's a, there's a very small percentage built into this um, $5.6 billion for solar, but really nothing else with respect to renewables. Is that, is that right? Subject to the IRP. Like I said, it was assumed to be solar. We, we will go through the full process and test all of our resource options, but um, it's solar is the, looking like the best option based on the early analysis. Okay. Um, uh, Ty, do you have any more specific questions? I do. Thank you, Teresa. If everyone can hear me. Um, great. I see nods. I appreciate it. Um, appreciate the opportunity to have this discussion. Um, really want to second uh, Ashok's comments from NRDC, I thought those were very important, um, and climate energy projects as well. Um, I want to follow up on this uh, thread Teresa was on um, as far as uh, um, the renewable percentages in the um, that we discussed earlier. I think that Mr. Bryant had mentioned to commissioners before the lunch break that Evergy doesn't expect the SDP investment to unlock more than five or 6% of a switch from coal to renewables between the generation mix now and after the STP. Um, I assume that encapsulates the interim IRP that, uh, that, that uh, uh, the Kayla was describing there. Um, the opportunity is clear for more consumer savings and better cost benefit from renewable generation. And the STP press release says that Evergy can decarbonize 85% by 2030. Uh, it's been acknowledged in this call that renewable technologies are ready and storage technologies aren't far behind and renew renewable production is much cheaper than uh, pretty much any other type of production, uh, especially coal, uh, and maybe except for energy efficiency. Um, and you've talked about pressures from investors, from insurance, uh, and likely executive actions, even if the Senate's gridlocked uh, from the administration to meet 
uh, their goal of 100% decarbonization by 2035 in the electric sector. Um, so on top of this, the use of securitization is supported by insistence on uh, least marginal costs by the KCC that could reduce rates, improve shareholder return, and replace coal uh, quickly with solar wind storage. Uh, so my question here is why are Evergy's expectations for coal reduction and renewable increase only 6% through the sustainable transformation plan? Um, no grid mod investments really needed to achieve that level of renewables increase. Um, and are you open to planning the grid modification process um, and uh, based on setting uh, sooner coal retirement dates and increasing renewable infrastructure over those levels? Um, uh, and what, you know, what, what barrier do you see in decarbonizing at a rate that's in line with scientific national and international goals, uh, those goals that are being set for 2030, uh, such as 85%? So this is Kayla again. I'll, I'll take that in a few different parts. The main constraint um, on the switch within the STP time frame is, is the time frame, uh, is just the time required to um, to retire the coal plants on a reasonable pace and also to replace it with new large solar farms if we're talking about solar wind would be the same. Um, the other important consideration when you think about the longer term um, trajectory is when we get into we get into capacity talking about capacity accreditation. Um, so that's for this first tranche, because of their current capacity position, um, we're able to make this swap, um, not necessarily having to match the capacity from the coal plant to the solar exactly. Um, and so that makes capacity less of a concern. But as we progress towards that more, that higher level of decarbonization, that's the big thing that we have to work through is the capacity trade-off. So for example, in SPP, the default solar accreditation is 50%. If you compare that to a coal plant, which is accredited near 100%, not, not always 100%, but it's accredited almost nameplate. Um, and then once you reach a certain level of solar penetration within your footprint, that capacity accreditation falls for solar. Um, so it falls, I think, down to 10%, um, which is the default accreditation for wind. So all of that to say, all of those numbers to say that you have to put in twice as much solar to replace a coal megawatt, all else being equal, um, which can create um, some significant capital costs as you're trading off a fairly depreciated coal asset with, with a brand new solar asset where you need twice as many megawatts. Um, so that's what the IRP does, is it works to evaluate those, the different energy values, the energy revenues that we'll get from the solar versus what we were getting from the coal, all of those things. Um, but that's how we're evaluating it. And that is one of the primary barriers um, to the, the broader decarbonization. And that's why we wanna work with stakeholders through the IRP process to make sure that we're kind of evaluating everyone's perspective and we really know what pace makes sense for our stakeholders um, to do that decarbonization across the 20 year timeframe, not just the, the five years of the STP, 10 to 20, depending on which state we're talking about. So. Sure. If that answers your question, Ty, hopefully it does. Yeah, thank you. I mean, um, I was kind of hoping that would be the answer uh, that uh, sort of points at there being an openness to um, changing these plans and accelerating based on upcoming rules um, and changes in capacity requirements from the SPP um, and generally uh, more uh, realistic views of how to uh, spread capacity over the uh, entire region versus the one-to-one -one, uh, switch that you're talking about. So I think if that is the only barrier, then uh, would you say that the STP plan is open to um, increasing these levels considerably um, of renewable and, and, and coal yeah. closures? My only clarification, I'll let you keep asking questions. I, I don't see a ton more within the five years. It will be difficult. It will be difficult to expand much, I think, within the five years, just by time constraints with getting through the IRP and procuring and all of that. Um, but in the longer term, absolutely. All right, thank you. Um, uh, just uh, if I have any more time here, uh, you've mentioned distributed generation benefits quite a bit and described how grid mod benefits them. Uh, what level of distributed generation does the SDP anticipate and uh, will, um, uh, will be upgraded or modified um, 
uh, by the end of the SDP process was the percentage. So I'm having to wear all of my different generation <laughs> TND hats. Um, so we will cover that in one of our IRP meetings um, and I don't have it with me right now, but we are forecasting levels of DER penetration over the 20 years um, by jurisdiction and factoring that into the IRP. Uh, the short answer is in the time frame of the STP, it's not super significant, the amount of DER penetration. It's more in the, the outer years of that. So everything we're doing now prepares us for that future growth um, in DERs. Uh, so I don't have the, the numbers in front of me, so I'm sorry, but um, that's how we're thinking about it. And that's, the, uh, that's sort of the time frame and how it compares to the STP. All right, thank you. Just one more quick one, unless I'm out of time. Um, just wanted to uh, ask if there was a barrier to releasing uh, more of the detailed plans that you're describing publicly. Um, it, it was great to get this, this high level presentation ahead of time and, and to have that be public. Um, but the improvements you're proposing, for example, uh, where projects would overlap with renewable transmission uh, replacements for outgoing coal and gas plant transmission with cost sensitive retirement dates for uh, renewable transmission um, or focused transmission. Uh, I mean, the bottom line is we can't, I can't tell from what's been provided publicly, whether the vast majority of the transmission or distribution investments are um, equitably building a grid for the future or just replacing old equipment as we've talked about. So um, is there, is there a barrier to the public being able to see a lot of the, more of the assumptions and analysis from the plan that don't contain business sensitive information? Well, one note on transmission information, non-public transmission information is regulated by FERC code of conduct that can't be shared publicly. Um, so that that's one note I'll make about transmission specifically um, in the code of conduct there. I don't know if Darren wants to add anything else. I don't know that I have, have a lot more to add. I, I think, you know, as we get into detailed project planning and in specific areas, I mean, you know, our, our plans uh, are, are subject to update and change all the time. And to the extent you you put a lot of stuff out publicly, you, you begin to create expectations for something that 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 might might evolve or change. And we're always cognizant of of that as well. But um, I, I, I don't see us really going beyond on a public basis. You know, anything that that we've traditionally done for, for all those host of reasons. Thank you. I just have one last really quick observation, maybe question. If, if the RP sure. process- make, make it quick, please. Yeah, if the, if the RP process is um, uh, such that you're actually looking for stakeholder input on the de decarbonization, um, again, does it, does it make sense to to hold off on some of the replacement of existing infrastructure until you've made that decision. Yeah, I mean, I think this is Darren. I mean, I think, I think again, I mean, we don't see the types of things that we're doing in the five-year plan necessarily being dramatically impacted or modified by the, the pace of de decarbonization that it's gonna come out of the IRP process. Um, you know, the, the team talked a lot about the types of things we're doing to uh, add automation and, and to replace aging infrastructure. And most of it that we've looked at, we've prioritized and everything that we have visibility to at this point would say that, that it, it, it is the right thing to, to continue to invest in those assets for customers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fredotin. Appreciate your-, your uh... Thank you. We, we've been going for basically two hours, so I think what we'll do is we will take uh, questions or comments from USD 259, and then we will take a small break between that and um, st staff's uh, turn. So, uh, Mr. McKee, it's, it's your turn. Mr. McKee, you need to unmute your, your mic, please. There we go. I'd like to thank the commission, Chair Duffy and uh, the staff, as well as Mr. Bryant and his team for this opportunity. It's been very helpful. Uh, 
to gain an understanding of the nature and extent of the plan. Uh, I have really kind of three quick questions. One, and I'm referencing slide on page 14 of the present of the paper presentation. As I understand it, approximately $2 billion of the 3.5 uh, is slated for transmission investment. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Right. And that, of course, would be jurisdictional to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission as opposed to the KCC. Is that right? Correct. When do you anticipate that you would approach or make your filing at FERC relative to that those expenditures? I'm going to defer that to Darren. Okay. Sorry, I was trying to get to my unmute button. I mean, the types of investments that we're making in the FERC space don't necessarily uh, call for or require a, a separate FERC filing, but certainly as, as we begin to see them in the projection horizon for updates to our ATRR, they, they would start to come in to, to those projections based on the, the parameters of the, of the protocols. Well, I, I'm not sure that I follow that. So are you saying that you would make a filing at FERC in, in segments uh, presenting portions of the $2 billion over time? Yeah, there's, what I'm saying is there's, there's not a specific requirement to put a, a, a full plan in front of FERC to, to talk about the type of transmission work that, that we're doing, which is, you know, rebuild and enhancement of our, our existing system. But, but it does show up in our annual filings when we, when we put in projections and then do true ups uh, based on the protocols of, of our, of our formulas. Right. Uh, of the proposed plan and expenditures there, you have a percentage breakdown, excuse me, uh, in terms of the percentage that would be allocated to retail customers versus wholesale. I'm sorry, could, could, you, could you repeat that and maybe what piece you're referring to? Well, uh, I'm referring to the three, uh, the one we've been discussing principally here, which is the 3.5 billion for transmission and distribution. My question is, what is the breakdown there in, in your analysis as between retail customers carrying that uh, investment or return on the investment uh, versus wholesale customers. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm not prepared to 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 go into to that level of detail and breakdown um, at, at this point. I mean, that's the aggregate investment that'll that'll go into the system. Certainly, there is a, a subset of our of our system that supports wholesale customers, but but I don't have that that percentage handy today. Um, as I understood in the discussion prior to our lunch break, uh, the I believe it was maybe it was Mr. Mulvaney that said that the 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 system now it has been enhanced by the installation of these smart meters or or AMI uh, meters. Is that true for the entire retail system? Yes. So it's all in place currently then? Yes, we have very small uh, pockets of areas that, that we're still working, but we're probably well over 99% installed. Very good. That's all the questions I have. Uh, it is uh, maybe David Banks who's on and is a consultant to, uh, to USD 259 may have a question, but I think I've covered them. David, speak up if you do. Thank you, by the way. And I have a quick add on to, to one of Tim's questions on the, the $2 billion of, uh, of transmission investment. That two, of that 2 billion, how much of that is incremental to what was already planned during this period? Uh, how much is incremental you know, specific to the STP?
can we maybe come back to that answer after the break? Let us give us a chance to look it up. Yeah, I'm I, I'm going to I'm going to throw something out there and then we'll verify it. I think incremental with the announcement of the STP was about uh, six hundred million dollars of FERC investment over the five year horizon. OK, thank you. OK, it sounds like uh, USD number 259 wrapped up its questions. So I think we're ready for a much needed break. Um, and it sounds like uh, hopefully five minutes will be sufficient to uh, let everybody uh, stretch their legs, recharge their batteries, recaffeinate or what have you. So um, let's, let's aim for about five minutes from now, which by my clock would be 353. Thank you.
So it is 3.53 and um, we are ready for, um, I believe, um, Mr. Fredoten, are we ready for staff's comments and questions? Uh, y yes, Chair Duffy, uh, we're, we're ready for staff. So uh, Ms. Pemberton, uh, if, if uh, you'd like to proceed. Sure, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Great. Um, I just have one quick question, then I'm going to turn it over to our Director of Utilities, Jeff McClanahan, and I know his staff um, has some questions for you all, but I do have one thing that has kind of bothered me throughout, not bothered me, but, but I haven't quite been able to figure out through the course of our discussion today, which has been great, by the way, I've appreciated it. I'm going to direct this to you, Kevin, and you can punt it to whoever you think is the most appropriate person. I'm not entirely sure if this is really more appropriate for Kayla or who, um, but <clears throat> I'm going to... So as I look through your slides, um, and if I'm yelling, I apologize. Am I, am I too loud? No, we're used to getting yelled at. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Um, so as I look through your slides, um, slide 10, um, you go through the discussion or the various points on why uh, the grid modernization is necessary. And the second bullet point on that is to enable the carbonization by improving renewable deliverabilities. And then as I, Fast forward through the slide deck, I come across the transmis transmission infrastructure investment benefits, and that same bullet is there is the, is the second issue or the second point of uh, on decarb. And then if you advance yet again to the distribution infrastructure investment benefits, you don't see that decarb discussion there. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm trying to understand, I haven't been able to put together throughout the course of the discussion today is how does the transmission investment specifically enable the decarbonization? I mean, we've heard earlier the commissioners um, discussing um, that this plan does not assume advancements in battery storage te technology. And then um, we also discussed how, I think this might've been a Kayla discussion um, that until we see increases in the battery storage capacity and then decreases in the cost of the storage, the use of storage will be limited. So I'm, I'm trying to understand how, how decarbonization will be effectuated by the transmission infrastructure investments as opposed to the distribution infrastructure investments. Can you help me out there? So I'm going to say it's very good to see you, Ms. Pemberton. It's you been too. a while. And I'm going to get, since you gave me the chance, I'm going to punt it to the esteem Ms. Messamore. Fair enough. I thought that was, that was going to happen. So, okay, to answer, I'll try to break down my answer again. Um, so on the transmission side, um, the reason it's called out specifically, because when we talk about decarbonization in that context, We'll say we're talking about retiring central station generation from fossil fuels and replacing it with utility scale solar, wind, eventually storage. Um, so that's the utility scale side of things. And so that's why the transmission grid is what is important in enabling that transition. Um, so there's a, there's a variety of different things that happen when you um, shut down a rotating mass <laughs> sort of a power plant and replace it with an inverter-based resource. For example, there's transmission investment required to ensure stability. It, sometimes it'll cause changes in power flows that'll cause overloads on lines that weren't overloaded before, for example. Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of transmission investment that can um, result from that transition. But fundamentally, the renewables are generally, like we talked about earlier, it's sunny and windy in Western Kansas, for example. Um, and that's not where the load is generally. So the more transmission you have to bring that, you reduce congestion and you can make sure that all of that renewables can get out of that, that area um, whenever the sun's shining, the wind's blowing, whatever that the case may be. Um, so that's why transit, transmission is called out specifically for enabling decarbonization. The flip side of that for distribution, and it's called something different, um, which is part of why I think you're asking the question, but it talks about enabling distributed resources and electrification, which I would consider two different, two other ways of decarbonizing. So there's the customer sided renewable generation that enables decarbonization from our perspective by reducing load or giving us decentralized generation sources. And then electrification can decarbonize transportation sector, can decarbonize re uh, residential heating, all of those things. 
and distribution investment can enable those sorts of investments. So it really does play on both sides. The reason it was called out on transmission is more the utility scale side of things, but it really does show up in both places. Does that answer your question? I think it helps um, fill in some of the blanks. I think I probably have some still additional questions, but I need to think about your response and it might become a little bit clearer to me um, as I think about it a little bit more. So um, right now I'll kick it over to Jeff McClanahan, again, our director of utilities, and he will run his staff through whatever questions they may have. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, I appreciate everybody's participation and the dialogue that we've had so far. It's been very helpful. And I think Evergy for the present and uh, very good as well. Most of my questions have been answered. In fact, Terry just asked one of my questions. So I only have one at this point. Uh, and it's on slide 10. Uh, the first item there talks about enhanced security from threats. So this is sort of a cyber security question. So uh, you may have to answer it at a high level, but uh, as you increase the automation, uh, software, et cetera, in the system, it seems like you increase the cybersecurity risk associated with the system. So uh, when, you, when you say it's enhancing security, what, what do you mean by that uh, since we're, we're providing more automation within the system? I can take that one again. Okay, so this is Kayla again. Um, so on the slide, it's talking about enhancing resiliency to threats. So part of that is having a system that's more flexible and responsive. And in some cases, having computing power out in the field that is not as dependent on some central place that could, if it was attacked by some outside uh, malicious attack, um, could be taken down that way. So there is a little bit of value in decentralizing um, the computing. But I would say on the cyber side, um, obviously for the bulk electric system, we have NERC SIP, we have all of those standards in place for physical and cyber security. Um, when we design distribution automation systems, we try to take a similar um, approach without trying not to implement some sort of burden on the system that creates cost um, by over, over complying with the standard that it doesn't have to comply with. But it's a similar approach that we're taking where we're, we're taking a very, very proactive approach to distribution cybersecurity that is similar to what we do for the bulk electric system, despite not being um, subject to the same sorts of regulations. So it, it is potentially a risk, um, but it's something that we consider and we build out our architecture in a way um, that tries to minimize that risk. I won't get too technical because I'm not that technical in that topic. Um, so that's as high level as I'll, I'll do and hopefully it's sufficient. If not, we could certainly follow up with people who could talk your ear off about it, I'm sure. No, that's, that's sufficient. If that answers my question, I appreciate that. So uh, Justin, do you have uh, any questions? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, good morning, or sorry, good afternoon, everyone. I was <clears throat> going back and forth in my head between whether to say good afternoon or good evening. So I guess I said all three now. Um, I, I have a few questions, but but I will say that if when you when you when you follow fifty different professionals or experts in this area, I think nearly every question that I had at one point has been covered at this point. So I'm going to try to back cleanup, I guess. Um, but on, I think this will be directed to, to Mr. Ives. Um, so there was some discussion earlier about um, rate impacts and projected rate impacts and whether that was, you know, on the basis of an all-in uh, approach and inclusive of, of all of the riders and, and the TDC impact. And there's been question about jurisdictionalization or jurisdictional splits of, of, of all in rate impacts. Um, so I, I just want to first confirm, I mean, in the, the STP report that was filed in the 2514 docket, um, page 12 of that report projects a 1.6% CAGR for rate increases through the five year period of time. So that that is not a jurisdictional by jurisdictional split number, but it, my understanding is that it is an all in 
retail revenue per KWH number. Is that right, Darren? Yes, that's right. I mean, it picks up the riders and, you know, picks up the impacts on, on the, uh, the, the RECAs for some of the things we've talked about on savings in the fuel and purchase power area and picks up the, the, the implications on, on the TDC as well. So it's all in. Okay, thanks. And then have you guys, um, you know, forgive me because I, I, I forget sometimes the, the distinction between what's been publicly addressed and what's um, been held in confidence or confidential to this point. So has the company um, released any sort of uh, distinction or, or um, estimate to this point of jurisdictional rate impacts or, or any, any split between between jurisdictions or, or state-based rate impact? Yeah, so um, we have talked around the uh, general uh, statement of being around the, the level of inflation or, or under. I'm not aware, we, we have calculated, but I'm not aware that we have publicly released at the, at the jurisdictional level, but, but the statement that, that, that says we're at or below the level of inflation contemplates the jurisdictional level. Okay. So, so can, so can I understand that to mean then that, because we do, I mean, I know, that the information exists at the jurisdictional level. And perhaps that's something we can talk about, at least projections. Maybe that's something we can talk about after the workshop in the confidential section. But, um, but based on what you just said then, can we take that statement to mean that at the jurisdictional level, the, the rate impacts are still projected to be at or below inflation? In other words, the aggregate is 1.6% CAGR, but if the if even at the jurisdictional level it's it's at or below inflation, that that means we're not looking at three or four percent CAGR in a particular jurisdiction. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. One other quick is comment. That, it, sorry, Justin. I'm going to cut you off real quick. Is that, that true? Even even for the okay. FERC rate. Even for the your uh, because I know that the rate based growth is much higher on the FERC investment. Um, is that statement right for even for the FERC rate? Yeah, I mean we we have um, we, we have looked at it as an all in rate, so including the effects of the TDC um, on on the bills of of retail customers to to calculate that that jurisdictional level at Central. Um, which is where most of that FERC transmission is, is slated to occur. Um, what, what I don't have for you, and I know we've talked about it a time or two today, is that the, the wholesale impact of that because you, you have offsetting impacts. I was trying impacts. to help out my Kepco friends. <laughs> yeah, you, you, have, you have offsetting impacts at the retail level for savings that are coming through the RECA and savings that are coming through uh, in, in the other operating and maintenance areas that that don't necessarily come through that wholesale transmission. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Justin. Sorry about that. No, no, Commissioner. You um, you always have a free reign to <coughs> you know that. So, um, so just I I almost caught myself um, interrupting Mr. Vincent earlier, and and I was just trying to be helpful to to the conversation, but. I think the analysis that he was doing when he was trying to, uh, I think in his words, back of the envelope or back of the napkin, um, rough into what the rate impact could be on the on the transmission formula rate. I think he was adding $2 billion uh, based on the investment on slide 14, he was adding $2 billion in, to, to the rate base. And, and, I, I, and I just wanna get you to confirm, um, Darren or, or anyone else, I mean, Two billion dollars of, of capital investment doesn't necessarily equate to two billion dollars in rate base, right? I mean, you've got you've got you've got offsetting accumulated depreciation, you've got offsetting accumulated deferred income taxes, um, and I, I I mean I just I'm not trying to squabble, I'm just trying to clarify. 
Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that, Justin. And I, I made a very soft comment there, right? That I, I didn't think maybe it was as simple as, as taking that $2 billion and adding it on to the rate base. And, and those are some of the factors that, uh, that, that would influence that rate output from a $2 billion investment. So okay. Thank you. And, you know, I, I hate to put you on the spot, Mr. Vincent, and, and I'm definitely, I don't want to get, you know, argumentative, but just for purposes of clarification, you, you didn't include those type of impacts in your analysis, did you? Hi, Justin, it's great to see you again. Uh, Corey, you're not, you're not putting me on the spot. You know, that's a fair question. And the short answer is, and I'm going to caveat this because I approached it two different ways. Um, the way you described, like, I did do what you just described, add $2 billion to the projected transmission formula rate, and that prints out a result. There is a confidential work paper that the company provided that indicates what the, uh, what the impact on rate base should be based on, uh, based on the STP's projected FERC investment. It's, it's one of the KEPCO Excel files. And the line that's probably most relevant to us is line 1259. And uh, while I've got the floor, while you've got rate impacts and we're, we're looking at inflation levels, I'd also call your attention on that same Excel file to lines 1106 for the Evergy Kansas Central uh, jurisdictional rate impact after the SDP is implemented, including all the riders and surcharges. That the, uh, the sum on line 1106 is different than what we've uh, reflected or what's been discussed so far. So that's been the, uh, the basis for my comments. I'm not an accountant and it is a, it's a dangerous game for me to play one. So I will you know, say I might be missing something entirely, but, uh, but be, that, uh, be that as it may, there, there's the specific percentage uh, or a lot, line 1106, line 1106 is the specific percentage rate impact CAGR all in and then uh, the relevant lines for you are 1259 uh, for the SDP rate base and FERC. I think it's important to remember that pretty much all this FERC spending is ending up in Evergy Kansas Central. And so when we talk about all in rate impact with FERC, we've got to make sure that we're focused. It's, it's one, it's just one of the company's two Kansas jurisdictional utilities. But uh, no, you never put me on the spot, Justin, and it's always great seeing you. Not you as well. Yeah, so that's actually a really good segue into my next question here. Um, on, on slide 14, I had a, a host of questions originally, but I think we've, we've, we went to slide 14 about six times. So my last one that I don't think has been answered is out of that $2 billion in Kansas transmission spend, um, Mr. Ives, you just mentioned that the majority of that is at Evergy Kansas Central. Um, do you, do you have an estimate or directional, um, I guess, split between the Evergy Kansas Central side and the Evergy Kansas Missouri side on that $2 billion? R roughly uh, of the 2 billion, I believe that the Kansas Metro portion of the 2 billion is in the $130 million range. Okay. Okay, thank you. So that does, okay. So, so I, okay, so I was trying to compare the transmission spend numbers in this presentation to what was presented in the STP report in the 514 docket. And in the 514 docket, the FERC jurisdictional spend was $1.863 billion. And that's the average Kansas Central side. Is that right? Yeah, I don't remember, Justin, I don't remember the um, details behind the, the buildup of that report, but, but that really could be it. Um, we, we had probably at that time kind of cleaner line of sight to, to the central transmission spin than Metro. So that's probably what's driving your difference. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I believe that the Kansas Metro portion wasn't fully modeled by that point in time. Okay. No, that helps. Okay. Um, so this is probably obvious to, to maybe some of the people on, on the call, but maybe not all. So 
So what's the driving factor behind, you know, I don't know exactly what the percentage is, but 1.863 billion out of 2 billion is way up in the 90% range. What, what's the driving factor behind that investment being so heavily focused on the Evergy Kansas Central side as opposed to the Evergy Kansas Metro side? Well, I guess the high level thing is there's significantly more transmission, uh, more transmission lines in Kansas Central, significantly more than there is in, in, uh, in the Kansas Metro. Um, and also the 34 KV is part of uh, uh, the FERC jurisdictional in Kansas Central and not Kansas Metro. Okay. That's a couple high level. Yeah, the, the primary mileage for the metro utility, which is allocated between Kansas and Missouri from a transmission standpoint, is largely a 161 ring in and around the Kansas City metropolitan area, which is largely built out of steel structures. So um, vintage-wise and, and um, lasting-wise, it has a little more useful life uh, left on it than many of the projects that are being prioritized in Kansas Central. The geographic service territory, obviously covered by the two entities, is vastly different. That is a very cool, sir. As is the um, the return that the company earns, right, between Evergy Kansas Central and Evergy Kansas Metro, from retail customers, the FERC ROE. Uh, I, I think the FERC ROE, don't hold me to it, but I think the FERC ROE at Central is, is actually a, a little bit lower at this point than, than at Metro. Okay. Okay. Um, just give me one second to look at my notes here. I don't want to. If we could go to slide 20 real quickly. Um, so earlier, Kayla, when you were answering a question, and I think it was from Commissioner French or, or maybe from, from Orgit, um, but the one of my questions was what degree of um, these transmission projects were driven by SPP notices to construct. And I think your answer was, you know, it's, it's small or it's relatively small. And then you mentioned that um, in terms of the, you know, the rate impact and how this would be trans translated back to Evergy Kansas Central and the zonal rates, um, that it's only the higher voltages that could potentially be build out to other transmission customers. But I just want to verify. So under SPP's highway byway allocation methodology, uh, it, transmission investments between 100 and 300 kilovolts could be distributed to, to the region, but that, that would only be in the event that they were, um, they were the result of an SPP notice to construct. Um, correct? Correct. correct. Okay. So, so even these higher voltage transmission lines, it looks like, you know, the 115, the 130, 38 KB, the 161 and the 230. In, in the event that these don't come from an SPP notice to construct, then these are going to be categorized as uh, zonal reliability upgrades and, and will be 100% assigned to the, to the Evergy Kansas Central Zone, correct? Correct. Okay. Okay. Just um, last couple uh, here. On slides 23 and 24. So these are the, the project deep dives. And, and I, I found myself curious about both of these projects in terms of 
whether these projects um, were the result of a notice to construct from SPP. I think Mr. Mulvaney mentioned that a segment of this line in, in Hutchinson was the result of or, or was the subject of a notice to construct. Um, but but especially slide 2023 20, with the uh, that that radial line, um, the 10 mile radial line feeding Hillsboro. Um, it, are either one of these projects the subject of an NTC from SPP? No, sir, they were not. Okay. And I, I mean, I, I don't mean this to be like an unfair question or a gotcha question, but I'm I'm just curious why. I mean, I in, in the world of transmission planning projects, I get, you know, I've been exposed to a, a lot of projects that were um, that were justified by the basis of, uh, you know, a medium sized community served off of, of off of a radial circuit. And this is a 115 KB line. I guess I just would have thought this would be the type of project that's ripe for an SPP transmission planning project um, that, that, that I would have assumed would have filtered to the top of the ITP process or some other planning process, but but it didn't. No, sir. From a SPP standpoint, um, I don't believe concerns about radial feeds or dropping said radial feed um, is a concern from an S SPP standpoint. They're more concerned about load congestion and load flow on the grid, whereas it's up to a local utility to deal with those other issues from a planning perspective. Yeah, that's an important point. When the SPP is looking at reliability, they're not looking at, they're looking at it from that congestion standpoint and, and not from a customer service standpoint. So these are more like redundancy issues rather than congestion issues? Or just, or just poor reliability. That, that, that line was, is very long. It's very old, bad shape, causing a lot of outages in that region. Um, and that's not within the scope of what SPP is looking at from a reliability standpoint. Yeah, what, what may be lost in a little bit of the definition of that project is we're talking about that 10 mile stretch, but it's fed by a much longer line to the south that's 75 miles long. Um, and that line has a fair amount of operations. And when it does have an operation, that town is dropped automatically. And by us putting in um, this resilient line with uh, some sectionalizing switches, we basically cut the opportunity for exposure in half for that particular town. Um, and projects like that are, are easy for us to pick out. They're common solutions that are found when we're going through the planning process. But again, not typically something that's subject to SPP NTCs. Okay, thank you. That was helpful. So, so just to clarify, though, this this project in particular, um, I mean, is it accurate to say that a absent the STP acceleration initiative, this this project wouldn't have been done in that twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty four time frame? I mean, in other words, it, it wasn't in the in the hopper or or in the capital budget, or it wasn't a project that had been identified prior, or was it? Yeah. I don't believe it was. Uh, uh, I guess we went through a whole another planning cycle uh, as part of this that, that you kind of saw in the in the future spend. So trying to identify what was incremental spend related to. STP and what wasn't is a challenge because all of our scoring on any given projects out on the future horizons would change. These particular projects are actually two projects that were already uh, presented to staff and are already well underway. So uh, we, we provided them based on the fact that they were already known entities based on something that's a little more conceptual a few more years out. Um, so I don't believe these specific projects were unlocked based on STP funding. Okay, that, that would be correct. Yeah, these are, these have been well underway before the STP. Maybe I can ask just a general follow on to that because this is this is the piece that I'm also having I think difficulty with, and I think it's what Justin was getting around the edges of is 
I mean, a $600 million incremental spend for transmission that is primarily not SBP planned, it, it strikes me as a very material increase. And I think it would be helpful just to understand what drove that need for $600 million of new investment that you weren't planning to make before, but now you are. I mean, is it is it that you lowered your scoring criteria or just, I think I'm just trying to understand why was it not needed before or pushed out to future years and why is it necessary to make in the next five years now? Well, I'll touch on the, on a high level. I mean, we have a backlog of projects uh, always out there. And I think that was a question earlier, how we came up on the distribution side with a list of projects so quickly, because we always have a backlog of projects. Um, as I kind of went through the planning process, one of the criteria is kind of what is the funding available in a particular year from a budget standpoint that we can, can invest. And so that's, that project was needed. It was out there and the priority, uh, just got pulled forward based on the amount of funding that was available to, to invest. Okay. Sorry, Justin. No, no. Again, commissioner. Um, so, um, I'm done. Uh, thank you. Um, that's that's all the questions that I had. So, um, Terry, um, back to you or um, to Jeff? Yeah. So, Jeff, I don't know. Leo, did you have any questions? Yeah, I have a couple here, if I could. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Again, is everyone? Is Leo, here? you're going to have to speak up or turn up your mic. Um, we're not hearing you real strongly. Let me see if I can get closer. Don't even know if that's working okay. Is that better? Is that we helpful? can hear you. Just speak up. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, real quickly, uh, again, every, thanks everybody for the uh, presentation. Uh, a lot of my questions were answered as everyone else has said and some I hadn't even thought about. I have a couple of comments though. Um, you know, the, these slides are necessarily at a high level for a meeting like this. So I wouldn't expect to see a lot of specifics, but as, as mentioned early on by Chair Duffy, you know, the only hard number we see in the presentation is a 3.5 billion for uh, investment. On the benefits side, they're not so well defined. The benefits are described by uh, just kind of happy adjectives, if you will, things like increased reliability, uh, improved resiliency, reductions in restoration times with no real hard numbers to put on that. Certainly uh, replacing old facilities, it's a necessary part of maintaining a distribution system. And that's an intangible benefit that I, we can't ignore. That's really a, a huge benefit, as a matter of fact. I know in the 115-115 docket, which was the um, Egger docket, uh, the value of the soft benefits were also discussed, but they're very hard to quantify or monetize. But I think in any CapEx uh, project, especially of this magnitude, we really should be trying to demonstrate those improvements that occurred. In other words, we want to show the customers what they're getting for their investment. And as I pointed out, reliability comes at a cost. Uh, with, so with that in mind, we should be discussing uh, some sort of reliability thresholds to be part of this, this uh, endeavor. Uh, we did this and brought them up in 16593 and also in 18095 to talk about threshold standards. Reliability standards in Kansas are just reporting requirements. There are no standards other than what's in the uh, the merger do or the yeah, the merger docket of 18095, which expire here in, in a year or so. So that, that's my one comment I'd make that we should be trying to look at uh, some reliability standards rather than just reporting requirements. Uh, I'll give you a chance to re respond to that either probably uh, Mr. Akins or Mr. Mulvaney. Have you guys considered any, any projections as to where reliability will improve to? I know, I think I saw something about going to first quartile, but what is that as far as a percentage of improvement? Well, I think I'll, I'll take the, the first step at that. And I think the one thing that we are um, very cognizant of as we look forward, uh, especially when we start looking at our asset age data uh, is that 
we believe there is a degradation of reliability on the horizon and trying to project a reliability improvement is a challenge because we're working against the clock of degradation elsewhere. And we realize these, these numbers are, are, are large, um, although we are presenting our entire capital plan in these numbers, not just the uh, incremental portions by the um, areas, but um, there will be improvements in the pockets where we're making these investments. Um, the rest of the system that we're unable to touch due to um, the funding limitations will continue to degrade. And, um, and that was some of the, I think the similar um, conversation that I saw when I read some of the testimony in the uh, um, 2015 uh, West Star rate case around the Edgar program was that um, it is somewhat hypothetical. You get into a, a world of, um, do, you, do you envision reliability degrading and how do we reel that in to find the right level of investment to maintain reliability if we believe that the reliability we're providing is sufficient for the cost that our customers are paying. Um, just to be very honest with you, that's a challenge. Um, and we are trying to model where we think we're making this investment, what impact is that having uh, on our reliability statistics, but at the same time, we're modeling the degradation that we're having on the rest of the system that we're unable to touch. And again, I realize these numbers seem large, but just the sheer miles of overhead um, primary and secondary that uh, we have throughout the state of Kansas is a massive number. And if you break this cost out over that, that mileage, we're actually touching a very small portion of that overhead system and underground system. I shouldn't leave out underground because there are underground investments here too. Yeah, the only thing I would add is very similar to the, to the Edgar program. Clearly we could see the benefits on that one circuit we completely rebuilt, but the dollar, rest of the dollars got spread pretty thin that there's other factors across the system that kind of uh, dilute that a little bit. But yeah, I mean, we fully expect to be able to show where we've done the work, the improvements in the, in reliability. And we, we do expect some incremental reliability, but it's just tough to put a, put a value on that given what the degradation might be in other parts, at least in the early part of a, you know, of a grid modernization plan. So Bruce, do you, are these investments that you envision in the projects that you've selected, are they still spread throughout the system? They're not gonna be in one focused area where you could maybe isolate it to see the impacts on uh, reliability? Well, not, not isolated from a geographic standpoint. We look at it you know, by circuit or lateral things like that um, where, where we've got the worst performance, but, but no, not in a particularly geographic area are we, are we spending the money. And, and as Ryan pointed out, uh, incrementally, it's not it's not a, a, a real big number. I mean, it's a big number overall, but incrementally, it's not a huge increase on the Kansas side. Well, kind of following up on that, I know on Mr. McKee's question, he, they mentioned that there was $2 billion of projects, but really it's only $600 million incrementally that would be sort of attached to SDP. I think I heard that right before we went on break. So on the same approach on the distribution, how much of that $1.5 billion on the distribution was actually in the hopper versus can you say is the amount that's incremental to, uh, to just the STP program? Yeah, so, so Leo, this is Darren. Uh, the, the Kansas incremental that, uh, that, that we're talking about is non-FERC is, is about 300 million over the five years. That would be 300 million of the 1.5 billion is actually something that the STP envisioned right or added to the pro project yeah that's right and, and is that incremental to what was presented in the merger proceeding or is that incremental compared to the, the sort of that interim spending plan that was announced in between the merger and the stp yeah that's incremental to the uh, plan that we rolled out in the early part of this year which was our refreshed five-year plan you know starting starting this year forward so just looking oranges to oranges here, if you're looking at uh, 600 million for the incremental transmission, you said 300 million or so for the, for the distribution, that's about, you know, just roughly twice the spend on transmission. But when you look at the number of lines you have, if I remember right, there's like, what, 10,000 miles of transmission and about three times, a little over three times that of distribution circuit miles. So with that much more infrastructure on distribution, 
how do you come up with the ratio to split it on more to the transmission versus to the distribution? Well, a, a dollar doesn't go the same distance on a transmission line that it does on a distribution line. And I mean, we look at, at, at the risk and we, if, we don't, if you don't have transmission to get the power to the local areas, the distribution doesn't do you any good. But is your reliability, I mean, looking at the factors that you're trying to improve, reduce or increase, reliability, restoration, et cetera, those thresholds that you're trying to achieve as goals for this investment are almost exclusively on the distribution side, wouldn't you say? Tra transmission has some impact on that. And again, it's the, the age of some of that transmission infrastructure and the it's you know closer to, to, to end of life than some of our distribution. Okay. Um, Leo, can I just ask, so we've, we've talked about you brought it up and others about all the different buckets that were out there before. And I don't have a lot of history of the recent history, five years, whatever. I think it would be helpful to very clearly talk about what occurred in 2015, what occurred last year, the refresh of the IRP, all of those. So we can see what were in those separate buckets prior to the STP being invented because I don't know if there's some smushing going on in there that were just kind of, you know, kind of overlapping or kind of smushing one from here to there. But I, I think that would be helpful. I don't know whether I'm talking to the company or to staff, but so that we know prior to six months ago when this wasn't even a thought, what was out there before and what was contemplated. That's all I have. Leo, continue, thank you. Yeah, okay, I, well, I just have one comment to follow up on that. I think to be fair, this, this is really just an extension of the agri projects when you really get down to it. So it's, it's been in the process, in my, my view, since the, the 15115 docket anyway, at the very least. So it, we, we sort of all knew this was coming, but I think it is a good thing to try to break out how how the planning has worked to see where we see the, an increase in, in the spending projection. Yeah, to Leo, I think if we, when we look at the numbers, if you look at the central distribution spend, we obviously increased it for that pilot program. But after that, I don't believe we decreased it to the level it was before uh, the Edgar pilot. And so to that extent, we have been investing on distribution in the last five years above historical levels to attack some of those issues uh, during this interim period of time. So that's part of why uh, that the incremental increase is not as big as you might expect. Okay. Terry, that's all the questions I have. Uh, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, I'm not sure if Tim had any questions that he wanted to ask. I'm not hearing anything from Tim. So Adam I finally found the unmute. Oh. <laughs> Fair enough. So at this at this point, I don't have any questions. Okay, thanks, Tim. Adam, if you're on, do you have any questions? I'm not seeing your name, but I know you're probably there. No, no questions. All right, Jeff, uh, any follow-up? No, no, I don't have any follow-up at this time. Thank you. I think that concludes our questions at this time. Thanks. Thank you. I would go back to commissioners um, because um, staff was the last. So um, Commissioner French, Commissioner Keene, um, this, this is the first bite kind of at the apples, so, but do you have any other comments um, you would like to make? And also Brian, is there anybody we missed? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming we heard from everyone. Uh, we, we heard from every uh, intervener um, in, in that, that wanted to be heard from was my understanding, uh, so. Okay, and we are coming up on about a quarter of five, but commissioners, um, would you like to make other comments or ask um, some more questions? 
Commissioner French, why don't we start with you? I'll, I'll make a, a quick comment and, and Evergy can respond to it if they want, or, or we can just leave it um, for future sessions. But um, it's just something that's kind of been gnawing at me uh, as, I've, as I've looked at all the reports and it's a follow on to, to something the chair said earlier. And it's, you know, it's the elephant in the room. It's the Elliot issue. And, and Mr. Bryan, I know you, you've been very gracious in answering these questions and recognizing that you know, there, there, there isn't a great answer to some of them. Um, and, and I think, you know, my question is, you know, just in my mind, I'm trying to get straight. Um, you know, we, we had a merger, we had a, um, a spending plan that was discussed at length in that proceeding. Uh, and, and that spending plan uh, was going to provide, you know, sufficient and efficient service as we moved forward. Um, then there, there are these discussions and there's an STP um, with a significantly increased caps, capital budget. Um, and I, I think I, I'm still just kind of having a hard time squaring, um, you know, how it was that, that Evergy is providing, you know, sufficient and efficient service under, under one spending plan, um, but yet it's necessary now to spend billions more <laughs> um, to provide the same sufficient and efficient service and, and how it is that one, one plan can be sufficient and efficient and the next one remains efficient. Um, I, you know, I, I think what I'm hearing is, is the answer may be that, that you don't think that, that the prior trajectory uh, was going to be providing sufficient service, that there was a lot of degradation and that this, this offers new benefits. Um, and, and obviously has, has benefits associated with enabling renewables. Um, I just want to make, you know, I, to me, that is the overarching question that I think, you know, everybody has swirling in their heads um, is that, you know, are we remaining efficient uh, with this new plan? So I w would welcome any response. I understand it's, it's been a difficult question uh, to answer, but um, I, I just thought the chair made a fair point on that and, and wanted to put it out there again. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that, Commissioner French. And, and you know, I, I think the points you made are uh, a good um, recitation of kind of kind of what we've described today. today. So you articulated that way better than I, I could have. So thank you for that. Um, you know, going back to the merger process, there, there has been a bit of passage of time. So even if you look at the comparable five-year window, it's a little bit different, you know, this next five years versus in Heck, even through the STP, we're the, the first year was 2020 and we're in December. So um, the passage of time is a, is a bit of a difference. I think our team's ability to dig in and understand kind of what the, um, what the opportunities are from a prioritization perspective is, is a data point. And, you know, I, there is, uh, you know, Bruce mentioned the point about capital availability. One of the things coming out of the merger uh, from a financial perspective was a, was a sh share repurchase. And with that, you know, with the, uh, with the opportunities for the incremental capital uh, investments that we think make sense, uh, both on the grid side, as well as um, with the decarbonization, which we're just touching on in the STP, the IRP will, will refine. Um, it un unlocks some capital to invest in, in long-term infrastructure. So, you know, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I totally get the question. I, I, I'm going to give you the best I can get, can give, and uh, that, that's probably uh, where I would leave it, lest, lest my colleagues jump in and, and bail me out because they see me floundering over here. Yeah, so, so, so maybe real quick, and I, I mean, I'd echo a lot of the stuff that Kevin said. I mean, you, you know, I, okay, we're in a different... for the record, um, Darren Ives, is this you speaking? Oh, yeah, sorry, okay, this is Darren. You. All right. Yeah, so, so, um, you know, just to, just to follow on on that, the time frame was a little bit different. We knew we had a, a slate of commitments coming out of the merger to, to integrate systems and integrate processes and place a lot of focus on uh, merger efficiencies and a lot of the things that we said we were going to deliver. Um, we knew at the time, and, and, and the statistics would bear it out, that, that our capital investment plan was was modest over that five-year plan compared to, you know, a bunch of our regional peers and, and benchmarking that we would do. Um, we're moving through a lot of that system consolidation. We're moving through a lot of that integration work. To Kevin's point, we have 
you know, we're past the, the stock buyback period. So, so we have a different, uh, different ability to, to fund some of the investment. And to Bruce's point, we, we always knew we had a backlog and that we thought we could maintain the system to work through that five-year period and, and achieve some of those commitments we set out, but, but that backlog wasn't going away and that, that we would have new future five-year plans that would have to start to pick up some of this work and continue to transition. Um, and, and then you add in the, the, the transition potential with decarbonization and, and that, that's a variable that, that wasn't as in play, you know, a few years ago as it is today. So thank you, can, Mr. Bryant, Mr. Ives. I appreciate your responses. Can I follow up on that if um, I could, uh, Mr. Bryant? Throughout this whole discussion today, we've never talked about the gas portion, which is what, 26% as you talk about decarbonization. I mean, it remains the same. I, I don't get that. Some of, some of those plants are antiquated and um, uh, they're spewers of toxic waste, yet they've not been part of the conversation at all today. I understand they're very necessary, but there's been no discussion. Yeah, I mean, we, we touched on it a little bit, probably indirectly, uh, Chair, from the standpoint of the, the capital that wasn't defined in Kansas as grid mod. So I think that billion, I forget the number, it was, uh, was, what was it, Darren, two billion or so of capital that was not part of grid mod that was the, of the 5.6 billion in Kansas. So part of that, when, you know, when I referenced the ongoing maintenance capex for our existing generation would certainly encompass um, those existing ga gas turbines, ga gas fleet. But they'll continue to occupy 20, 26% of the uh, total uh, of your load from, yeah, so, from this year to 2024? Yeah, so this is Darren. I mean, I, I, that, that's 26% of the capacity that we have available, but it doesn't represent the energy that's produced and, and delivered to customers. A lot of our energy comes from the renewable resources and the larger base load facilities, and that's what would cause the the, the use of the natural gas and, and, the, and the carbon. So, so they're still very valuable from a capacity standpoint, but they're not running at the levels of the, the coal facilities. Okay, thank you. Sorry I interrupted, uh, Commissioner French. Did you have another question? No, I, I, I'm finished. Okay. <laughs> For and, now. <laughs> and um, I, I just briefly wanted on solar, you never uh, differentiated between big solar and little solar. And um, whether it's a solar array, 50 megawatts, I mean, you talk about a total, but do you, um, I remember 20 years ago when the discussion was 20% by 2020 as, as wind was being discussed, that's been exceeded. Folks said technology wasn't there, whatever. So have you like visioned out solar and kind of parsed it out between bigger arrays versus rooftop solar and um, some of that. I mean, have you, you're not in your head. Yes. Yeah, that, Brian, that's a so. good, that's a good distinction. No, the solar we're talking about is, and I'll let K Kayla jump in. It's big solar, if not big, big solar. So we're big, talking big, big. Uh, solar in the hundred, you know, north of a hundred to 200 megawatt. Uh, size wow. utility scale solar farms, so you get a lot more scale efficiencies from the larger the larger panels. So that's huge. Uh, it, it, a lot of a lot of solar panels and a lot of a lot of sun and a lot of um, geography uh, to cover. So so absolutely, um, when we say solar, we're talking utility scale solar. Anything you'd add? Uh, some more? Yeah, the only the only thing I'd add is that on the in this upcoming IRP, we'll also look at we'll call it little solar. Uh, residential rooftop. Um, we'll look at it at this point more as a load reduction um, versus a true generation source from a modeling perspective for a variety of reasons. Um, but we are also looking at some different levels of potential um, residential solar adoption in addition to the, the big, big solar, um, which we're model we kind of model it as a generic resource. Um, and 
there are certain size assumptions that we can make. There are economies of scale, obviously, if you get into the just big, <laughs> little big solar, uh, it, it can get a little more expensive on a per, per watt basis. Um, so that's what we're trying to balance is the, the scale and the economies of scale. It's been so interesting to watch what's happened in New Mexico. I mean, talk about a sea change um, literally over the last year or so. And if anybody's got solar and sun, it's, it's the Aztec country. And so, um, yeah, just the <laughs> announcements coming out of there have been significant. Okay. Um, I will now turn to Commissioner Keene. Do you have any uh, comments or questions you would like to make, Commissioner Keene? No questions. I do have one concluding comment. Uh, it strikes me that as we look forward prospectively for some of these successive um, work studies, <clears throat> Uh, a major issue that is going to be on the table, <clears throat> we've alluded to it in a variety of ways here today, but a major issue that's on the table has to do with the IRP process and all the balancing that goes into that process in terms of decarbonization goals, affordability, reliability. These are things we really have to care about in, in, in the context of the ratepayers that we're here to protect. And um, I think that that the balancing propositions there are going to focus on a lot of these issues that we've kind of uh, tangentially touched on here. Uh, we, we have issues dealing with the generation mix that are gonna bear on that quite heavily. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's not sometimes as easy to actually make the choices in the real world as it is in, in theory. I'll close by saying simply that um, I very much uh, appreciate the uh, participation by Evergy, the public ratepayers, the various interveners, and our staff in this, in this proceeding. Uh, I very much look forward to the follow-on work studies that uh, we're going to have, a couple within the next 30 days. Uh, so with that having been said, <clears throat> I'll bid adieu before my 1% uh, battery <laughs> on, this, on this iPad vanishes. Plug in, plug in. It's right there under your desk. It's so. low cost and reliable electricity. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. So um, before we get to confidential, well, I don't know who all is on. I do want to say this. I thoroughly enjoyed today. Now, maybe that's sadistic, but I don't think so. I think it was a good learning experience for me. Uh, hopefully for others. I know you guys sitting on the front line answering all the questions. You've had worse, I'm sure, um, questions put your way. But I did enjoy today. I look forward to our other um, work study sessions and I will share my personal opinion. I believe these are extremely important. They're important for us to hear in a non legal hearing so regimented way to discuss and share. This is part of the learning and things are happening so fast. We must use forums like these to, to learn from the company, to learn from other stakeholders. And if I have my way, I hope on a lot of issues, we will do more of these because I think it furthers an understanding and um, it, it is helpful for, I believe for commissioners, um, but I just want to thank you for the time you've taken today, but I do believe it adds value to the subject we're discussing. And I, I hope we do this more and um, that we become Zoomies together. So at this point, understanding commissioners don't have any other questions. Uh, is there any confidential material that needs to be discussed? Madam Chair, this is Robert Vincent for KIC. I had just a couple of questions. Want to be respectful for everyone's time. I know we are getting very close to the five o'clock hour. Okay. So um, the answer is yes. This concludes then the uh, public portion of our work study. Uh, no action will be taken during the closed session. 
we will be going into a closed session, but I would like to remind everyone that the next work study will focus on operational efficiencies included in the STP, which is no longer the racer's edge and is scheduled for December 21st, 2020 and will be conducted in this same format. Um, so if um, we will stop the streaming portion, um, IT staff, is that correct? And Brian, I'm looking to you and everybody else can collectively be a part. Yeah, well, uh, th thank you, Chair Duffy. What we'll do is we'll give uh, IT staff a second to um, end the YouTube feed and just be sure that that is, is accomplished 